The arguments between people preferring the original Paper Mario titles against those who prefer the new ones are something that's been going on ever since Sticker Star came out. If you're watching this video, odds are you've at least heard of the controversy already, and probably have a strong opinion on the issue. It's hard to not have some sort of opinion on this. As far as what I think, yeah, I'm not gonna hide the fact that I'm for the original Paper Mario games. Generally speaking, I don't think anyone who is entirely okay with how the series was going would make a video like this in the first place. That said, the average classic Paper Mario fan doesn't really go into all that much detail on why these changes are bad, or why the the original games were good. They just assume it's self-explanatory. I've got to do my best to try to convince you why the original games have something worth saving in them, and to show you the frustrations people have with the new game with a more critical analysis of the villains. No, the old games aren't perfect. Believe me, this video will put a lot of critical spotlight on every villain in the franchise. And it's not just going to be every old character is equally good and every new character is equally bad. Regardless, if you are sick of all of the negativity about the new games, you can skip to this timestamp if you want things to be primarily positive and to only be talking about the old games. If you like it, you can potentially come back to the start of the video later. Before we start, ranking every villain doesn't mean ranking every single boss in the series. You can argue over what does and doesn't qualify as a villain, but with a whopping 67 entries on this list, I'm going to say whatever character you want me to talk about on here is more likely than not going to get covered. With that said, this ranking is not going over Paper Jam because that's primarily a Mario and Luigi game rather than a Paper Mario game. Paper Mario characters just cameo in it, basically. If you really want me to, I can potentially talk about the Mario and Luigi villains eventually if you show interest in the comments, but this video already took a lot out of me. For this ranking, I gave number-based criteria for each of the villains. Most of these categories should be relatively self-explanatory. Each category, villains will be ranked from 0 to 10. Story involvement, characterization, and boss fights get double points because those are the most important categories, so the max possible score is 100. Story involvement is how much screen time the character has and how much impact they have on the plot. Boss fights are usually rather obvious, but it's also a catch-all term for anything gameplay related the boss has going for them. Yes, the gameplay mechanics of the Snobby trilogy will generally cause villains from those games to get low scores in this category, but that's not a trade exclusive to them, believe me. This is the hardest category to get a good score in, because the vast majority of bosses in this series are way too easy regardless of which game you're playing. Now that we've sorted out the rankings, let's move on to the worst villain in the series. We're going to be ranking every Paper Mario villain from worst to best. Sticker Star Bowser unsurprisingly scores the lowest on the list for a multitude of reasons. First off, he's generically controlled by Royal Sticker in this game, which is that giant sticker on his head. For the entire story, he doesn't speak a single line of dialogue, and he gets turned into a mindless zombie. That's a fantastic start. He only appears at the very start to try to steal the royal stickers before he unintentionally gets mind controlled, and then he never appears again until the end of the game when he's fought. It's pretty pathetic for a main villain showing. It would make some degree of sense if Bowser just didn't talk because he was brainwashed, but at the start of the game he doesn't talk either, and he's not brainwashed yet. I have absolutely no idea why Tanabe decided that Bowser shouldn't talk in this game, because in all of the 3D mainline Mario games that he's supposed to be imitating, Bowser does in fact talk. Why not here? Are those surveys about dialogue not being important the reason why he can't speak? Generic toads are much more interesting to listen to, I guess. Bowser not talking is even weirder when we take into account that the fact his son, Bowser Jr., and Kamek, his closest personal advisor, both can still talk. Neither of them comment on the fact that their boss's brainwash doesn't speak. Just business as usual as they generically serve Bowser like this is nothing out of the ordinary. I'll be going over Bowser's appearances in the original games on this list, but it's worth saying that he was fine as just a stock main villain in the first game, and he was just speaking perfectly fine there. Even in Origami King and Color Splash, he's allowed to speak just a couple funny lines of dialogue. Sticker Star's Bowser just comes across as an obvious mistake that they tried to correct later. 
There's pretty much nothing else to talk about with this Bowser besides his boss fight. His first phase is really weird in that Bowser's acting like a king who relies on his minions and is acting somewhat intelligently. This is despite the fact that Bowser cannot talk and is supposed to be mindless. Somehow he's able to order his troops by generically pointing at them. Does he have psychic powers or something? It's weird seeing so many random Mario enemies pop up during a final Bowser fight. Bowser acts really weirdly during this battle, constantly running away from Mario to find more minions to fight. He comes across as an outright coward during this battle, and at one point outright hides behind a giant womp in hopes it will protect him. This is wildly out of character for Bowser, who's normally the kind of guy who will go into fights head on, whether the game is an RPG or a mainline Mario title. Again, you, you can hand wave it as the crown making him do it, but shouldn't something that makes you mindless make you more aggressive instead of into some kind of strategic coward? It's really stupid. There's one brief bit here where Bowser can pick up a chain chop and throw it at Mario, which is a cool attack animation in Super Mario RPG. Given how much this game hates the old RPGs, the reference is probably unintentional, but that's the most positive thing I can say about it. After this weird coward phase is done with, Bowser genetically turns into a giant as usual, reaching over the ledge with just his upper torso. Bowser has effectively become the Tiki Tong head and hands boss cliche here. His attacks in this form are just swatting at you with his hands and breathing fire, about as bland as you can imagine. The gimmick of this phase is that your partner sticker, Kirsty, decides that Bowser is too powerful to defeat, with his royal sticker powering him up and giving him infinite defense, and turns herself into a usable sticker in your inventory, sacrificing herself. Of of course, after Bowser is defeated, Mario uses the magic wish he gets from the Royal Stickers to bring her back to life. So that sacrifice five minutes of in-game time ago was unsurprisingly pointless. Bowser's defense stat doesn't actually prevent him from being damaged, it just reduces all damage dealt to him to one. If you don't sacrifice Kirsty as a sticker, you have to hit him 500 times. Many people have intentionally done this as a challenge, although with how this game's gameplay works, it's really nothing too difficult in the battle itself. The issue is grinding enough to get stickers to kill him due to how this game's combat system works. In Sticker Star, every single attack is a consumable sticker item, so it's just a matter of making enough garbage to kill him with. Of course, actually going through with this in a fight is really, really tedious and boring, and it's not like Bowser's attacks become any more complex throughout the fight. They expect you to just use the obligatory Kirsty sticker and be done with it. For gamers who do not have the patience to try to save Kirsty, they will find that the cutscene afterwards plays out 100% identically if they sacrificed her in the fight. This is really sloppy on the part of the developers. Yeah, the majority of players won't see this on their first playthrough, but it's not that impossible to kill Bowser without using Kirsty with some patience. It just requires some preparation, and it's reasonable for players to come in very prepared for the final boss of the game, especially with how this game's terrible combat system works. The gameplay of the first phase of the fight is similar, but it's a more generic boss fight. All gameplay in Sticker Star bosses is a matter of just bringing enough thing stickers to the fight to spam on the boss and instantly kill them, or else they'll kill you. The problems people have with grinding in RPGs is a lot more direct in Sticker Star. There's no leveling system or experience, it's just a matter of bringing enough consumable items to win or lose by not having them. There's no strategic way to play a fight differently. Your ability to win is determined by what you bring to the fight. The last thing I'm going to bring up is the final phase, in which you can target and destroy Bowser's arms for some unfathomable reason. He won't grow them back or anything, he just awkwardly sits there without arms attached to his shoulders. I think literally chopping Bowser's arm off might cause him more than some kind of mild discomfort, but that's just me. It looks awful, and I have no idea why they let you do this. Most bosses where you can chop off their limbs, it makes sense because they're literally detached from the boss's body, like Tiki Tong. It also makes more sense that the characters are magical in nature, like, say, Mortimer from Dragon Quest who can just revive his hands when they're destroyed, or Elder Princess Shroob can sprout out more tentacles from her body when they get chopped off. Here, it just comes across weird. I guess because he's made out of paper, wounds aren't real, and that makes it okay. 
I know it's a kid's game and this isn't graphic or anything, but something about Mario chopping off Bowser's arm feels very, very wrong to me. It just makes him feel even more like a generic monster than he already is here. Tanabe is really trying his hardest to make Bowser not be a character in Sticker Star. So, looking at these scores, I'm giving Bowser a negative one characterization score for him not being able to talk, an additional negative one to characterization because of his actions not even making sense for a mind-controlled Bowser, let alone the real Bowser since he's a coward who uses minions. This brings the characterization total to a negative two. For boss fights, I'm giving him a negative one because of the sticker star engine, and a one in character design because of the ability to chop off Bowser's arms. Obviously Bowser's regular design is not a one, it's just because of that. For how much they're trying to make Bowser be loyal to the mainline series, I'm pretty sure that the Mario Quality Assurance team would not like Bowser getting his arms chopped off, just saying. Kamek's role in this game is pretty minor, but he's technically a recurring antagonist even if he barely speaks any dialogue. He only really does much of anything immediately before his boss fight, stealthily coming in from the background before ambushing Mario in front of a generic object that he wants to collect. He then casually shrinks Mario down, since changing size is probably his most iconic power from the mainline Mario series, and then he begins the fight. Honestly, you'd think he'd also size himself up since he does that way more often than sizing people down, but whatever. The gimmick of his boss fight is that he will just randomly destroy all but six of your cards to attack with, greatly limiting your options and making the boss fight really luck-based. When you run out of cards, you can just pay money to get more, which Kamek loudly reminds you of, which I think is really stupid. We still have Mario's designated follower companion who could say that instead of Kamek, but okay. Regardless of this luck gimmick, Kamek's numbers are so pitiful that regardless of what you throw at him, he's going to die very easily. If you are somehow weak enough for this to be a challenge, this boss fight isn't satisfying, it's just dumb luck. When Kamek is defeated, he outright gives Mario a gift, but Mario's partner correctly says that this isn't enough to forgive him over, and Mario executes him, splattering him into a bunch of paint. That's kind of weirdly morbid for Mario, but whatever. Imagine if all of that paint was recolored to be red. I know it's a generic cliche for enemies to explode into things you can collect and pick up, but the paint is what makes up their bodies, so that's not what this is. Kamek even is trying to think of last words to say here before he says something random and unfunny because he can't think of anything else. They're making it clear that this is supposed to be him dying. This is Kamek's only direct boss fight in this game, but Kamek can show up at random inside of generic enemy encounters. When he does appear, he will apply one of several magic effects at random. He can do the effect from his boss battle where he deletes all but six of your cards, he can make it so you can't see what your cards are, so you have to remember where each one was in your inventory by memory. He can generically nerf the cards by making them worn out. Or he can change all of your cards into a random guard. If you win, everything gets reset. But once this happens, you're banned from fleeing or doing a battle spin. So you have to play out these random encounters. There's already barely any incentive to fight enemies in these games when you get so little in the way of rewards from random encounters. But now, imagine that any random encounter can potentially become harder than a boss battle and you're prohibited from playing. Kamek is actively going out of his way to make the quality of the game worse by making it even more objectively correct to avoid all enemy encounters in these RPGs with no experience points or leveling systems. And yes, Depending on the enemy setup and what effect Kamek applies, he can make encounters harder than boss battles. Since all bosses in this game are designed to be pathetically easy, with you winning or losing based off your use of thing cards. You might think I'm being overdramatic with this and exaggerating how bad his effects can be, but Kamek can outright make encounters unwinnable with his effect where he turns all your cards into one kind. Flying enemies are immune to grounded attacks like hammers, a staple of the Paper Mario series. If Kamek just turns all of your attacks into hammers or whatever, you can't hit them. You can't run, you can't do anything. You just have to sit there using your useless attacks until you die and get game over. These pathetic enemies do very, very little damage, so you'll be sitting there for several minutes of the same attack animation over and over until you finally get to die, just to add insult to injury. 
all this said, you can run if you manage to use up every last one of your cards before you die. But depending on the encounter, that may not be possible. Doing that is also a fate that can be worse than a game over, because Kamek will have effectively deleted your entire inventory of consumable attacks. There's no progression system in this game other than your inventory. So in normal RPG terms, imagine if he just spontaneously deleveled you to level 1. It's really bad. Now, is this going to happen all that often? No, most players won't have such a horrible experience. But the fact that it can means you have to be terrified of random encounters in case Kamek randomly decides you don't get to play the game anymore. Even his less powerful attacks can potentially kill you if he shows up in a more intimidating encounter. Now, I know I can't expect enemies in video games to be at their most competent all the time, because it's still a video game and it needs to be possible for the player to progress. But these are effects Kamek can technically do at any time in the game. He even uses some in his boss fight. The fact he does not abuse these powers, especially when he is directly fighting Mario and putting himself at risk, shows that he is a complete and utter idiot. The man has ludicrously powerful magic at his disposal, and if he used it in a remotely intelligent way, there was no way Mario could ever hurt him. In the mainline Mario series, Kamek primarily fights as a support character, providing buffs to generic enemies to turn them into bosses in Yoshi's Island. But more importantly, he has the intelligence to fight alongside the bosses. In New Super Mario Bros., he provides a supportive spell to each Koopaling, and even to Bowser himself, running away and escaping every time. While him supporting generic enemies would make sense, the fact he doesn't fight alongside any of the bosses is dumb. When he does go to generically attack directly, he's basically killing himself. I don't know why the version from the mainline games, where Kamek can't speak, is somehow more competent than the one from an RPG. To give an idea as to how little thought they put into Kamek here, after his big overblown death scene where he makes a point of saying his final words and explodes into paint blobs, Kamek can still randomly show up at encounters. They just really did not care at all with him. I'm not saying that Kamek needs to die, but why make a big death scene if you wanted him to survive? Just let him generically fly away like he usually does. This is so ridiculously lazy that I think the reason why Kamek continues to show up after this so-called death scene is because of the fact that in Japan, there's no individual Kamek. Every generic Magikoopa is just called Kamek in Japan, hence why they look identical to him. Only outside of the land of the rising sun is Kamek officially his own named character. So I guess the boss fight Kamek is just an especially stupid Kamek, while the random encounters one is some kind of hyper-competent genius. Still, Mario is not exactly some obscure little series. The whole point of the Tanabe trilogy is to try to stay more true to the Mario canon. Just because Tanabe is Japanese doesn't excuse him from knowing the fact that Kamek is separate from Magikoopas outside his home country. I mean, everyone over here knows about the state of Kamek's character in Japan, and the West is a far bigger market anyway. He really should have thought more before he made this obvious plot hole. It's not an excuse. Color Splash Kamek gets the worst boss fight score on the list with a whopping negative three. For perspective, there's no negative two on the whole list for boss fights. Kamek is just that awful for anything gameplay related. Despite the broken combat systems in these games, Kamek manages to be horrible in his own unique ways, having a boss fight that is entirely luck, then ruining the vast majority of encounters in the game with his ability to show up at random and give you a game over whenever he wants. With how ridiculous his powers are, I'm giving him a negative one on characterization for the fact that he uses his powers in such a pathetic fashion. Yeah, he's a massive threat given what he can do to you, so I had to give him a few points on his threat level, but he's so absurdly stupid it doesn't realize the power he wields, so it's very unlikely it will ever happen. In the words of Porky Minch, Kamek is an almighty idiot. In the actual narrative, which is what the threat level category is more supposed to be about, he's treated as a joke. Junior is one of two recurring villains in the game, alongside Kamek. He still barely contributes anything to the plot of Sticker Star, though, because there's no build-up to the three times he appears, for the most part. He just suddenly shows up out of absolutely nowhere each time, then you fight him. To be fair, you could say the same thing for a character like Junior Troopa, but the characterization Bowser Jr. has here is minimal, 
and stay static throughout the game. For Junior's first fight, he's a tutorial opponent in the first area of the game. He doesn't want to kill Mario for the sake of generically killing Mario, no, he wants to steal the Scissors Thing sticker he got literally five seconds ago. Mario then uses the Thing sticker and instantly defeats Junior in one attack, cutting him to shreds. Unlike some of the other fights, this one is literally 100% impossible unless you do what the game wants you to as Junior will just generically heal himself infinitely if he did not use the scissors. It lets you know the amazing gameplay you're in store for with Sicker Star. Normally I don't care about this, but it does strike me as odd that you can kill him in such a brutal fashion, and then when you go back to the overworld he's perfectly fine. Not only is he not dead, he uses abstract art god powers with no explanation to magically get rid of the bridge, crumple it up into a piece of paper, and throw it away. All the while, as Mario just stands there and does nothing. If you're going to go that far, use this god reality warping technique on Mario. Or at the least, burn that crumpled up bridge to nothing. It's such an awful sequence all around, no amount of cartoon logic justifies this to me. To the surprise of nobody, Bowser Jr. never uses these godlike powers again. His next two fights aren't tutorials, and there's no instant win button, so they're somewhat better. His main gimmick is throwing bob bombs. If you jump on him like an idiot while he has the bob bombs out, then they'll explode and do damage to you based on how many he's holding. This beginner's trap is the only real way for him to win here, as his numbers are pitifully low, he's just a mini-boss. His final fight technically has a little build-up, the level name says this is Bowser Jr.'s personal airship, but he still doesn't show up directly until he's fought. This time, he puts on a glass shield over his Koopa Clown car. This is his most generic fight, and he's basically just really durable, not having much in the way of fighting back to deal any damage to you. As is the stereotypical boss cliché, he only starts doing more damage when he's low on health, with his most powerful attack being that he generically attacks several times. All of his defense does pretty much nothing when he does almost nothing to hurt you when he's at high HP. His dialogue is generically antagonistic, but there's not much enjoyment to get out of it. And he doesn't exactly make much in the way of jokes. His dialogue could all be deleted and nothing much value would be lost. I bring that up because it is really, really weird that Junior can talk, but his father cannot which I touched on in Royal Sticker Bowser's ranking. Junior sees nothing wrong at all with the fact his dad is being mind-controlled in this game. This is just business as usual. In Bowser's Fury, Bowser Jr. outright teams up with Mario to save his father from the dark influence that's taken over his mind. In Origami King, yeah, he teams up with him there too to try to save his dad. Even in New Super Mario Bros., Junior has more of a character than this. Junior is the most recurring antagonist of that game, and he goes out of his way to resurrect his father from the dead and turns him into Dry Bowser. He goes on a journey across many worlds to do this. He's practically having his own little adventure as Mario chases him every step of the way. Even if Bowser doesn't always show he cares about his son, Junior very clearly cares about his dad. This isn't in some RPG with original characters that Tanabe hates. These are mainline Mario titles. Bowser Jr. really doesn't have much of a character to mess up, but Tanabe managed to butcher the character of one of the mainline Mario characters he used anyway. That's pretty impressive. Bowser and Bowser Jr.'s characters are so obviously bad that Tanabe would at least go on to take some feedback on board with them for Color Splash and Origami King, even if he just did the bare minimum. Score-wise, he's getting a negative one in characterization in boss fights. Not quite as offensive as his father, but anyone who's a fan of this character from the mainline games would not be satisfied here. I like his theme on the overworld, which is about the highest praise I can give to him. Of the Color Splash Koopalings, I'm gonna call Iggy's appearance here the worst, even though most of them have the exact same problem. This has nothing to do with Iggy's character. If anything, Iggy is one of my more liked Koopalings, but not in Color Splash. Ever since Iggy came back in New Super Mario Bros. Wii and got his redesign to his modern palm tree hairstyle, he's been chained at the hip to chain chomps and chariots. That's just his thing now. I can see why it's stuck, it is a cool theme, and this game takes it another step further by placing him into a Roman Colosseum. That's where the praise ends. His dialogue is a bit eccentric even if he barely gets any chance to say anything. He insults Mario by calling him a pretty boy. 
Now, that can often be a good insult for a villain to give to a protagonist, but who in their right mind would consider Mario a pretty boy? Weird, weird word choice there. Even within the same game, Roy calls Mario an old man, basically the opposite of a pretty boy. Once the fight starts, Iggy doesn't take long to leave and just summons his minions to fight instead of him, who come equipped with their own chariots and chain chops. They casually dodge out of the way because the chariots are fast. Why this and only this can dodge attacks due to the logic of being generically fast, who knows? It's not like there's never any fast characters. Should Boos just always go transparent every single time immediately before you attack them? Should the Shadow Sirens all phase into the ground to evade attacks the second before you hit them? It's pretty much the same logic. After it is established that the chariots cannot be hurt, Iggy personally shows up in his own chariot to help. It is at this time where you must use an arbitrary thing card, the Bone, to generically instantly win the fight. If you don't... Iggy will continue being invulnerable forever. When you do use it, the minions, chomps, and chariots will all be instantly destroyed, just leaving Iggy alone to defend himself pathetically. This is the only part of the boss battle that is not 100% scripted, and he doesn't put up any kind of fight when he's on foot. It's an embarrassing display. If you do not use the arbitrary thing the game wants you to use, Iggy stays invulnerable. And if you do use it at that incorrect time, it's even worse than that. During the phase where only the minions are out with chomp chariots, you can use the bone to kill them, and then it's wasted. It's honestly not an unreasonable assumption for a player to just throw the bone immediately, as this is the correct interaction being used that the game wants you to do, just not at the most opportune of times, since it won't hit Iggy yet. Once you waste the bone, Iggy will loudly state that the fight is over unless you have another one of those cards. His words, not mine. He says he's going to speed up this now impossible fight by summoning a gigantic thwomp to instantly crush you and deal 999 damage. Yes, 999 damage. They were that mimetic with it. You must play the game the exact way Mr. Tanabe wants you to, or else. Some of the other boss fights in Sticker Star could be gotten past without using the arbitrary things you're supposed to, but in Color Splash, they punish you far more directly. No challenge runs allowed. We wouldn't want you to add some actual gameplay to this game, now would we? Now, aside from this being the most obviously scripted encounter in the series, this is really, really stupid on a characterization level too. Iggy has this all-powerful thwomp attack that he can apparently do on a whim by casually shaking his wand. He could do it just as well after he used the bone correctly to get rid of his personal chariot. They really don't care about making the character make any kind of sense. It's all just to make their four-scripted, stupid fight go exactly the way Mr. Tanabe wants it to go. Not only does Iggy have this magic thwomp he can casually kill anyone with, after the player wastes the bone, he shows direct awareness of the fact that this is the only thing Mario could do to defeat him, as if he's reading the game's code or something. If that's the case, what is he going out and fighting Mario personally for? Just keep sending out legions of minions in the chariots. Even if he lost his chariot, he should just go run and get another one in his giant coliseum after Mario destroys the first one, since apparently these things are impervious to attack somehow because they're just so fast apparently. There's just a huge disconnect between any gameplay and characterization here, and it's really bad. Most of Iggy's positive points on the scale here are just the fact I generally like Iggy's design, which this game didn't create. Beyond that, the threat level is always awkward to decide when the boss has the power to kill Mario, but they're just too stupid to use it. Wendy's fight has a musical theme, where the attacks will come down in time to the music. I'd say it's a nice thought to try to add something to one of these more bland fights, although I prefer Sticker Star's Gooper Blooper, which is not a sense I expected to have to say, but here we are. The gimmick of the attack is you want to block the damage and avoid swatting away the money she sends at you, which is somewhat interesting. If you want to beat her though, there's no reason to care about the coins, just block everything. The arbitrary point where you are required to use your Thing card here makes more sense than some characters like Iggy, and that there's not much Wendy could do about this attack. Her ultimate technique is just to use a ring to squeeze Mario, then shower down coins on him and kill him. To avoid it, you have to make a camera to create a photograph, 
It's basically like a substitute from Pokemon to block the hits for you. Yeah, I could easily complain that Wendy is stupid for failing to see the real Mario behind this photograph, but this is just an incredibly tacky attack that works on everyone, not just her, so I can't complain too much about that characterization-wise. I will say there's no reason why, you know. Wendy could just do the exact same attack again after it's blocked and Mario no longer has the camera or photograph left over. So, yes, she still is stupid. The musical theme gives a few points to this boss, and the parts where you aren't using a thing card are a bit more enjoyable than some of the other Koopling fights. However, and this is just my bias, I've always found Wendy to be a really ugly, unappealing design. Normally, the one girl in a group of seven would be among one of the more popular characters, but Wendy is arguably the least popular of all the Koopalings. There was even a gag a while back about how all of the big Smash YouTubers made a thing out of making videos on how to play Bowser Jr., but just referring to the character as Wendy and treated it like it was normal because she's so unpopular. Wendy's design isn't just ugly, it's unappealingly ugly. Myself, I love ugly characters but there's an art to creating them just like any other character. Design isn't bad because it's ugly, but a random, bald turtle woman with a giant bow, high heels, and lipstick comes across really weird. Almost all of the other Koopalings have hair. Why is it that the girl is the one who is bald? Wendy's character's design looks like they just took Boom Boom and attached a bunch of tacky accessories to his model. On the other hand, you could embrace her ugliness more by making her more repulsive in a way like Morton or something, but as is, the design feels really uncommitted and unnecessarily ugly. She's a girly girl who wants to be pretty, but the fact she's ugly is never brought up by any characters within the universe. Apparently she's just normal. Now, that was just me complaining about Wendy in general because I've never liked the character or her design. But here in this boss fight, Wendy's girly girl nature is even worse. She's referring to her boss, Bowser, as Mr. Bowser. Nobody else in the game refers to him as that. It comes across as a pet name for him, like she's in some kind of relationship with him. After she's defeated, she says she finds Mario attractive, but not to tell Mr. Bowser. You could argue this line is innocent enough, and that Bowser would not approve of Wendy being attracted to his archenemy. However, the nature of that line combined with Wendy's characterization makes me think of... other things. You can just say my mind is in the gutter, but the Mario Quality Assurance team would never approve this line that could potentially be interpreted this way if it went by them. If this was just Pom Pom or something, I wouldn't care. But the slightest implication of Wendy having any kind of feelings for Bowser is a very, very bad idea when Wendy used to be Bowser's daughter. She would still be related to him if Miyamoto hadn't decided on a whim, at complete random, when asked in an interview, the Kooplings were no longer Bowser's children. Keep in mind, that interview is the same one where he declared that he is the mother of Bowser Jr., and thus the wife of Bowser, making Miyamoto a canonical character to the Mario universe. Despite this, everyone still now runs with this statement that the Kooplings are no longer Bowser's kids. I was exceedingly tempted to give Wendy a negative 2 score for characterization instead of just a negative 1, but the fact you can technically deny anything was said means I'm going to go easy on the ranking. Other than that, she sticks out from the other Koopalings for being the main one with an actively bad design. That's obviously a very subjective thing, but when it comes to ranking the Koopalings against each other, it's going to inevitably become a little bit subjective. You can disagree on the exact placings of these Koopalang bosses, but I don't think it's going to surprise you that even my personal pick for the best of them doesn't get all that high on the list. When Sticker Star Kamek first introduces himself, he implies that this is the first time that he and Mario had ever met, which is really weird. If Tanabe wants to make games truer to the Mario canon, he's not doing a good job here. Kamek is an adult when Mario is a baby and meets him in Yoshi's Island. There's no way you can possibly argue that these two characters have not met before. Is this the stupid thing where every Kamek is different in Japan yet again? If that's the case, why did you bother giving him this big introduction bubble window, flashing his name and red lights? 
That is blatantly implying he's an important character, like those character intros for the Subspace Emissary in Smash Bros. Brawl. This dialogue takes place five seconds after the big word balloon pops up, so it's really jarring. This is shortly after Bowser Jr.'s tutorial fight. It's not a completely generic tutorial fight like that previous one, but it's pitifully easy because this is one of the first fights in the game. No real gimmicks, his numbers are just so pathetic that you can just generically attack him until he dies. His next fight is a good while later, and he's brought along a gimmick this time. I'll say I find this gimmick somewhat entertaining. He turns all of your stickers into flip-flop sandals. They have the same effect as normal, but you have to remember where each sticker is in your inventory since their icons, names, and animations are all the same now. In addition, the action commands you have to make to use them are now different, which can potentially mess you up slightly as you're forced to use this new attack. This fight here is still really simple and short though, he's not gonna do much to resist. It mostly just serves as an intro to this gimmick. Kamek shows up at the very end of the game, directly before you fight Bowser for the last time to have his real fight. He turns your stickers into sandals once again, makes duplicates of himself, and is very annoying to fight. The duplicates are an issue because the sandals make it so you can't choose which duplicate to attack. Kamek's most powerful technique is hovering ever so slightly into the air so that you can't hit him with grounded attacks like hammers, similar to the broken exploit in Color Splash he does. If you forget where your hammer attacks are, you can potentially waste a turn by using them on accident. What's worse is the fact that even if one of the clones is grounded, you might accidentally hit one in the air, making hammers just be terrible in general in this fight. Remember, you can't select which one of the three you attack, it's just entirely random for some reason. Kamek is fighting you directly before the final boss, so his primary purpose is just to make you waste legitimately good stickers on him while they're all disguised as sandals. Actually defeating you is really unlikely, but at the least he's making a good contribution to the Koopa cause here. It's a somewhat entertaining gimmick for what it is, but I will say it's very easy to get around this fight if you can just time the battle spin at the start of the fight to just instantly kill him given his HP is so pathetic. Just deleting this fight from existence as easily as the bosses who are killed by thing stickers. The mechanics in the Tanabe trilogy are just so broken and sided to the player. After Kamek is defeated, he loudly pledges his allegiance to Bowser fanatically with his last dying breath, which is considerably more satisfying than his death at Color Splash. Guy outright turns into ashes and the ashes get blown away which is, again, kind of weird for how definitively he should be dead. Kamek appears in every single game of the Tanabe trilogy, as well as Paper Jam. Why are they so insistent on killing him? Does the stupid Japanese Kamek issue mean that Kamek is a different character in each game? It's so dumb. Ignoring that, I will say that Kamek's ridiculous loyalty to Bowser in general is the dumbest in this game. Kamek is just coming out of the throne room, he has clearly seen what state Bowser is in, being controlled by the royal sticker. Despite that, he is willing to die for Bowser, and is excited about the fact he believes Bowser will kill Mario after he dies. But he doesn't care that he's been brainwashed by the royal sticker? It's pretty pathetic. If you're so loyal, take that sticker crown off his head already. If he really doesn't care that his boss has lost his free will, then he should just want to betray Bowser. This is the perfect opportunity to convince the troops to abandon the king and side with him when Bowser is no longer in his right mind. I brought this up with Color Splash Kamek already, but why does Kamek not use his super powerful techniques while fighting alongside Bowser? He's literally right outside Bowser's throne room. There's no reason he should fight him alone instead of all together. In this game, Bowser is perfectly willing to fight alongside generic minions anyway during his boss, so it really makes no sense why Kamek wouldn't just hang back and take a more supportive role like he usually does in the mainline Mario games. Yes, Kamek isn't quite as stupid in Color Splash as he is here with his powers, but there's still a thousand things he could do with how strong his magic is, and his relationship with Bowser makes no sense at all on a multitude of levels. So I thought that he warranted that negative one in characterization again. For boss fights, I had higher hopes and wanted to give him a zero, or even a one or two for his last boss fight. It's just so easy to cheese with the battle spin that I couldn't help but give him the standard negative one for Sticker Star boss fights. Even if you do the fight as intended, all you have to do is take a picture of your stickers before you fight and the battle becomes trivial.
Ludwig is the second most direct Koopaling, with just having an attack that could instantly kill Mario whenever he feels like it. Although it is tied to a specific form of the boss this time. His submarine can fire missiles to finish Mario off when he decides to arbitrarily do it. Mario needs to use balloon cards to tackle and lift Ludwig's submarine out of the water and drop it onto the land so it can be attacked. And if Mario wastes the balloons or takes too long to use them, then and only then, Ludwig will fire missiles which will instantly murder Mario unavoidably. The missiles at least deal multiple hits to kill Mario rather than a comedically ridiculous amount like the 999 from Iggy. So it's a bit more restrained, but it's still stupid. In the first phase on Ludwig's incomplete tacky ship that somehow defies physics, Mario must reflect the attack of the ship with a tail card, or else he will lose. So this boss fight has two sections where the player must respond in a required way before any active gameplay decisions can be made on the player's part. As usual, once these required sections are over, the boss fight is easy and mindless. The only other thing worth bringing up here is the fact that Ludwig says he wanted to make a point of fighting Mario, if only once. This implies Ludwig has never met Mario before this, for some reason. This was already weird with Kamek, but we don't have the Japanese Kamek excuse anymore. Why does Tanabe want to insist that these games are at the start of the Mario timeline? Does Tanabe not only hate the first RPG trilogy, but all of the mainline Mario titles as well? Why is he retconning everything? Ludwig's scores are identical to Iggy's, no surprises here. He's a fine enough character outside of this game, but there's nothing to see here as he intentionally refuses to use his unavoidable attack that can kill Mario. A giant pokey that's been brainwashed by a royal sticker. It fights pretty much exactly how you would expect one to fight. Though the inherently unique design of Pokies at least lends itself to a couple of more creative looking attack animations by comparison to some of the other more generic looking Sticker Star bosses. It depends on which segment you're able to attack how you're going to be able to damage him, and also changes the effect of his own attacks. He will bury himself into the sand and start slowly coming out of it, which changes things up a little. But it's the Sticker Star boss, so it's a matter of having the right thing sticker to generically execute the boss or else you will generically lose to it without excessive grinding. In this case, it's the baseball bat. This isn't quite as obvious as something like using fire on the ice guy, but as far as tacky thing card animations go, it makes sense how it behaves on this boss. It brings a certain Mario Party minigame to mind. Regardless, the boss fight automatically being a win or a loss means it still gets a terrible score. Not much else to say about the boss. It's a generic monster with no character and it's recycled Mario enemy. Next. This boss is arguably the most lame of any of the Sticker Star bosses as far as this fight goes. His primary form is a giant snow statue of Bowser. That's what you're fighting for the majority of it. Eventually, the snow statue is destroyed and you fight the real Mr. Blizzard underneath it. The boss actually gets weaker as you fight it, with the big statue losing its mass as it gets damaged. And the Mr. Blizzard underneath isn't any stronger either. The attacks are all generic ice moves, nothing special at all. As far as having a Bowser copy for the first phase of the boss, the Cooper Brothers did a significantly more memorable job of it. Like almost all Sticker Star bosses, the boss gets a terrible gameplay score because you can just win by having enough powerful thing stickers, in this case fire-based ones, to generically melt the boss to death. I'd say this is one of the most uninspired of all of them in that department. On characterization, this guy is one of the better ones in Sticker Star, though that's obviously not saying much. After he's defeated, he will speak some actual dialogue, one of only two main bosses in the game to do that. Unfortunately, he has no dialogue at all until he's defeated, because the royal sticker brainwashing him. Only at the end of the fight, and he's free of the mind control, does he speak. He apologizes and says that he apparently made a wish upon a star, and he says that he wishes he had a body that wouldn't melt. After that, he spontaneously falls over and dies after speaking just three word balloons worth of dialogue. After his death, there's a flashback sequence that reveals a bit more about his character. Most of these are just nothing for the other bosses, but here it shows the Mr. Blizzard melting in the sun and wishing for a better body like he said in his death dialogue. 
It's pretty much the exact same thing as what he said, nothing new is introduced here, but they're really trying to make you feel sorry for him. Apparently, Mr. Blizzard is snow spirits and not the snowy bodies they're made out of, because he continues talking after his body falls apart, and he says that he'll meet you again next year and hopes that someone else will make him a new body. I'll be back on Christmas Day! It's nice they try to make the guy be more of a character in his 60 seconds of dialogue or so, but unfortunately, I cannot forgive his terrible boss fight. The character you see at the end is a cliff note tacked onto the end. While for most of it, you're fighting a random Bowser statue. Mr. Blizzard himself isn't exactly some amazing design either. He's still a stock Mario enemy snowman, even if he's not used as much as, a uh, Pokey, by comparison. This is one of the most generic looking bosses in Paper Mario, and its name is just an element in front of a common Mario enemy. Lava Piranha really isn't all that much better than enemies from the Tanabe trilogy, if we're being honest here. Lava Piranha has no story significance and is never mentioned before it appears, popping out of nowhere. He can technically talk, but he has just a tiny bit of dialogue where he talks like a caveman with little to no characterization. His boss fight doesn't have much in the way of gimmicks to it. He has his main head and two arms, all of which just shoot fire at Mario. The closest thing to a unique attack is when the boss shoots out miniature lava nipper plants that can do big damage, but that just encourages you to use area of effect attacks even more than you already should be using them, given you have three primary targets throughout the fight. The arms slowly regenerate after they're killed, but the real thing that makes this the worst boss in the original trilogy is the fact that this boss has so many elemental weaknesses. There are badges to resist fire, ice badges to increase your power against it, and your new partner, Sushi, has water attacks. Sushi can put the fire out on the piranha plants to rob them of their turns, preventing them from getting any attacks off. They take a while to get up from it, and when they do, they take their full turn to do it without taking any other action during that time. Compared to some other bosses in the game, Lava Piranha doesn't have any real excuse for being an easy boss when he's fought so late into the game, being the final boss of Chapter 5. Other bosses before him have much more complicated gimmicks, but the only thing Lava Piranha has going for him being that he has a lot of HP. Of course, the HP doesn't matter when it's easy to just deny him turns. He's just soaking up hits like a sponge until he dies. Tidal Wave in particular stuns the boss for a whopping two turns. The boss has two phases. There's a fake out where he dies the first time and sinks into the lava, but comes out of it while on fire. This is supposed to be the harder phase, given the music gets more serious and his attacks are more powerful, but he's even more vulnerable to his elemental weaknesses and being stunned in this state than before. A horrible boss all around. Just to add insult to injury, when the boss changes forms when its first 40 HP is depleted, the game is hard-coded to make the turn go back to Mario. This is yet another free turn for Mario to take advantage of. In the hack called Paper Mario Pro Mode, which greatly increases the difficulty of the game, they could barely come up with any gimmicks to make the boss a good challenge either, with the existing design they were given. The only real difference is that the main head gains three defense for each arm plant it has out, and stunning him with water only stuns him for a single turn as he instantly lights himself back on fire. Regenerating from this still costs him a turn though, so it's very, very easy to stun lock him even in this hack which is supposed to make the game be difficult. The closest thing to a characterization moment in this boss fight is Colorado, the NPC who's been with you the whole chapter, running in to try to attack the Lava Prana before burning himself and running off, saying he'll leave the rest to you. This shows to me that even the developers thought this boss fight needed some spice added to it, but it doesn't do anything for Lava Prana himself. This this boss has awful scores across the board. He really belongs in the Tadabe trilogy way more than the original one. It's a shame given Chapter 5 is one of the more memorable ones in the first game, so it's too bad the villain of it had to be a generic enemy with an awful boss fight. At least his theme is okay? The only reason I'm giving him a threat level of 3 is because the music is trying so hard to convince you he's a threat, and he looks a little intimidating I guess. Larry takes over a train in his brief appearance in Color Splash. He lets his minions do most of the work with actually taking it over, while he just lounges on top of the chimney of the main engine. He has a lot of tricks involving the smoke. His minions can throw magic into the fire to make a healing ring come up for Larry, making it impossible to defeat him. I don't know why he can't just use that directly on himself rather than needing a locomotive to magically turn it into a healing power for him, but whatever. 
Larry will heal infinitely until the minions are stopped from healing him below. Can Mario do anything about it directly? No! He has to keep killing minions in the way of a useless NPC toad, who ever, ever so slowly makes his way towards the shy guy who's giving Larry the healing magic. He can't just go down there and kill the shy guy himself. It does make the fight ever so slightly more complicated and is the main phase of the fight with gameplay, but I can't help but feel this kind of thing is done much better in other RPGs. You know, RPGs that have partners. In Super Mario RPG, Dodo will take away one of your party members and force you to fight him one versus one, while the other two remaining party members have to fight his boss two on one. In Persona 5, there are several points in the game where you have to send out a party member to do some task while you're stuck fighting the boss with just three, most memorably against Kamishida. Here in Color Splash, your requirement is just to kill the minions every turn or the fight resets, because there aren't many interesting mechanics to play with here since the game has no partner characters and the Toad is just some random NPC. After this phase, Larry will blind Mario with smoke from the chimney until the cork thing card is used to plug it up, after which the fight is basically over. If you take too long to figure that out, Larry will start doing generic kicks which somehow do 65 damage. Even if you do the fight exactly as you're supposed to, if you happen to have low HP when he happens to decide to do an all-powerful generic kick, you can just die. Of all the attacks which do inflate the damage to kill Mario, I have to say this is the lamest one. They couldn't think of anything better for him to do besides a kick. If he just did that generic kick every turn, he could effortlessly kill Mario. Yes, you have to make him vulnerable to attack by using thing cards and letting the Toad NPC help you, but if he just kicked for 65 damage every turn, the fight would be unwinnable. If you take too long, Larry will just generically do a multi-bounce that can kill you from full health. When he does kill you with generic kicks and jumping, he just says, Oh, I'm bored, so I guess I'll kill you now. Yeah, winning is boring. What a great villain. For the fact that Larry could kill you at any time with this kick, he gets the negative one in characterization like the other Koopalings. But just to be nice, I'll bump it up to a zero because the pose where he's reclining on top of the chimney is funny. This boss entry is not Fractail, the first major boss of Super Paper Mario. This is for Racktail who is a generic recolor of Fractail, faced at the bottom of one of the pits of 100 trials. His dialogue is super brief and generic, and he just generically wants to kill you for waking him up, and he refers to himself as a wrathful god. Fractail, on the other hand, actually has a lot of humorous dialogue referencing the fact he's a computer. His eye will turn into the Wii loading icon when he's processing information, and he'll reboot himself while saying some mildly humorous dialogue about if you want to save data or not. He even references that old Legend of Zelda I Am Error name. The reason Fractail isn't on this list is because he's not a villain. He's a neutral line character who's guarding his location while waiting for the legendary hero, Mario, to show up. Dementio casually casts magic to brainwash him into attacking Mario. Racktail, on the other hand, is attacking Mario out of his own free will, and is the much more bland and generic character of the two. Racktail is a complete copy-paste of Fractail's boss fight, just with higher numbers, and he introduces absolutely nothing new. Fractail's boss fight was nothing interesting to start with. All you do is enter 3D mode to get on his back when he passes through, then throw minions at his antenna to damage him until he shakes you off. His attacks are pathetically easy to avoid since they were designed for the first boss, so all the inflated numbers do is turn Racktail into a dull damage sponge boss. This is a really forgettable character to the point I debated whether to include him on this list at all. As far as score, Fractile would get a much higher score for visual design, but because this entry is specifically only ranking Racktail and not Fractail, his design score is terrible because he's a generic recolor. Shadow is one of the 100 Trials bosses from Super Paper Mario. It's a very simplistic, generic fight where you go up against a duplicate of each of the four members of the party, but with their silhouette completely tinted black. It's a very, very simple way to throw in some extra content for the game, but with Super Paper Mario's battle system, it's not a terribly interesting challenge as far as these go. Each of the four forms of the boss has 100 HP. So the boss technically has the most HP of any boss in the game with a total of 400, but it's pretty much just a damage sponge boss, as it's very unthreatening. 
It comes across as a generic enemy with a lot of HP when you're fighting it. The boss can talk and is given some brief characterization. Apparently, the other 99 floors of the Pit of 100 Trials were made by Shadu so that he could test the heroes, steal their DNA to make copies of them, and then he intended to replace them somehow. How this guy intended to replace them when they were just silhouette copies is anyone's guess, but if the Isle Delfino residents can't tell the difference between Mario and Shadow Mario, I guess I could suspend my disbelief there. One thing worth bringing up is that the Luigi duplicate specifically is a palette swap of Mr. L rather than Luigi. Luigi is clearly not in the form of Mr. L when he's fighting here, and this guy is confirmed to have specifically been copying the heroes as they went through the pit, so it doesn't make any sense that this guy's shadow form of Luigi is Mr. L. The actual reason is because this guy is reusing Mr. L's boss template in the code, since the only time you fight against Luigi is when he's in the form of Mr. L. He even copies Mr. L's shroom shape recovery technique and everything. The developers aren't trying to hide it. Now, that would be bad enough, but the most annoying thing about this character is that when you first beat the Pit of 100 Trials that he's hiding out in, he has the audacity to demand that you do the entire thing again before you can fight him. It's not enough that this game has two Pits of 100 Trials, he makes you arbitrarily do it twice so he can copy more data on you or whatever, so you can get the payoff of his amazing boss battle. What a joke. The character is about as cliché as you can get, and he doesn't really have any redeeming qualities, even using the generic stock boss battle theme. There's some vague implications that it's some tertiary lore character called the Pixel Queen, but that doesn't really do anything to save it for me. This boss was primarily made for efficiency in reusing as many assets as possible and trying to stretch out the playtime, rather than creating anything worthwhile on its own merits. Between Shadow and Ragtail, the two pits of 100 trials in this game are really scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of effort. While the boss of Thousand Year Doors pit is nothing too spectacular either, he is miles better than either of these two minimalist bosses thrown in at the last second. This guy's appearance is extremely minimal, to the point he doesn't even have a name. He's just a generic shy guy, and fans just refer to him by the enemy type he is, combined with the location he's encountered in. However, here the developers took advantage of the fact that they had to use only generic Mario designs in the Tanabe trilogy to make a character moment they couldn't do with a named character. The shy guy discusses philosophy with Mario about how he has a thankless job where he and his allies have to create all of the obstacles for Mario to get past. He goes on about how he's depressed that he has to give up on his dreams, that he has to work for Bowser forever, and says it's inevitable that he and Mario will have to fight someday. The more interesting part of his character is the fact that after you kill a generic shy guy in a completely ordinary battle later, he reveals his identity and says that he was the shy guy from the Sunset Express. He says that he's glad if he had to die, that it was Mario who killed him. It's a depressing moment that makes you think about the morality of these games, and it's certainly more memorable than some of the dull, coopling encounters the game has to offer. I can obviously see what they were trying to go with here. They want you to think about how every generic enemy you jump on and kill is a real person with their own life. To a degree, it works, until you think about it for two seconds. He clearly doesn't want to work for Bowser, he has a thankless job that he's stuck in for life, and he knows that he's going to go on to fight Mario and inevitably die. For what possible reason should he stick to his post like the generic henchman he is? This guy has the absolute luxury of being able to talk to Mario without getting instantly stomped on and crushed. He should be begging Mario for the chance to save him and defeat Bowser. Mario has defeated Bowser countless times. You'd think these guys would want to start a revolution and follow Mario. This shy guy is supposed to be a stand-in for every faceless mook. There is no real reason given why they work for Bowser. They just treat it as inevitable because the Tanabe trilogy wouldn't allow for a plot as complex as Bowser's army rebelling against him. You'd think at the very least, when the shy guy's life is on the line, that he would have the intelligence to beg for his life and remind Mario who he is before they fought. The developers intentionally set it up so that he's a generic enemy encounter like any other, so that you have the gut punch of killing this random sympathetic shy guy without realizing it. But that just seems entirely unrealistic. Why is he so set on killing himself without saying a word until he dies? This shy guy has nobody to blame for his death but himself, and his inaction. I also find this whole thing weird for the characterization of Mario. Yes, Mario is a mute protagonist, but sometimes other characters will talk as if Mario said something, 
it's just not shown to the player. The fact he says nothing in response to this shy guy and is fine with him and the rest of Bowser's army antagonizing him forever just makes him look like some kind of mindless jump man. When the shy guy gives his revelation as he's killed that's supposed to make the player feel bad about it, Mario has absolutely no reaction. He just loots his corpse like he's any other generic enemy. It's like the game is trying to give some kind of Undertale commentary that Mario is some kind of evil, heartless monster. Sorry, but that's not how it works. The shy guy had a thousand opportunities to save himself and chose to leap into the path of the bullets every time. Yeah, his death is kind of sad, but the kind of commentary it's trying to give doesn't really hold up under any kind of scrutiny. The fact he's willingly serving under Bowser and trying to kill Mario, despite having a thousand reasons not to and a thousand chances to jump ship, is why he's on this villain's list. Rankings-wise, this character gets more zeros than just about any other character on the list. As a generic enemy, his visual design should also be a zero, but I very generously they gave him a 4 because there is a reason why he is a bog standard generic enemy. This is the only main boss in the game that speaks directly during his fight. So he's up there in the characterization department by the exceedingly low standards of Sticker Star. His dialogue about being obsessed with shininess is somewhat humorous, as well as about all not shiny things being terrible. Nothing great, but it's Sticker Star. I'm desperate here. Let me have this. While generic enemies with royal stickers are definitely bland, it literally being a generic Goomba, the most generic of generic minions, is a little bit funny. He summons a horde of his Goomba buddies who are not mind-controlled by the sticker to work with him, and they attack together as a unit. Eventually, they fuse together into a single giant Goomba, which is more unique than some of the other bosses, at least. However, this is Sticker Star, so as soon as the boss enters this form, he can be instantly deleted by using the tacky gimmick fan thing sticker. There's nothing in the way of gameplay for you here, it's another horrible boss. The attack animations for this thing are slightly cool because it's the only boss that takes advantage of the fact that it's made out of paper. Crumpling as you hurt them and having a somewhat cool attack animation where he rolls up into a paper tube like Mario's technique in Thousand Year Door. Unfortunately, nobody's ever going to see these attacks because they can just instantly kill this face of the boss with the fan. However, after you use the fan, the large Goombas on fused and the Goombas separate. The leader with the royal sticker commands them to refuse again, but the others didn't like it and said they lost their will and individuality, which is surprisingly deep for a game like Sticker Star. They all run off, leaving the generic Goomba leader on his lonesome. At this point, the fight is over and he's become a generic Goomba no better than any other. By comparison to Mr. Blizzard, they're not hiding the fact that the fight is over and making this a gag, so I find it a lot better done here. This is decent as a gag fight, though being the boss of a major section of the game is pretty pitiful. This is the only major Sticker Star boss to get a comedy score above zero, thanks to the fact that, you know, he can actually speak. The combined form is somewhat interesting, but it's still just a bunch of Goombas at the end of the day, so I can't give him many points for design, unfortunately. Most of his comedy comes from the fact he's not a threat, so, obviously, his threat level suffers for that. Gooper Blooper is at least a step up from the usual generic enemies that make up the Sticker Star bosses, thanks to the fact that he's a boss from the mainline Mario games and he has a unique name. Still, he was a generic monster in the game he originally came from, so that's not saying a lot. If anything, I would say Gooper Blooper is surprisingly better characterized here than in his source material, because he has a musical boss gimmick that makes him one of the more memorable encounters in the game. His theme is one of the better tracks from Sticker Star, sticking out compared to the other music that's all in a similar style. He slaps his tentacles down onto the platform in tandem with the music, but this is just aesthetic, it has no effect on the boss fight. The main gimmick of the boss battle is that Gooper Blooper can poison you, which will deal big damage over time. If you have the sponge thing sticker, you can block it and send the poison back at him, which wins the fight automatically like all of the other Sticker Star bosses. I will say there is more strategy to using the thing sticker here than other bosses though, because it needs to specifically be used to counter a certain attack, rather than just mindlessly applied at any time during a certain phase. He will also use the attack more than once, so using it early on in the fight could potentially be wasteful. There's a little bit of strategy in how you use it. It's also possible to just 
just waste the sponge by using it when he's not going to use the poison move. And that's not really all that obvious to the player the first time they'll fight the boss. They pretty much need to know his patterns to realize when to use the sponge, which makes this something of a trial and error boss. You counter him and you win, or you waste the sponge and you lose. It's not all that well designed. It's a small issue, but I find it weird that Cooper Blooper's weakness is getting his face covered in his own goop in this fight, as that's a contradiction to his original appearance in Sunshine. In that game, he spits out his ink as a defensive layer, and you can't hurt him when the goop is on his face. Feels like they weren't being that true to his character to me with this one. I was going to give him a higher score on characterization for the music gimmick, but that little contradiction with Sunshine Gooper Blooper is letting me leave his characterization score down in the pits. Especially when he's a generic monster besides that. He's pretty much entirely carried by his music score. This guy is an optional boss who shows up after you kill Lava Piranha. He blocks the path from Toad Town to Koopa Village and demands you pay him 100 coins to go past. The solution to go around him without fighting him is to use the sewers, but it's much more tempting to fight him immediately. For the point at which he can be fought, he is technically one of the strongest bosses in the game with his tremendous stats. Unfortunately, his fight is really simple despite that fact, with only two attacks at his disposal. And he is incredibly vulnerable to status effects like Sleep and Dizzy. In Pro Mode, his stats are pumped up to ridiculous levels to the point his butt stomp does an absurd 16 damage, basically forcing you to abuse status to kill him. This is a very gimmicky fight, similar to Sticker Star style fights, and that he's just a damage sponge testing to see if you have certain items at your disposal to turn him into a trivial encounter. Although he works better than the bosses in those games because he's optional and there's no real benefit to killing him. It's also possible to just show up to fight him in the late game after you've outscaled him without bothering to use any status effects. As far as his character, there's not much to it beyond him being a simple thug. His name is a pun on the words can't see, referencing his glasses. An unintentional gag that I found a lot funnier is the fact that his name is really similar to Clark Kent, Superman's civilian identity. Clark Kent also wears glasses to hide who he is, so is this random giant Koopa some kind of superhero in disguise? He looks almost identical to Hook Bill Koopa from Yoshi's Island, just with the addition of the glasses. So at the least I buy the possibility that this guy tried to change his name. Not a lot positive about this one, unfortunately. Basically, the only good thing for this guy is that he's hard. Other than that, he's not very good in any category, and he doesn't even have his own team. This is the first Origami King entry on the list, and the third game in the Tanabe trilogy. After the first two games, where every enemy was just a generic mainline Mario boss, the team had certainly heard their fair share of criticisms from what they'd released previously. They still weren't allowed to make any new original character designs, though, so they came up with a solution. The new enemy faction would primarily be made up of... Wait for it... INANIMATE OBJECTS! which call themselves the Legion of Stationary. See? If the design is a generic object that exists in real life, it's not a new design, right? Therefore, we can get around the restriction that Tanabe doesn't want us to make any new characters. The original Paper Mario titles really did not have much to do with the fact they were paper. It was just a quirk of the graphical style. So having these worlds filled with lots of complex and memorable characters be turned into arts and crafts definitely made the majority of people who liked the original games angry. Paper Mario had nothing to do with paper previously, outside of one or two references, but now it was constantly shoving the fact that the characters are made out of paper in your face. That's probably all stuff you know coming into this video, though. So now we're going to break down these inanimate object bosses, piece by piece. Because these are technically new characters, they were allowed to give them personalities rather than having to adhere to mainline Mario canon. As hard as it is to treat these objects like characters, most if not all of them are meant to be comedic on some level, and the fact they're extremely difficult to take seriously is supposed to emphasize that. To people who like them, it's supposed to emphasize their designs and make them funnier. But to me, it mostly looks like they're just trying to get around a restriction. As far as Tape, the boss entry we're talking about right now, he's the one that gets the smallest screen time and has the least impact. When he does show up, 
His character gimmick is that he's a stereotypical gangster. It's not like that's a terrible character archetype, but generically talking in a Brooklyn accent and saying stereotypical gangster cliches like, forget about it, doesn't really make for a terribly memorable character. He's just a stereotype without anything to really define him. Outside of his cheesy dialogue, the main thing setting him apart is the fact that he is a generic roll of tape and not a real gangster. His main attack animation has him rev himself up like a wheel while motorcycle sound effects play, which is a little funny because it goes with him being a gangster and all, I guess. The one part of his design that is not a generic roll of tape is that he has one little strand of tape going off from his main roll that is supposed to resemble the pompadour hairstyle, which is associated with Japanese gangsters. Honestly, I didn't really realize that until the wiki told me that's what it's supposed to be. It's really subtle. They're pretty limited by the whole fact he's a generic roll of tape if you hadn't noticed. Ignoring the restrictions in place on this game, I don't really see why this one in particular couldn't just be an actual character with a design instead of being a roll of tape. The fact he's an inanimate object is really kind of a cliff note. The gameplay of the boss battles in Origami King is still a far cry from the original two RPG games, but it's definitely improvement from Sticker Star and Color Splash. This game has its own unique combat system with a ring. The battles against generic enemies are honestly not super different from the old titles, but the system changes against bosses, because the developers recognized their combat was broken and didn't work. Against bosses, Mario has to go through a puzzle-like ring and get to the center to attack the boss, while avoiding traps potentially collecting power-ups, with plenty of distractions on the board all vying for the player's attention. It's not terribly difficult, but there's a time limit to try to force Mario to rush. The only penalty for the time limit ticking down, though, is that you have to spend some coins to buy more time, something you're generally never going to run out of, so the combat is still far from perfect. Rankings-wise, the Origami King bosses aren't all quite as low of a score for boss fights, but they're still uphill battles to get a good ranking. They're still bad, just noticeably less bad. Tape gets a 1 for visual design rather than a 0 because of his little makeshift pompadour, but I'm not giving him more than that considering I didn't even really notice it until I was told. Oh look, another member of the Legion of Stationery. No, they're not all getting ranked in a row right next to each other, as tempting as that is. Colored pencils and tape are definitely the worst of the bunch. It took me a bit to decide which of the two was worse. Colored Pencils has the makings of potentially going higher, as he has more impact before he shows up for his boss fight. He draws graffiti over everything, including a picture of his boss, the Origami King. He goes on to fire pencil missiles at you as you try to climb his tower, which is more than anything Tape really does before he shows up. Colored Pencils has a much more humorous personality than a sock gangster. He's a pretentious artist who is full of himself and thinks his art is amazing, while thinking Mario is a disgusting piece of pop culture filth. Colored Pencils did get some genuine laughs out of me, and even if this is the obvious personality to give to literal pencils, that does not change that it is a significantly funnier archetype than a generic gangster. I wanted to give more credit to the pencils, but there's a few things that I just really hate about this character. The first one is that in his introduction, the pencils claim that his name is John Pierre. The game, however, just calls him Colored Pencils. In universe, the generic companion of the game, Olivia, outright insults him and says that his name is too long and difficult to remember, and says that she will instead call him Colored Pencils. That is honestly far more offensive and rude than anything the pencils themselves said, but he has no retort to her. He just generically starts the boss battle, and lets everyone just call him Colored Pencils. That's just pathetic, man. Embrace your individuality. You're supposed to be a pretentious artist who's full of himself. Are you really gonna stand for that? Olivia has a similar scene with Tape where she calls him Tacky, and Tape gets offended by it and responds. Colored Pencils, though? He just lets Olivia get away with that. The fact this thing is referred to as colored pencils also makes absolutely no sense, because the character is clearly not the pencils, but the little box tin that's storing the pencils. He fires out the pencils at Mario, and they explode before he reloads himself with new pencils. I generally don't want to question the anatomy of these inanimate object characters from the Legion of Stationery, but this thing's name isn't even accurate to what it actually is. Maybe they would have been better off with using his actual name? I know they would never do that because they're trying to hide the fact that they made more characters, but his name is really awful. 
The last dialogue box that this character gets before dying is saying that Mario is better as a side-scroller. In the context of this game series, the Tanabe Trilogy, that just comes across as incredibly insulting and spiteful by saying that Paper Mario and the rest of the RPGs are bad, as he's telling him to go back to his platformer roots. The boss fight itself is probably the most forgettable among the stationary members, seeing as he's the first one and it's a pretty easy battle compared to the others. It's a somewhat humorous animation where Mario goes to close the thing's mouth, if you can call it that, and the pencils explode inside of it, but that's about it. I'm giving Colored Pencils a 1 for characterization because of how awful that bit is with him not standing up for himself and accepting the generic name title despite it making no sense. But I will let him keep the decent comedy score for the pretentious artist bits. When you're on the screen so briefly, just one little interaction can be enough to ruin a character. Although Colored Pencils was never all that great to begin with, there wasn't that much to even ruin. The Goomba King is a Goomba who just so happens to be a king. He's not exactly the most difficult of characters to understand. He wouldn't be out of place with characters like King bob -omb or King Womp from Mario 64. This is so much the case that, in fact, he's one of the exceedingly rare Paper Mario characters who managed to show up in mainstream Mario titles, despite first appearing in a Mario RPG. Under the new name of Goomboss, he shows up in Mario 64 DS as a boss, where I'd say he's more memorable than his mediocre appearance in Paper Mario. He has somehow managed to kidnap Mario and keep him trapped in a box. I'd certainly have liked to see how he did that. He also shows up in Mario Kart DS as a boss, but after that he was locked into the Nintendo vault, never to be seen again. Within Paper Mario itself, the Goomba King first sends out his two minions, Red Goomba and Blue Goomba, to attack Mario. These two enforcers of his are as absurdly generic as their names imply, and are laughably easy to defeat. They are then later on seen with their king inside of his castle. He comes out to attack Mario to be the boss of the prologue. While it's easy to defeat him normally, if you attack the chestnut tree next to him, a giant chestnut falls out of it and takes out a third of the Goomba King's health while instantly killing his two minions, which for all intents and purposes will instantly win you the fight. It's not like the fight is hard, and you can get the same effect by using a fire flower, but it's pretty pathetic that you can win this easily. Without his two minions, Goomba King has next to no damage output and is a non-threat. After the fight, the King and his minions retreat and lock themselves in their castle, trying to hide from Mario. Mario then casually hits a switch outside the castle that causes the castle to transform into a bridge, flinging them off into the distance and making them never appear in the game again. The red and blue Goombas write a letter to Goombario later to apologize, implying that they survived, but we never hear from Goomba King again, meaning that that stupid scene of them flying off into the distance like Team Rocket could have just killed him. He showed up in other games later, but some sources considered Goomba King and Goomba separate characters, because it would be filthy to allow an RPG character into the beloved Miyamoto Mario canon. How dare anyone ever suggest such a thing? The only real reason anyone remembers the Goomba King in particular is because of the rematch in Pro Mode. The Goomba King is easy as ever in the intro, but every chapter boss is given a rematch in an optional area later on. Goomba King is incredibly lucky to be included in this deal because he's technically the boss of the prologue, while lots of other, more notable characters like Junior Troopa and Big Lantern Ghost miss out on this opportunity. In this fight, attacking the tree option doesn't exist, and the number on all three opponents are massively inflated. Red and Blue Goomba will often use their turns to buff the attack and defense of the king. Attack is signified as red, while defense is signified as blue in Paper Mario, so it makes a lot of sense that they're dedicated to the two statistics. Mario will have to kill the minions as soon as possible to make the fight winnable. In particular, the blue one, since with enough defense boost, the king can basically become invincible. The Goomba King also has an attack where he can hit the tree instead of Mario, causing tacky props to fall down from it and apply status effects to him, which is definitely a nice spin on the battle. In the normal game, the Star Beam is completely useless outside of the final battle against Bowser, while here it dispels enemy buffs. If you try to beat the Goomba King before the end of the game, this is one of the single hardest rematches, let alone fights, in the entire game. But it's incredibly trivialized if you do allow yourself to use the Star Beam. Sadly, only Paper Mario 1 has hacks like this which greatly alter the bosses. Thousand Year Door hacking can't do much beyond just buff enemy numbers right now. 
and none of the other games have notable hacking scenes. As such, I'm not going to take the Pro Mode and Master Quest versions of the bosses into account when grading their scores. Still, I think it's worth going over them to show how much better some of them could have been, and to highlight the strengths and weaknesses of these bosses as a whole. Goomba King scores terribly in all categories besides music. He's the tutorial boss of the first Paper Mario, so it's not that surprising. This is a random Sniffit trying to con you out of your money during the part where Sniffits take over Shroom City and rename it Sniff City. Sniffits, for whatever reason, are one of the enemy groups who get a lot of focus in the Tanabe trilogy, and they're a decent enough choice among the Miyamoto-approved enemies. This specific Sniffit promises you money if you can guess what his mood is under his mask, but you have to pay him if you fail. That seems innocent enough, but after you fail the first time, the Sniffit will say that he will trap you forever in a dungeon for all eternity if you fail. It's just a generic Sniffit, so after he says that, you'd think Mario would just kill him with one attack, but he's a generic mute protagonist, so he just goes along with it. You get one of four choices as to what the Sniffit's mood is, and it's random, of course. You can get lucky and ruin the tension by just guessing right at random early on. You get four guesses, the first three of which are 25% chances. It's slightly more likely that you will get it right at random before getting to the end, just kind of silly when that skips most of the best dialogue. The Sniffit gets more and more confident as you fail, getting smug and talking about how excited he is to spend your money. However, the final time, he'll be so smug that he'll be silently chuckling to himself. His mask will fail to hide his expression since you can hear him laughing, so snickering will always be the correct answer. The only people who should fail at this point are people who don't know what snickering means due to not having it as their first language, or being super young kids. If you do mess up, the Sniffit will in fact suck Mario into the compartment above his stand and trap him for all eternity. It's a non-standard game over, and honestly not something I expected out of Origami King, it's pretty funny. If that wasn't enough, Luigi apparently was already scammed by this guy and is trapped inside of there too, and the only way to learn that is to get this game over. Mario will just walk by and leave his brother trapped in there for who knows how long. Something I'll also bring up is the Sniffit only traps Mario. His partner's there? They are apparently off the hook and don't bother saving Mario, much less Luigi. They're so helpful, Professor Toad and Olivia are totally legitimate partners. Overall, this segment, while it has zero gameplay, is better than some of the worst bosses in this series, just as a brief fun little distraction. He technically has a respectable threat level too, seeing as he can just kill Mario apparently, but he still is just a random sniffet. I, I don't know how you guys pronounce it. I pronounce it Petty Piranha, but I've heard some people say PD Piranha. But anyway, let's just get into it. We got another boss from Sunshine here that shows up in Sticker Star, just like Gooper Blooper. The important thing you need to know about him is he does actually show up before you fight him briefly, as he eats your partner, Kirsty. This makes the section before you get to him slightly more difficult when you don't have her as now you can only attack once per turn. Of course, this is Sticker Star, where there is zero incentive to ever fight optional battles, so that doesn't come into play much. At the start of the boss, Petty Piranha will bizarrely shout out a couple of words despite the fact he's never been able to speak before, which is really, really weird, but okay. It's just a couple of words, so I'm not docking him for it, but it's kind of dumb. When Petty Piranha gets up from off the floor, he'll pull up his pants in a rather awkward animation that I don't think I needed to see, but honestly, I'll take it at this point. It's at least something resembling characterization compared to these other generic monster bosses. Apparently he's taking a page out of King Hippo's book. And Petty Piranha's actual boss, it is the best designed boss in Sticker Star, not that that's saying much. There is no generic thing sticker that instantly invalidates his existence like the other bosses, so that's an immediate step up. In addition, one of the biggest problems in this game is the fact that you have limited ammunition because all of your attacks being consumables, but Petty Piranha solves that. As you attack him, he will vomit up more and more stickers to attack him with, with the implication he's been eating them before the fight. This makes the fight work much better and solves some of the problems of Sticker Star's battle system. Too bad it's just for this one random boss fight, though. Petty Piranha is a very weak opponent himself, because of the fact that designers know you're in a weakened state with only having one action per turn, and don't want to make him too hard. His most powerful attack is the fact that he can vomit up dry bones to serve him as minions when you attack him, which is honestly pretty cool. The implication that he's eaten Koopas that have been reduced to bones inside of his stomach and come back from the dead to fight for him is pretty hilarious. 
That said, it makes absolutely zero sense why they're helping the guy who murdered them and turned them into dry bones in the first place. But I guess turning into undeads made them mindless or something. Unfortunately, the boss fight is still pathetically easy, and when roughly two-thirds of his HP are gone, he will vomit up Kirsty, giving you your all-powerful multiple turns back and basically ending the boss fight right there. It's still way better than the others. This boss fight score helps to propel him higher than he would be. His characterization and humor scores mostly come from how funny him spitting up dry bones is. I gave him half a story involvement point because of the fact that he eats your partner and does show up before his fight. That's something at least. Doing that and killing so many Koopas gives him something resembling a threat level too. It is pretty hilarious that Petty Pron is one of the few characters from the Tanabe trilogy who is a direct counterpart to a boss from the original trilogy, and he's actually better than them. Lava Piranha and Petty Piranha are both giant piranha plant bosses fought in volcanoes in Chapter 5 of their respective games. It's probably unintentional, but this is one of the closest things to a legitimate reference to the original games the Tanabe trilogy has. Too bad it's referencing such a bland boss as Lava Parada, but we'll take what we can get. A thwomp in Chapter 1 causes a random quiz show to come up out of nowhere. This is apparently the 65th one he's had, and he seems to look forward to people failing. He is constantly rooting against you during these questions, and is upset with each question you get right. He says he will make the questions harder or almost impossible when you are one away from victory out of rage. If you do get them wrong, he celebrates it. In the event you lose, he unleashes a group of clefts against you. This is not nearly as scary as the quiz from the original game, but can still potentially kill unprepared players without a power block or super guard at their disposal. They later reuse this quiz thwomp guy at the other end of the game in Chapter 7 where he's a separate robot cyborg character. His quiz is a fair bit harder. I think his question where really makes you think how many feet a group of enemies have is pretty good, and the joke option of defeat is pretty funny. His quiz is a fair bit harder, although the enemies he makes you fight if you lose are kind of a joke. It's so late in the game, I would have loved to see something like the first game's anti-guy unit but it's just a pair of ex-yucks. His dialogue is not exactly the same as the guy who came before him, but it's the same general gist, it's not really that different, it's just generically changed so it doesn't look like it's literally copy-pasted. Score-wise, he does technically spawn enemies, so he does have something resembling a boss fight technically if you lose, but it's still nothing spectacular. His score of 2 is coming from the gameplay of his quiz, not the generic enemy fight. Bone Chill is the leader of an underworld army of rebels, and he's a giant skeletal ice dragon thing riding a chariot, so he does get some points for character design and threat level. He only appears immediately before he is fought, so his screen time is extremely limited though. The main purpose of his dialogue is to reveal a plot twist involving Lovebee, the companion character of the chapter. He reveals that Lovebee is in fact one of the generic collectible artifact hearts that Mario needs, and reveals to her that the only reason her godparents kept her safe is because they want to protect the hearts, not her. He gets a good laugh out of this, and it is somewhat enjoyable as a villain moment. But that's the only thing this character gets characterization-wise. As far as his own ambitions, he outright refers to himself as an evil sort who the heart should be kept away from, which is kind of talking himself down to refer to himself as a cliché. Most evil characters don't think of themselves as evil, and if they do, they have much more fun and enjoy the fact they are evil, unlike Bone Chill, who is a completely serious character. The rest of his dialogue has Bone Chill insisting that he's going to become some invincible god, but that's heavily undermined by his horrible, horrible boss fight, and makes it unintentionally hilarious. Bone Chill is one of the easiest boss fights in the game, and he's pretty horribly designed. He's very, very tall, encouraging you to use Luigi's super jump technique to defeat him. If you do it, it will effortlessly kill him in four hits, and you'll kill him before he has the chance to attack at all. On a casual playthrough, you will easily kill him in less than 20 seconds. What's more, most of his attacks spawn a considerable distance away from himself, so he has next to no response to defend himself from Luigi here. It's pathetic. Now, the boss fight can actually be a little challenging if you do not use Luigi because the giant cannon will block attacks from other characters who can't super jump. But everyone on the face of the planet is going to use Luigi for this boss battle. The reason is because he's recently joined a party and it's already close to the end of the game. 
So you will have definitely had your fill of the other three party members by now and will be wanting to try out Luigi. To give some perspective on just how late Luigi joins, this is one of only two required boss fights in the game where you can actually use Luigi. So the developers clearly wanted to give him a chance to shine here, but they definitely overdid it when Luigi basically just deletes the boss from existence. With his terrible boss fight in mind, I'm lowering his score even lower than the usual Super Paper Mario boss fights all the way to a zero. There's really no value from this boss, and how easy it is just makes his character, which is supposed to be intimidating, really unintentionally pathetic. His music, even though it's nothing special, also never gets a chance to get going because he dies so absurdly quickly. Color Splash Bowser has the decency to actually talk. They at least heard that much criticism from Sticker Star. Nobody liked Bowser being mute, that much is for sure. However, his appearance here is really not that big of an upgrade from Sticker Star, despite how many places are between this ranking and that one. Like in Sticker Star, Bowser is possessed by a generic non-character artifact that takes over his mind. And just like in Sticker Star, Bowser's on-screen presence is entirely limited to showing how he got possessed and his final boss appearance at the end. No actual antagonism occurs after that. At the least, it's a lot more believable in this game that his usual army is still loyal to him in Color Splash rather than Sticker Star, since he can actually speak and he seems like he's in his right mind. I do find how Bowser gets possessed in this game to be pretty pathetic. He sees some magic paint artifacts and decides his shell would look nice if it was rainbow colored. So he decides to steal it all for himself and splashes around in the pool like a spoiled child before the paint completely covers him and possesses him. While Bowser isn't the sharpest pencil in the crayon box, he isn't so stupid as to just dive headfirst into a magical pool that he has no idea what it does. It can believe him stealing the paint stars for himself, Sure, but just playing in this paint like an idiot is a dumb look for him. When Bowser is possessed, he for the most part talks entirely like himself, which I'd be fine with. But it is clear in the ending of the game that he is possessed. As Bowser is damaged, the black paint comes off of him. And when enough of it comes off, the paint takes over entirely and makes Bowser start talking in all capital letters, make it clear that it's not Bowser talking anymore. For a brief moment while Bowser has control of himself, he shows confusion over where he is showing that he wasn't sentient. When Bowser is entirely defeated, he's even more confused and wonders if Mario is there to race go-karts with him. Now the reason why that's weird is outside of that moment where the big paint takes full control of Bowser, he's pretty much acting in character and talking how Bowser would. He's making puns like emphasizing the pain in paint, and he still orders all of his troops like nothing happened after he covered himself with this stuff. It's not like we see much of him given how limited every character's screen time is in the Tanabe trilogy, but he still feels like he's Bowser. My first thought was the paint wasn't fully possessing him until it covered him up entirely, but no. Bowser makes it clear he has absolutely no idea what happened to him. I guess the black paint just magically tapped into Bowser's memory somehow in order to use all of Bowser's armies and technology? Outside of that little plot hole, I will say that the boss fight is in fact better than most of the usual Koopling fights from Color Splash since you don't need any one generic item to win the boss. But it's still boring in using the Color Splash formula. Bring enough powerful consumable things to use on Bowser, whether you win or lose, determined by what you brought to the fight. Bowser himself doesn't really do anything interesting during the battle. The most creative attack he has is forming a hammer out of black paint. Nothing terribly original. The one thing I will give Color Splash Bowser some credit for is the fact he kills the obligatory sentient inanimate object partner of the game, Huey. That's a more intimidating threat level than anything else in the game. The fully powered up black paint Bowser has to have his attacks blocked and absorbed into Huey's paint can body, trapping the black paint inside of him and stopping it from being reabsorbed into Bowser's body. After the black paint is fully trapped in the can, Huey goes up as high as he can into the air to save the world from the black paint, exploding and painting the sky into a nighttime skyline in a heroic sacrifice. Now what makes this heroic sacrifice good is that everyone is constantly expecting Huey to immediately come back and survive this five seconds later, like Kirstie does in Sticker Star, but that's not the case. Huey stays dead. If you don't 100% the game, which 99.9% .9 of people don't, that's the last you ever see of him. If you do 100% the game, an extra scene is added where his corpse falls into the rainbow paint well Bowser originally used at the start of the game. You can argue that he's revived by happening to fall in there, but it's kept ambiguous. You don't see anything beyond that. 
and obviously Huey isn't going to ever show up in the game again. It's handled much, much better than Sticker Star. As far as to how killing Huey relates to Bowser's score, I think giving him a more respectable threat level is justified for that. The only reason the threat level isn't higher is because of the fact Bowser barely appears in the game. For visual design, Bowser's design obviously deserves higher than this score, but this game's new Bowser design was Bowser dunked in a bunch of black paint, which is pretty boring and unimaginative as far as new Bowser forms go. I am giving Bowser credit for not just his own personal themes, but also his castle, so his music score is definitely helping to carry him here. Lemmy is the only Koopaling who doesn't immediately fight you the second he sees you, giving at least a hint that he's more than just a generic obstacle to overcome. When he sees Mario, he actually has the brain to just run and hide, something the other Koopalings would have been wise to attempt. Unfortunately, his boss fight is still pretty shortly after he appears, he just has the brains to send out a small minion gauntlet before his boss fight begins. His boss fight is pretty much the same as all the others. The gameplay phase is just him constantly summoning minions like Larry, while he's elevated above the ground so he can't be hammered, like Morton. It's slightly more complicated than the others, but eventually he brings out a giant death ball that must be countered by a generic thing sticker you must have or you lose, like every other Color Splash boss. The only reason I'm going to give Lemmy a slightly higher score for boss battles with zero instead of a negative one is because of that enemy gauntlet in front of him. It's still very easy and mindless, but it's more gameplay than most Color Splash bosses. I'm not entirely sure if I should count it since you can save between the gauntlet and Lemmy himself. They're technically separate encounters, but I'll be nice. The main reason Lemmy is higher is because this is the first game to finally address Lemmy's long-standing character trait that he always secretly wanted to abandon Bowser and join the circus. It was only really a cliff note that you could find in manuals previously, with the only thing circus-like about him being the fact that he loved to play with bounty balls and road one during his boss fights. Here in Color Splash, he's a full-blown ringmaster, though. He gets one or two funny moments in his character intro before he notices Mario. When he receives applause, he says, Thank you, thank you, you're easily amused, mocking his simple-minded audience. I only wish that he stuck around for the enemy gauntlet to give them orders like General Guy does in the first game. It'd be a lot funnier if he was the one mocking their failures as opposed to off-camera Shy Guys. Yes, the boss fight still is terrible because of the generic giant spike ball of death that either kills you or gets destroyed in one attack, but that is a prop he can only pull out once. You can't just do it at any time like Larry can just kick you to kill you on demand. Because of that, he doesn't have to have his characterization score held back like the other Kooplings presented so far. He does have two scenes rather than just one, so I ever so slightly boosted his story involvement from a 1 to a 1.5. This is the titular villain of Paper Mario the Origami King. Shockingly, the third game of the Tanabe trilogy did not have the villain generically be Bowser again, so major plus points there. Fun fact, Ollie is the only Mario villain to ever have his name be at the title of a game. Bowser's inside story doesn't count because Bowser isn't the villain of that game. Regardless, they definitely wanted to have more story in this title, given both the main villain and his minions aren't just standard Mario enemies. King Ollie doesn't suffer from being an inanimate object from real life either. He has a fully unique design. So surely he has to be good, right? Well, if you ask me, not so much. His design is super, super simplistic. The main reason why it's so simple is because he's the counterpart of the game's obligatory companion, Olivia. Modeling your villain after a chibi companion character isn't really a great way to go. That is about as bare bones as it gets. His main visual defining trait is an emo hair flip. Not the flashiest way to stand out. During the first phase of his boss fight, Ollie will turn into some of the earlier defeated bosses. Not the Legion of Stationary, but a bunch of monsters that don't speak called the Velamentals, which I didn't include on this ranking since they aren't villains. He transforms into them, keeping his own purple color scheme to make it clear that it's him, but it's just a recolor. Besides color, all he keeps is his crown and his emo hair. Yeah, his hair is really his most personally defining physical characteristic to let you know it's him. During this first phase, Ollie will occasionally change forms between these four bosses to try to mix things up, but he really doesn't offer anything new. Normally, he's killed so quickly by most players that he won't be able to go through more than two out of the four boss forms at his disposal. Now, say whatever you want to about Origami King's primary combat system, 
but it's significantly better than Color Splash and Sticker Star. I can see why some people might like it, even if it doesn't personally appeal to me. Now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because the first phase of Ollie's boss fight is the last time you ever see that gameplay style for the rest of the game. After that, it's nothing but gimmick gameplay that has nothing to do with everything you've been doing up until this point. And no, there's nothing that's really all that difficult either. If you do like Origami King and its gameplay, King Ollie is absolutely a massive letdown of a final boss. Immediately before you fight him, you fight a generic stapler who is the true final boss of the game gameplay-wise. The stapler does not talk and has the personality of a generic dog, so I didn't give it the rankings, it's just a mindless monster. While I do rank a couple of other mindless monsters on the list, they all have more story relevance than the stapler, who's just an obstacle in the way. I also think it's dumb that that stapler is technically considered a member of the Legion of Stationary when he can't talk, but whatever. For the rest of King Ollie's boss fight, it's really simple stuff with constant checkpoints. Nothing that would ever really be a blockade to stop you from progressing. His big villainous transformation is genetically turning big. That's already pretty lame when Bowser does it, but at least it makes sense for Bowser considering he's a big monster to start with. With a design about as simplistic as you could possibly imagine, Ollie doesn't really become any more intimidating by making him bigger. The first phase of his boss has him fighting against a giant Origami King Bowser who's on Mario's side. If you do nothing, Ollie easily defeats Bowser somehow, despite Bowser being the king of giant boss battles, despite them being the exact same size and them just engaging in a silly slap fight. The phase after that has Ollie turn into the standard issue Tiki Tong Head and Hands final boss design, just like Bowser and Sticker Star. Before this game came out, I thought it was impossible that this tiny little design would be the final boss instead of it just being Bowser again, but I said that if he did somehow end up being the main antagonist, that he'd undergo some kind of transformation before the game was over. I guess his two little arm nubs become actual hands, and his stupid emo hair becomes even bigger. Does that count? It's pretty underwhelming, to say the least. As far as Ollie's characterization, the developers are trying to make him a sympathetic villain. Ollie shows up a grand total of three times in the game. Once at the beginning, the middle, and the end. That the start and the end are obligatory, while the one time he shows up in the middle is to try to convince his sister Olivia to join his side, while of course ignoring absolutely anything she has to say. He really doesn't care about her at all, other than the fact that they're related, and refuses to ever listen to her point of view on anything. Eventually, he just gives up and tries to kill her multiple times. He drops a boulder on her for crying out loud. What a sympathetic character. Ollie wants to generically remake the world in his image like plenty of villains mad with power. His motivation, however, is a horrible excuse that is played for comic relief. Ollie was created by a toad origami maker, and when he was built, the toad scribbled something on his back and he was incredibly offended by that for some reason. This made him hate all toads and want to destroy the entire world over it. What was written on Ollie that he found so offensive? He doesn't know. This is the entirety of his motivation, and he never read it before he has his sister read it to him at the end of the game. The text says that his creator wanted him to be a good and wise king, which is apparently okay with Ollie. He's fine he's being doodled on if the text is nice, apparently. He apparently thought that his creator had just put a big kick-me sign on his back or something, because he never thought to check for the entirety of the game. Only then does Ollie feel remorseful for his ridiculously rash actions that are something only a spoiled child would do. While Ollie does want to destroy everything, his motivation is specifically racism against Toads. Because the first thing you want to do if you want to make a sympathetic villain is to make him a massive racist. His creator generically was a Toad, so now he hates all Toads because one specific person he hates was a Toad. He says that all Toads look the same to him, which many people have taken to be a joke about how fans of the original games hate the Tanabe trilogy for having nothing but standard issue mainline Mario designs, most obviously with the Toads. I'm sure this is going to shock you, but no. I don't appreciate Tanabe saying that I am effectively King Ali because I don't like the fact that Toads look the same in Paper Mario games. This line could be funny in a vacuum because of how absurd Ali's hatred of the Toads is, but in the context of this franchise comes across very offensive with Tanabe taking a direct jab at the fans of the old games. In interviews for this title, Tanabe has said many times that he has seen the criticism of Origami King and the fans who want the games to be more like the previous title. He just actively chooses to ignore it. Apparently, Tanabe's justification was that very few people said the dialogue and surveys for Super Paper Mario was their favorite part of the game. Because apparently, in these surveys, saying the story 
are the characters where your favorite part of Super Paper Mario does not count. It's obviously just confirmation bias where he's looking for an answer that he's already come up with in his head. Getting back to King Ollie, if he is so specifically racist against Toads, why is he taking out on everyone else? One of his biggest victims is Bowser and the Koopa Troop. If he hates Toad, shouldn't he be on friendly terms with Bowser, or potentially even be a fan of his? There's nobody more antagonistic to Toads than Bowser on the planet, so I'm sure they'd get along great if Ollie was written more like a character instead of as a generic stock villain. This racism against Toads was thrown in as a joke line at the expense of classic Paper Mario fans, with no legitimate thought put behind it beyond a throwaway gag. King Ollie is my personal most hated villain on the ranking besides Sticker Star Bowser, but I'm trying to use this more objective ranking system to show that even when giving him credit for the fact he is technically pretty involved in the story and is a threat to the characters by defeating them all, the score he ends up with is still pitiful. Definitely not a great final boss. The only reason he's even this high on the ranking system is that he's being carried by his music score, which is mostly just from his castle rather than his battle themes. While you might be desensitized to seeing negative one scores for boss fights, King Ollie definitely deserves one, and is the only villain from Origami King to get a negative one for that category. This guy gets extremely limited screen time, but the only point you see him personally being directly before he is fought. However, he has large story importance as he is the ruler of the Floro Sapiens, who are the villainous faction of the chapter he's in. He's been enslaving the Kragnon race by brainwashing them with Floro Sprouts, forcing them to work as slaves in his mines to dig up gems. The extent of the character of King Crocus is that he's obsessed with beautiful things and making himself more beautiful. He's that stereotypical vanity-obsessed villain. Considering that Crocus is some kind of flower creature, that makes a decent amount of sense compared to some other characters, I guess. His boss fight is pathetically easy, what with it being in Super Paper Mario. Unlike other bosses in the game, he can't be super easily comboed because he's only vulnerable at specific points as his head is covered up by his rose petals. However, his attacks are really non-threatening and easy to avoid, so all he's really doing is delaying the inevitable. After Crocus is defeated, his followers come in and show genuine concern for him by insisting that he's some amazing, benevolent king who they all love. When asked about the Kragnons, his followers say that the reason they were hostile to them was because they threw trash in the water supply, which was the primary source of sustenance for the Floro Sapiens. This doesn't really come across at all when you were talking to Crocus himself, as he seems like a very generic villain. The theme of trash comes up in his conversation, and that he calls the Kragnons trash, but he's absurdly quick to become hostile to the heroes, just like when he enslaved the Kragnons by putting floral sprouts on their heads to brainwash them. This whole conflict could have been solved pathetically easily if he had just talked, or even if he explained why he was brainwashing the Kragnons. If he didn't want to negotiate directly, he could have sent a brainwashed slave to do it on his behalf. This is not exactly difficult. I really don't have any sympathy for this supposedly sympathetic villain, as he made his problems far worse with how he handled them. I'm really not a fan of this character, and he doesn't really excel in any category. His music is trying surprisingly hard, but most players aren't going to hear much of this tune before his fight ends. For how comedic most vanity-obsessed villains are, like, say, Valentina from Super Mario RPG, Crocus doesn't get to do much of anything funny, primarily because of how brief his screen time is. The most powerful tool at his disposal is Floral Sprouts, which he does not directly use, only his minions do. The primary purpose of him and his faction, narratively, is just to set up the existence of Floral Sprouts in general, which are put to much better use by Dementio. Roy, similar to Iggy, now uses a bazooka in the majority of his appearances after it showed up in New Super Mario Bros. It's a cool weapon, and it doesn't restrict his theme quite as heavily as it does with Iggy, who kind of requires everything to be built around his new gimmick. Roy's dialogue is more enjoyably antagonistic than some of the others, and he quite competently starts the fight by stealing all of Mario's paint alongside his Shy Guy minions. This limits Mario, but in a way that's less tacky than Kamek magically turning all of Mario's weapons into something else by just snapping his fingers like it's nothing. Roy did have to do some work for this. Roy also actually uses the paint he gathered against Mario, loading it into his cannon and firing it at him. 
This applies various tacky status effects based on the color of the paint that he shoots at Mario, doing stupid things like making Mario angry when he's red or sad when he's blue. It's so tacky and stupid I can't help but find it a little bit funny, honestly. So Roy actually gets a half-decent comedy score, which is pretty rare for a Tanabe trilogy character. Each status effect does change the gameplay around slightly. It's not just an aesthetic, and there are so many of these that one of them will likely catch you by surprise. He only keeps each status effect on for a single round before changing to the next one, not giving you time to get used to it. He will go on with this phase until he either runs out of colors or you do enough damage to force the next phase to start. This phase is unironically some decent gameplay, and he doesn't have any stupid mandatory interactions with thing stickers. After this, Roy will say it's taking too long and force the Shy Guys to pour all of the remaining paint into his cannon, after which he starts mixing it together inside like it's some kind of witch's cauldron. This causes all of the paint to turn black, and he fires it all over to make the arena dark and hard to see. This is a somewhat cool aesthetic, but gameplay-wise, yes, this is the arbitrary point where you must use a thing sticker to progress because Roy can't be hit in the dark. After that, Roy loses his cannon and just fights you with his fists generically, meaning the fight is basically over. The first phase of the fight is cool enough for me to give this fight a 1.5 for boss fights, rather than a 0 or a negative 1. There is some legitimate gameplay before we get to the usual generic wall of use this attack or you lose. If only the entire fight was like the first part, this could be a decent boss. There's also nothing that dumb about how Roy uses the black paint attack. He can't casually just use that attack for a second time, unlike the other Kooplings who can use their instant death attack at will, so his characterization score gets a perfectly respectable value of 3. Not much, but by Tanabe standards, that's pretty good. Bizarre is one of many characters who somehow was hired by Bowser off camera in Paper Mario. I know regular Mario games have everyone work for Bowser, but these guys aren't Bowser's usual minions. So it comes across a bit stranger in the modern era of Mario that it's just assumed that all of these unique characters will all work for him in this game. Bizarre is an optional boss as when you go over his bridge, he will confront Mario and look at a wanted poster of him to confirm his identity. He's supposed to not let Mario pass. Now, the humorous thing about him is that despite having the poster, he will still ask who Mario is. Mario is given a pre-selected list of answers and can say that he's Mario, Luigi, or Peach. Obviously, Buzzer will just attack Mario if he admits who he is, but Bizarre is pretty easily tricked. He'll be fooled if you say Luigi and let you go on your way. If you say Peach, the only reason he realizes you're lying is because Peach is locked up in Bowser's castle. Apparently, appearances mean nothing to him. I guess humans all look the same to bird people, because that wanted poster Bizarre is looking at clearly is not helping him. His actual boss is pretty simple, but he has a variety of attack animations and more HP than the primary boss of the chapter. The most unique attack he has is that he tries to carry Mario up into the sky and uses the action command, where you build up a meter by mashing A, and you only escape from Bizarre if the little meter happens to be on the part of the bar you filled up. It makes a kind of luck-based attack, but it's a nice, unique little action command that I don't think is used for any other attacks in the whole game, if I remember right. At least not any other bosses. They reuse the functionality from when you try to run away from battle for that. The pro mode version of this fight has Bizarre able to attack your partner with his wind flurry attack, disabling them a bit. And that's honestly all that's needed to make this fight that hard. It's still pretty early in the game, so this fight is pretty serviceable compared to some of the other early ones even if it is very simplistic. His low score mostly amounts to lacking a boss theme, and his design is pretty bog-standard at the end of the day. It's technically unique, but a generic buzzard named Bizarre isn't especially imaginative. Hole Punch is definitely a step up from the previous two Legion of Stationary members, even if his design isn't. He punches out the faces of a bunch of toads to enslave them, then helps them set up his personal disco late-night dance club. You get to hear about him before you immediately fight him. There is some actual hype built up before his boss fight by comparison to tape and colored pencils. He's another pretentious artsy character who wants a very specific type of groove in his music, and you have to hunt down the right track to make him come out of his lair. After that, 
he refuses to come out until you gather up all the toads around the area to come dance for him, because he refuses to dance alone. Only once you've fulfilled all of his arbitrary requirements will he finally come out on the dance floor, after which he will casually knock all the other backup dancers he asked for away like they're nothing. Once his boss fight starts, it's nothing all that much more special than the other bosses in Origami King, using the usual gameplay style. His gimmick is he cuts off pieces of Mario, which permanently take away from his max HP, but Mario can go collect his missing pieces to get back the amount of health lost. Is it terribly unique? No, but it's at least serviceable as far as boss fights in this style go. I'm giving this thing a pretty generous threat score just because of the fact it punches out the faces of a bunch of toads and enslaves them. No other category sticks out much, it's more just that Hole Punch isn't absolutely abysmal in any category besides the fact he's an inanimate object, giving him a visual design of zero. I don't think the fact he's a Hole Punch is particularly relevant to his whole Disco King character, and punching people's faces off, if anything, is a bit morbid for an otherwise silly character. One of the few traditions to carry over from the original games to the Tanabe trilogy is there being villainous quiz show segments. Sniff It or Whiff It is a game show in both Sticker Star and Color Slash, and they're similar enough in both games it makes sense to put it as one entry. The name of the show is a pretty humorous pun, because the penalty of failing in Sticker Star is that the Sniff It host pops poisonous gas onto the show floor for you to breathe in, or rather, Sniffin. The general tone is funny as the host doesn't care that you're gonna die, although I'd say he's a bit less antagonistic than the Thwomps from Thousand Year Doors. There are quiz questions, with the first one just being free in that he's asking whether Bowser or Mario is cooler. Normally I would almost always answer Bowser, but the fact that this question is coming from Sticker Star, which has the worst version of Bowser ever, makes me hesitate a bit. Eventually, he makes you play a whack-a-mole game as well, while pumping in the poison gas while you play. Hearts also come up aside from the sniffits you have to smash, so it's pretty much impossible to lose. If you go back, there's a harder version where you have to do both the trivia and whack-a-mole at the same time, but it's still not that difficult. The story reason you come to this random place in Sticker Star is because you have to gather Wiggler's segments back, and the Sniffit host is keeping this random body segment of Wiggler as a prize. That's hilariously morbid when you think about it from an in-universe perspective. They just have some random sentient creature's dismembered body part just lying around as a game show prize. In Color Splash, the narrative is a bit more dull as it's brought back for the Underwater Edition. The tone isn't quite as antagonistic as normal, and if you get all the questions right, you won't even realize they might kill you. When you get your first question wrong, an urchin starts lowering down. If you get enough wrong, it'll kill you. Sniffit apologizes for this, but says it'll boost the ratings. While the underwater version of the show is less funny and the name of the show doesn't make sense anymore, the gameplay is significantly harder and it's very possible to get the questions wrong. He'll have you guess cards from very brief views of them, sometimes giving you better views but showing multiple cards at once, or have you fill up a card with color a very specific amount. This requires the player to think a lot more than usual, considering how dull and generic the cards are as a bunch of icons of generic boots and hammers. That means a lot of them will look very similar. In addition, you need to own the cards to be able to provide them as answers, which can also make you lose a question or two at random and force you to fill your inventory with garbage just for this quiz. You still need to get a ton of questions wrong to lose, though. A whopping four of them. So it's still very unlikely you're gonna get a game over from this. I am generously combining the strengths of the two Sniffit quizzes together here. The Sticker Star one is much funnier, but the Color Slash one has actual gameplay. By themselves, they're not much better than the Thwomps quiz. Considering the second quiz is a direct sequel to the first one, though, I think it's fair to put them together as one entry. And yeah, I know I already put Petty Piranha as number one for Sticker Star, but I wasn't sure if this really counted or not because it's combining two games together. So I'm letting them both kind of be number one for the purposes of this list. Gourmet Guy is one of very few villains I'm going to put on here who has never fought. Instead, he's a giant obese shy guy who blocks your way like a Snorlax in the middle of the road and refuses to move unless you feed him cake. 
He apparently finds the cape lip smacking good, and once you feed it to him, he runs around in a comedic sequence as he's overjoyed at how good the food is. You have the option to feed him anything, even garbage like dusty hammers if you hate him, but he will of course spit all those out until you give him the cake. Apparently Gourmet Guy is really strong if you can't just kill him to get him out of the way. In the end credits, he threatens the most powerful boss in the game, Huff and Puff, by trying to go eat him in a comedic fashion. I still would have liked the opportunity to fight this guy directly though. Gourmet Guy's design sticks out a lot from the other Shy Guys. While they all have varied costumes, he's the only one that's a different size from the rest of them, and has a different silhouette. You'd wish more of them had varied body shapes like he does. If this appearance in Shy Guy's toy box was all there was to it, I wouldn't bother ranking Gourmet Guy. But after his appearance there, he somehow manages to waddle his fat behind all the way up to Bowser's castle in the sky. There, he's apparently a guard keeping Peach locked away. He doesn't actually care, though and orders Peach to go bake him yet another cake in a cooking minigame. Most of the cooking game is dull, mindless stuff. The issue is this one part at the end, where people have to take the cake out of the oven after a specific amount of time. The time given is 30 seconds, but it's actually calculated in frames, and the game runs at 30 frames per second. While the ballad window for this is quite large, I and many other people could never get the timing down without getting a stopwatch, and having to fetch one just for this segment was incredibly annoying. Every single time you fail, Gourmet Guy will spit out the cake and insult you for how disgusting your cake is, saying it's the worst thing on the face of the earth, and tell Peach to get back in the kitchen like the ridiculously pretentious food critic that he is. You baked it for one second too long? You don't deserve to breathe the same air that Gourmet Guy is breathing. Now what's really obnoxious about this is Gourmet Guy does not tell you if you overcooked it or undercooked it. He just says that you cooked it for the incorrect amount of time, which does little to nothing to help you and will lead to many more failed attempts. It's also not clear when the timer starts as it gets slid into the oven and the oven baking noise starts. If you thought this was bad playing this on the N64 as a kid, it only gets worse if you try to emulate this game, which can mess with the frame rate. I'm not just talking about emulating the game on a PC. Playing this on virtual console like the Wii or Switch also greatly can mess up the timing on this minigame and lead to endless frustration, as well as on some modern TVs. Every time you go back, you'll have to do the rest of the pointless minigame again. Every time you feed the cake to Gourmet Guy and get it wrong, he'll say how he's absurdly famished and starving to death, only to say your cake is the worst thing ever made. The quiz Peach has to take with ridiculously easy answers to guess doesn't force you to win to progress. Why can't Gourmet Guy just give up on you and let you pass after you burn the cake enough times? It would be funny if there was another dialogue tree where he just told you what you wanted to know under the condition you don't feed him any more horrible cakes. A character without a boss fight would normally just get a zero for that. I'm giving Gourmet Guy a negative one for how much I utterly despise his gameplay-related challenge to get past him. Other than that, he's a fine enough character, and the horrible gameplay can make his character unintentionally hilarious as it makes him out to be some kind of ridiculously picky food critic. Gourmet Guy technically does have his own theme for when you successfully feed him what he wants and he comically runs about the screen, but it's a very brief little song so it doesn't help him all that much out on the music screen. It's awkward to rank his threat level, but when he has no boss fight, it has to be a low score for that as well. If you did fight him, this guy could definitely graduate from this lower place on the tier list. Nastasia is Count Black's secretary, who's usually seen to the side, and she starts off the game as a surprisingly intimidating and oppressive character. She can't fight directly, but she can brainwash people with seemingly no effort just by looking at them. At the start of the game, Nastasia and her boss, Count Black, try to force Bowser and Peach into getting married. This unnatural, unholy union is supposed to cause some kind of rip in the space-time continuum that generates the plot artifact that Count Black needs to complete his plans. Black is the main one actually instigating the wedding, and Bowser and Peach eventually awaken from it in a groggy state, not sure where they are. Once they come to their senses, Bowser 100% approves of what's happening and tells them to keep going, much like in Super Mario Odyssey, but Peach obviously refuses. It's Nastasia who actually forces Peach to do it, even when she is clearly going out of her way to resist it. 
Without Nastasia, Count Black's plot would fall flat on its face right here in the intro. Nastasia goes on to have another intimidating scene where she brainwashes Luigi and Bowser's minions against each other. She's built up as this very intimidating character as the game presents the minions in such a way that you feel very sympathetic for them before their free will is drained from them. Luigi is much the same, and he's a mainline Mario character getting brainwashed here, not just a couple Goombas. While it may not be totally clear whether Nastasia or Dementio are in control of Luigi at first, it was in fact Nastasia that was responsible for bringing Luigi to the Count's side, with Dementio only taking advantage of Luigi later on in the plot. Nastasia is the one who outright introduces Luigi as Mr. L to the rest of the group, saying that this is a new minion orientation for him. Part of Nastasia's character is that she's incredibly casual about everything. She passively aggressively says, Okay after ordering people to become her mind slaves, like it's just some minor, unimportant event. About drugs and alcohol and why they're bad, okay? In its own weird way, her incredibly uncaring nature about the horrible things she's doing makes her all the more intimidating. She treats the enslavement like she's hiring expendable employees in the business, and with her secretary persona, she's just managing them to make better use of their time. After these scenes, Nastasia's role diminishes as she's just seen in the antagonist meetings between each chapter. At first, she gets to punish O-Chunks by forcing him to write a report on his failure, but that's one of the last decent scenes she gets. After having been built up as a very intimidating and unrepentantly evil character, her character takes a turn towards going... good? At this point, she's always just seen trying to tell Count Black to stop his plan and not to destroy the world, and Count Black always just refuses her requests. Black eventually tells Nastasia that if she doesn't like what he's doing, that she can leave, but Nastasia says that she is loyal to the Count and will always stay by his side. It's made more and more clear throughout these scenes that she's entirely staying with Count Black because she has a crush on him. That'd already be weird by itself, but what made me outright hate this element of Nastasia's character is the fact that Count Black is obsessed with another girl. His love for this other woman is the entirety of his character motivation. Nastasia eventually becomes aware of this as time goes on, but doesn't change her fanatical loyalty to him as the Count continues to ignore her. She even goes to take an attack for him, throwing her frail body in the way of a projectile, only to barely be acknowledged by the Count at all. Once Nastasia's character turns from being villain to side character, it shouldn't be all that surprising that she never gets a boss fight. As such, her design stays as the generic secretary with a simple minimalistic design. If she fought, I assume she'd get some kind of monster transformation like Mimi has. If they just kept with her character from earlier on the game, she was already on track to be a decent villain similar to Mimi. But once her character went off the rails, there wasn't a lot to take from it. As far as music, I can't really identify any theme in the game as being specifically hers rather than Count Black's. And combined with no boss fight, Fight, her score definitely suffers a lot for it. Morton's boss fight is just as dull as the other Koopalings. His gimmick is he sets his hammer on fire, and you have to put it out with a fire extinguisher card or you're gonna lose. So fascinating. It's supposed to be easy because it's the first major boss with an obvious solution in this particular title, but there's not much more to it. Before he sets his hammer ablaze, Morton sits up on a platform that you have to destroy to get to him, which is the closest thing to real gameplay in this fight. Roy definitely has a better boss battle, but that's not why Morton places high. Morton is the highest placed Koopaling because of the fact that he has something resembling characterization, and this is honestly what I've always wanted from him. He's a caveman who talks in the very simple corruption of words. When he goes to bring out his platform, he calls it a PEDAL STOOL. It's hilariously pathetic that his brilliant plan is to simply stand at an elevation slightly off the ground and hide in its shell to make himself impervious to attack. And it feels really in character for him. He also makes a pun on his name, saying it means MORE TONS that he's going to bash into your brain senselessly. This was the game that finally gave Morton this characterization that I wanted from him ever since he was created. It just seemed so obvious to me that Morton was the truly dumb muscle of the Koopalings, while Roy was more complicated, being a bully and all. I never liked Morton's characterization in that old cartoon where his character was that he would never shut up and say things in overly long, drawn-out sentences. Just from looking at Morton's boss battles over the years where he uses brute strength for all of his problems, along with how monstrous he looks, 
This characterization he has here in Color Splash just felt like the obvious way to go. Just listen to his voice clips that he's been using ever since Super Mario Bros. Wii and tell me this character isn't supposed to be portrayed as stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Bowser Jr.'s journey would later go on to take the characterization from Color Splash, making it official that Morton's a caveman now, and I couldn't be happier about it. Before this game, the only real title Morton appeared in where he spoke was Paper Jam. In that game, Morton still does use brute strength, but he talks in full sentences and has no real characterization to speak of. He's a bad guy who happens to be strong, that's it. I'm glad that Blander strongman personality wasn't what they stuck with, and that they finally built onto his very limited character a little bit. Morton's characterization is the only real contribution to the Mario canon Color Splash made, and it was one that was actually positive for once. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Lemmy's circus persona has made it out of Color Splash, and he's largely just generic in Bowser Jr.'s journey. He's just the small Koopaling while Morton was just the generic big Koopaling. Morton scores much higher than the average Tanabe trilogy character for having characterization and comedy scores, something that's a rarity for characters from those games. His story involvement is still non-existent and his boss fight is still terrible due to Color Splash's mechanics, but that's not exactly something that's unique to Morton specifically. This is an optional Thousand Year Door boss, which many people will miss on their first playthrough. You release a chest filled with 200 boos into the overworld, and they play a guessing game with you to determine how many boos were in the chest if you can guess correctly. After that, they swarm all over Duplice's castle, and passively aggressively demand you, Don't be mean to us! as they swarm around you. If you stick around, they will stop you from moving unless you hammer them away. And if you hammer them three times, the leader will say, How dare you? You said you would be nice. Never mind that they were the ones coming to crowd around Mario in the first place. That's not important. It's like they were trying to just cause something to get offended about because they were bored. I guess being locked in a tiny chest with 199 other ghosts is a good excuse to become crazy, even though I'm not sure why they couldn't just phase through the chest considering they're ghosts, but whatever. The 200 boos manage to combine into a giant singular boo called Atomic Boo. This thing honestly has more attack animations than a significant amount of more prominent bosses in Thousand Year Door. He's way harder than Duplis with many any more attacks, despite him apparently being a minion of Duplis, and he shares the exact same amount of HP as his boss. He oftentimes enters this phase where he covers his face up like moves traditionally do in Mario games. This is essentially a free turn where he's charging up an attack, and with his rather low HP total, he generally dies pretty quickly. His other attacks include crushing Mario, not sure how that works when he's a ghost, but I guess he has weight, doing a terrifying roar sending out several of his boos to do a roar, or just sending the boos as projectiles to attack you directly for a powerful multi-hit attack, which is his most dangerous move. I really like these animations where the boos separate from and rejoin Atomic Boo all in one attack. They are the main memorable thing about the character. The terrifying roars aren't just called that for nothing as they have a chance to stun a character with a fear status effect for two turns, or make them dizzy. This is a strong effect, but if it happens to a partner, Mario can just swap them out to another partner who isn't afflicted. And this stun is very necessary given how often the booze will waste a turn hiding his face, and how frail he is in general. Another gimmick is that the audience is full of booze. Yes, some other villains like Crump and Gratis have the audience filled up with their minions, but boos have a gameplay effect where they can randomly go through Mario or Atomic Boo to give them intangibility, making them invulnerable for two turns. It is dumb how random it is and can potentially make the fight even easier, but if it goes to Atomic Boo, he may have a slim chance of pulling out a desperation win in this otherwise very easy game. If the boss just had a bit more HP, we could see his gimmicks more, but as is, he will often die before showing off his many attacks. The idea seems to be they didn't want to make him that much harder than Duplis. But that's Duplis's problem, as his boss is pitifully easy. There was a cut dark atomic boo that might have been able to let the assets for this boss see some use more, but unfortunately we didn't get that. Atomic Boo returns in Super Paper Mario without any of his gimmicks as an obscenely easily defeated enemy, 
despite being a so-called mini-boss. I guess they just wanted to reuse his sprite. Big Boos made up of several smaller Boos is apparently a recurring theme in this series, most notably with Boo Lossus from Luigi's Mansion. This is very good by random boss standards, but that's unfortunately all it is, a random boss. It doesn't have its own theme, and on the standards of this list it's a significantly worse version of Huff and Puff. Atomic Boo is pretty much being carried entirely by his boss fight score, as everything else about him is really generic and forgettable. Its design at least is interesting and is put to good use in his boss fight. Big Lantern Ghost is a fairly memorable opponent from Paper Mario, even if he only shows up right before his fight to get killed. Watt is arguably the partner the most out of left field in Paper Mario and she is being held hostage inside of this big ghost's lantern. Watt powers all of his light-based attacks inside the lantern, which makes this kind of an indirect fight against a partner. It's way more memorable than Lacka Lester's direct fight against the player anyway, that one was just pathetic. The ghost's attacks are very simplistic, with him either using his weight to attack or shining the lantern. The gimmick of the fight is that the ghost can't be attacked in the dark, and the player has to hit the lantern multiple times to light the place up enough for him to be hit. Unlike other fights, damage dealt to the lantern doesn't matter, just hits, requiring players to improvise more than they would in some other fights where everything has a pitifully low amount of HP. As the fight goes on, the ghost will blow the lantern out to put things back into darkness, requiring lots of hits throughout the fight to brighten things up. Bao is the obvious partner to use for this with her multi-hit slaps, but if the player doesn't use her, this fight can be a lot harder. Once the player gets Watt, her gimmick is to light up dark places. In a small handful of fights, her gimmick is also used in that the player can't attack unless she's present. It's a lot more dull than how it works against Big Lantern Ghost, because it's just based on whether or not Watt is present in the battle for if enemies in the dark can be attacked or not. The boss fight sticks out as the one time this is used in an interesting fashion. His attacks don't hit that hard, though his light shining attack can hit Mario's partner to disable them. Cranking the numbers up a bit in pro mode, this guy can be a slightly challenging fight. He's fought directly before General Guy, and considering how easy that guy is, I'd say he's the harder of the two. His spooky nature gets him a few points in characterization and threat level, considering he's imprisoning a party member and using them to attack you. His fight is still a bit too simple, even if it's a nice gimmick. The real thing that hurts him on the chart here is using the generic boss theme. Crystal King is yet another character we have to judge entirely by his boss fight, as despite the fact that he's the boss of the second to last chapter of the game, he has no story involvement otherwise. He's a more legitimately sinister version of what Tutan Koopa was going for, as he's some kind of ghost with nothing but his kingly robes, his crystal crown, and his eyes. He has a nice variety of attacks, as you'd expect for how late into the game he's fought. He starts by summoning crystal shards which float in the air, then inhales and spits them out at Mario. The issue with this attack is summoning the crystal bits takes up an entire turn and they each only have one HP and are easily destroyed. If the crystal bits aren't around the turn after the king summoned them, then that turn was completely wasted. I know it wouldn't make much difference if they had four or five HP, as all the decent group attacks can do that much, but this is the boss of chapter seven, so they really shouldn't make them quite that pathetic. A similar attack he has is to make magic duplicates of himself. And if the player uses single target attacks, it's possible they can attack a fake version of the king and lose their turn. However, this problem is once again solved by using group attacks. Any group attack will do, even one that does zero damage. Eventually, he will start using this attack in the air so that the grounded group attacks can't hit him, but all that really eliminates is Cooper's shell attacks and hammer earthquake attacks, while there's still more than enough options to hit the ball in the air at once. Considering that the crystal bits are already floating in the air, that doesn't really make things any more complicated. You're just doing what you've already done throughout the fight. Just spam group attacks that hit the air. It's not complicated. His most useful attack is generically healing himself of 20 HP by waving his arm. He can only do it twice. And at the least, 20 HP is enough that it will generally be a net gain of HP for him regardless of what the player does. 
The only threatening move in the Crystal King's arsenal is his ability to freeze people to stun them with his freeze ray. This can let him potentially summon his crystal bits or duplicates without instantly getting interrupted, let him actually fire those attacks off. The crystal bits are technically his most powerful attack if he's allowed to fire it, but if you get the action command for it perfectly, it does less than his attack where he has the duplicates out and he summons an ice breath blizzard. The main relevant thing that you need to know is he will only apply the freeze status effect if you miss the action command on his freeze ray, and without his ability to do that, he's a joke. Even if he manages to stun you, it's only for two turns, so he can't both prepare and immediately use his stronger attacks at the same time. It just forces the player to make slightly harder choices. His pro mode fight doesn't complicate the fight much beyond making it harder by having him attack more often and giving him the ice breath attack with the ability to hurt your partner. The Master Quest version has ridiculously difficult numbers where he'll heal himself of 99 HP twice rather than healing 20 HP and he will gain multiple turns throughout the fight to make up his own stun. If he does freeze Mario or the partner here, he basically just wins with the amount of turns he'll get, especially considering that he can reapply the status effect while they're already frozen. The developers of this hack intentionally mess with the timing of this attack to make it variable and harder to block. While Crystal King's abilities are relatively cool, he's just a bog-standard magician with an ice theme, basically, whereas other characters implement their abilities more directly into their designs and characterizations. Despite his unique design, his character is pretty much non-existent. It looks kind of intimidating, but when his extremely minimal dialogue has him talking about Bowser so much, it's hard to take him as seriously as he wants to be. Ironically, this one pathetic dialogue box as he's defeated saves him from being below Big Lantern Ghost and Atomic Boo, giving him a 2 in comedy up from 0. He comes across as otherwise pretty serious compared to a lot of the other bosses, it's weird he dies in such a mimetic fashion. Oh Chunks is the epitome of the dumb muscle character archetype. It's not just his actions of being stupid and wanting to fight everyone with brute force. Many characters directly call him out on being dumb muscle. Even Oh Chunks himself refers to himself in this way, outright calling himself stupid on several occasions. Even his design emphasizes how stupid he is. He's cross-eyed and his teeth don't properly line up with his mouth when he talks. As with most stupid characters, O-Chunks is comic relief. That's fine, there are plenty of other stupid characters within the series who are funny, and O-Chunks can be funny sometimes too, like how he mistakenly refers to Mario as Maria, but I feel they really go too far with how stupid and pathetic they make him. The tipping point is the fact that O-Chunks farts. That's just too much for me and subtracts points from his comedy score for being unfunny. Farting is his primary method of travel as he propels himself through the air. He doesn't use it to attack for most of the game, but in his last boss fight he will directly use the fart as an attack to fly up and then slam down on top of his targets. No other character in Paper Mario farts. O-Chunks exclusively gets this tier of so-called humor to himself. O-Chunks is regularly taken advantage of by other characters in humorous situations, but I would say these moments glorify the characters who are tormenting him, while O-Chunks himself is the butt of the joke. And that way, I'd say O-Chunks is a good character for serving a strong narrative purpose, but I can't credit these humorous moments to O-Chunks rather than the other characters exploiting his stupidity. After O-Chunks fails to defeat the heroes, Nastasia demands that O-Chunks writes a 1,000 page report on his failure before he can go out again. O-Chunks apparently goes about to actually start writing this report off camera and has somehow got close to finishing it, which is pretty surprising. He's so stupid that I can't picture him doing much other than writing, I am sorry, a million times. Hilariously, the Super Mario Wiki has a typo here where they claim the report is only 1,000 words long instead of 1,000 pages. For perspective on how big of a difference that is, this entire video script is only 72 pages, while the word count is over 61,000 words. I doubt O-Chunks could write even 1,000 words given he's so stupid, but 1,000 pages would be outright impossible. The defining moment for O-Chunks' character for me comes from his second fight, where after his defeat, he wants to die honorably, and fully expects the protagonist to finish him off, accepting his fate. While Dementio shows up to save him, 
Oh, Trunks is trying to shoo him away so that he can die in privacy. Dementio offers to give a power-up to O-Chunks with a Floro Sprout, which will suck out his free will but make him stronger. He talks about it in vague terms so that the player doesn't realize what's going to happen, but the implication is that Dementio and O-Chunks have talked about this before. O-Chunks still refuses, and that's fair enough, considering that being a mindless slave isn't really any better than dying. O-Chunks only agrees when Dementio blatantly lies and tells him that it's for Count Black. O-Chunks is so fanatically loyal to Count Black that he is willing to brainwash himself for him. O-Chunks says that he will be all brawn and no brains from now on, showing he is clearly 100% aware of what he is going to do to himself. After O-Chunks stupidly agrees to this deal with the devil, he goes to fart off and escape. Dementio didn't do anything to help him escape, so O-Chunks could have just done that at any time to do so, rather than voluntarily staying there to die an honorable death. He's so stupid I could see him not realize that he could get away, but I could also see him just want that honorable death for the sake of it. Either way, it's dumb, considering the fact that when O-Chunks loses yet again in his rematch to Bowser later, he again tells Bowser to finish him off and accepts his death, that seems to be the clear, definitive answer. O-Chunks just seems to actively be seeking death for some reason. Bowser, of course, is more than happy to give it to him and says it is a great honor to be defeated by him, with the only reason it doesn't happen being an outside interruption. Dementio and O-Chunks return later after Dementio has applied his floral sprout onto O-Chunks to melt his brain. Dementio insults O-Chunks even more now that he can't talk back. He says that O-Chunks' attacks patterns are so simple that a child could avoid them. Looking at his boss battles, I 100% agree with Dementio. The line is hysterical to me, but it glorifies Dementio, definitely not O-Chunks. Dementio calls the new and improved version of the thug, O-Cabbage, which is impressively stupid and lame even by the standards of this character. O-Cabbage only speaks by saying the name of random vegetables. It's hard to get much more lame than that. O-Chunks does free himself of the mind control after this, but doesn't do much of anything noteworthy for the rest of the game. He tries to present himself as a rival to Bowser, while Mimi is a rival to Peach and Dementio is a rival to Luigi. Those other two are some of the best villains in the series, so O-Chunks comes across as a very, very weak link in an otherwise amazing trio. O-Chunks' backstory is explained by a random bartender. The bartender says that O-Chunks was originally a general of an army, but his stupidity resulted than him getting all of his troops killed with him as the only survivor. Being a general isn't about being the strongest. It requires strategic knowledge and skill, which O-Chunks clearly does not have. The reason why he apparently lost is because he was stupid enough to trust someone who betrayed him, much like how Dementio did to him on screen. After his failure, he is then taken advantage of by yet another character, with Count Black manipulating him by guilt-tripping him into becoming his servant. Whatever Black did, it worked, as O-Chunks is fanatically loyal to the Count for whatever reason. Considering how weak-willed he is, this is hardly necessary, since Nastasia or Dementio could just brainwash him instantly. O-Chunks' boss fights are trivial to get past and are terrible, like a lot of Super Paper Mario bosses, but he does have a pretty big amount of character in them. If he grabs a character and throws them successfully, there's a long animation where they bounce around the screen, and he does one of several different poses to show off. If he fights Peach, he's more merciful because he doesn't like hitting girls, which is intended as a characterization bit. The differences are so subtle that you never notice it while playing the game ordinarily, though, and it largely remains as an easter egg. All it does is make an already pitifully easy boss even easier. Overall, I'd say O-Chunks is unenjoyably pathetic with just how much of a loser he can be. The only reason he's not lower is because his character does serve a very specific purpose that cannot be replaced, as his existence glorifies a lot of other characters who use him as a punching bag. Every single character in his faction clowns on him, as well as Bowser. Anti-Guy may not appear threatening to the untrained eye, considering he's just a recolored Shy Guy. His attacks aren't any different from a regular Shy Guy either, but his numbers are ridiculous for the point in the game that he's fought. He is far, far harder than the boss of the chapter he's from, and it's not even close. 
Unlike other optional bosses, this guy is hard enough that there is a legitimate reward for defeating him, with the Power Plus badge being somewhat useful even if it's very expensive to equip. The anti-guy is just guarding a treasure chest, and circles around it to block Mario from getting to it. It's so tempting that new players will always try to grab the chest out from under his nose, and I like that aspect. It's practically like you can TASTE the reward in that chest and it encourages players to try to fight the boss. It's technically possible with a lot of glitched movement to open it without fighting him, although regular players definitely aren't going to be able to do that. Regardless, it shows just how badly people wanted to open it up that they even found this exploit in the first place. Anti-Guy may just be a random guy guarding a chest, but his dialogue is hysterical. On a technical level, it's pretty simple as he just warns you to stay away but you can get a very strong sense as to his mannerisms based on the text. His text goes all wavy and moves about, and he has hearts in his dialogue despite his sinister nature. It makes me picture him talking with some kind of Mickey Mouse voice. When you agree to fight him, he gives you the opportunity to back out of it, showing you that he isn't to be taken lightly. Should you back out, he'll say, Good, you're a smart boy! Which always cracks me up. He also has some extra dialogue if you come to him with a lemon candy which he will trade for the badge. If you actually give it to him, he'll go over to the side and start munching on it. That animation is supposed to be used for Wimpy Shy Guy's crying, but repurposing it for anti-guy eating is pretty funny to me. They didn't have to do that, they put a lot of effort into this little extra character. If you still refuse to give it to him, he gets even more angry and calls you a stingy, candy-hogging punk. As I said before, the fight is just a regular Shy Guy with super buff stats. But he doesn't just instantly crumple the status effects super easily like Kent C. Koopa does. He prompts the player to come up with some more creative strategies if they want to kill him early and not backtrack to fight him later, or do the obscure lemon candy trick. Hacks love to have a lot of fun with this guy, giving him more shy guy minions in pro mode, or even an outright anti-guy recolor squad in Master Quest. Anti-guy does appear later in the game, but I'll be getting to that in another entry. I would rank him much higher if he was more unique considering he's a recolor in both appearance and functionality, and he has no music. Still, a lot of people have grown to like this generic Shy Guy recolor. And as far as recolors go, he's really cool. Most prominently, he's the avatar of Strider7X, that guy who made a video about hitting a block for 400 years in Paper Mario. His generic appearance also makes him popular to hack into other games where he wasn't originally, sort of like how Dark Bowser shows up in so many fan projects. His appearance is so generic, in fact, there's a shy guy with his color scheme and color splash who basically looks the same as him, and he's slightly more powerful than regular shy guys. Of course, this is entirely unintentional, and Tanabe has no desire whatsoever to give us a tiny little reference by naming him anti guy. During the encounter on the overworld, he moves around at super speed and calls himself a ninja. So logically, he'd be called Ninja Guy or something if he's not going to be called Anti-Guy, right? No, no, his name is just Black Shy Guy. How inspiring. Before this segment ends, something I want to clarify. This list obviously is my subjective personal opinion for the most part, but with the scoring system, I've been trying really hard to add an element of objectivity to it. I think Anti-Guy is blatantly better than some of the characters who end up above him, but being a generic enemy with minimal assets holds him back hardcore on the ranking. I know I put him on 40th worst here, but I definitely do not think he's bad. We just haven't gotten past every character who I do think is bad on some level yet. When we get past them all, you're gonna know. Shy Guy's toy box can come across as one of the most random chapters in the game. It's a dimension inside of a toy box in a random blue house. The fact this portal is right inside of Toad Town means they attempt to invade and steal stuff from the Toads. But once you get inside, there's no real story progression, it's just a very straightforward dungeon despite the juvenile aesthetic. The Shy Guys are just a bunch of kids causing chaos. This is why General Guy is a much needed breath of fresh air for their faction as the boss. He's a military man who talks in stereotypical military army terms treating his underlings like soldiers. He's the closest thing to an adult in the room who tries to get the shy guys to do their job competently. His boss fight has him summon minions to do his dirty work for him. First a group of shy guys, then shy guys on stilts, 
and lastly, Shy Guy stacked on top of each other. My favorite bit of characterization for him that's easy to miss is if you leave a couple of Shy Guys alive from the initial group, which will cause them to flee from Mario. General Guy will say, You men make me sick! while ordering them to stand their ground before being annoyed that he has to do the job himself. This has the making of a good boss fight, as General Guy shows up personally for the second two groups of minions. But despite being there, he never fights at the same time. The fight is way too easy, considering General Guy will only personally start attacking once all his troops are dead. In pro mode, General Guy summons the various Shy Guys from throughout the chapter, of which there's no shortage, to aid him. Seriously, look at how many different types of Shy Guys there are that could have been used in this fight. They even have a Medi Guy who runs around in a a clown car and heals people. It just seems like such an obvious thing to be in this boss fight that I'm kind of baffled they didn't include it, or at least have General Guy attack alongside the stilt guys and shy stacks. The minions he does use don't have any gimmicks to how they function mechanically, it's all just for theatrics. But it is finally General Guy's turn to fight. He has a pathetic 30 HP and two attacks. The first one is him throwing a bomb for a simple weak attack, while he occasionally uses the bulb on his toy tank to electrify Mario and his partner for his only remotely threatening attack. The bulb is easily destroyed, considering it only has a meager 8 HP, and after that, General Guy is a glorified generic enemy with nothing but his bomb attack in his arsenal. It's really pathetic and sad. When he's defeated, General Guy goes to run with the rest of his men, screaming like a girl and flailing his arms in a cowardly fashion, just like the rest of them. His so-called tank also looks like some kind of glorified baby carriage, so it's clear he's not exactly as mature as he lets on. General Guy never shows up before his fight, nor is his existence even alluded to. He's pretty insignificant for a chapter boss. It would have been entertaining to see him try to set traps for Mario throughout the level instead of Kami Koopa doing it for some reason. As is, I don't think they went as far with this characterization as they should have with him hating his minions, and his boss fight is seriously lacking. It had the potential to be great, but as is, it's mostly just a set piece. You wouldn't think a generic pair of scissors could get this high, but here we are. The Scissors has arguably the most build-up of any of the Legion of Stationary members, having cut out a bunch of creepy paper dolls before you fight it that give off a horror movie vibe. He's also created two mini-bosses before himself. The first one is a paper hand somewhat reminiscent of the Shadow Queen's hands, but that thing doesn't talk and was created by the Scissors, so it doesn't really deserve its own ranking slot. Still, it helps to hype up the boss of the area a bit. While a lot of the Origami King bosses torture people, Scissors probably does so in the most brutal way. He puts everyone's faces on top of each other while connected to a giant buzzy beetle. And unlike with Hole Punch, all of these victims are 100% sentient during all of this, and are grossed out about the fact they're all touching ten other people at a time. And some kind of giant paper abomination is really morbid by Paper Mario standards. The Buzzy Beetle is even able to tap into Kamek's power since it has his paper corpse tacked onto him, and the first phase of the boss involves ripping Kamek off of it. Once it's finally defeated, Scissors finally fights directly. Scissors is definitely the most intimidating of the group, and not just because of what comes before him. Despite being the most evil stationary member, he has an overconfident anime villain personality and intentionally handicaps himself by putting a cover over his blades. He says that if Mario takes them off, he'll take it as a challenge and fight at full capacity. Of course, the cover will eventually come off if you want to defeat him, at which point if he hits you with his blades directly, it's a one-hit kill as there is an overdramatic cut to make it look like Mario truly got cut in half. They are doing their best to emphasize the meme of Mario being paper here, by just going out of their way to show how powerful the scissors are. If Mario jumps into the scissor blades like an idiot, He'll also get himself immediately killed by the scissors, which is pretty funny. Is it all that hard to avoid the scissors? No, but the constant threat of a one-hit kill makes the boss fight in this otherwise simple style feel more challenging and threatening than it really is. Which, if nothing else, makes scissors significantly more memorable than the other Tanabe trilogy villains. I'm still giving Scissors the usual zero for character design, though I will say that if any of the stationary members justify being an inanimate object for their character theming, it's him. Even so, he could just be a real character design who simply uses the Scissors as an attack or has it as part of his character design, like characters who aren't under strict restrictions. 
The main reason he sticks out is all of the great stuff before him. His characterization is also a fair bit less stereotypical than the other Legion of Stationary members, coming across more memorable in how evil and overconfident he is. Shadow Queen is a very awkward character to talk about, as she's the final boss of the most story-driven Mario RPG, but only appears at the very end. Beldam is the main antagonist who enables her revival, along with several other villains who help contribute to her return, such as Duplis and the x -Nots. Given those characters are all extremely memorable and better villains than she is, Shadow Queen really has her work cut out for her with the very limited screen time she has. I will say her intro is definitely a strong start to her character and is probably the most memorable thing about her. Gratis attempts to control the Shadow Queen based on lies told to him by Beldam, and the Queen just effortlessly executes him for having the insolence to suggest that he could try to control her. The only mercy she grants him is a quick death. Beldam shows up, and she correctly identifies her subordinate as the one truly responsible for bringing her back, and congratulates her on a job well done. Mario shows up inside the room next, and the Queen offers to spare him if he pledges his undying loyalty to her and serves her as her slave. What's memorable about this is that there is an actual choice in the dialogue options here, where you can say yes to agree to serve her. After several confirmations, you can finally say yes for real at which point you get a brief bit of text saying Mario served the Shadow Queen, and you get a game over screen. There's no other non-standard game over anywhere else in the game, and it's definitely put to good, memorable effect here. That's about the end of my extent for praise for the Queen goes, though. Her personality beyond this is non-existent as a generic ancient evil, and she's essentially defeated by the power of love as everyone sends their good wishes to Mario to remove the Queen's unstoppable barrier. Her boss fight itself is, yes, one of the hardest in the game given she's the final boss, but it's not a terribly memorable fight. Her primary gimmick is utilizing hands, lots and lots of hands. You could argue she's something of a tiki tong headed hands boss, as her primary form during the fight doesn't have her torso be visible, just her head, hands, and a spiral vortex containing Peach. Speaking of Peach, the possessed Peach form seems to be the primary reason as to why this character has some fans. Having a core Mario character that is not Bowser get possessed for once is an interesting idea for a final boss, but unfortunately they did not do a lot with it. The phase where she fights as Peach is very short-lived and easy, before she goes into her head and hands and dross form. I'm not gonna stop people from liking Evil Peach if that's the aesthetic they're into, but me, personally, that's blatantly not what I think of when I think of the Shadow Queen. I think of the large, shadowy monster. This is how Shadow Queen looked 1,000 years ago, and is clearly her preferred form. Peach is basically just a battery she needs to live. Shadow Queen's design is made out of weird papercraft origami to try to make it seem more otherworldly and out of place, but I don't think it pulls off the effect very well. The ridiculously large crown in particular just looks silly, along with her really long strands of hair. She is clearly supposed to be the same race as the Shadow Sirens, and her being some kind of weird 3D monster version of them comes across strange to me. Both the Queen and Beldam are apparently a thousand years old, so why do they look so different from each other despite being the same kind of shadowy demon race? It's not conjecture from me to call her a demon, by the way. There is some obscure NPC called Grifty who tells lore about ancient times 1,000 years ago, and he constantly refers to the Shadow Queen as a demon. There was potential for some exciting lore reveals in here to expand the Queen's character. But honestly, not much of it was that interesting for me, with the most interesting bit just being about the four heroes who sealed her and became the spirits locked in the black chest throughout the game. We also learned that the old city she destroyed a thousand years ago are the present-day sewers, which is why the thousand-year door into her palace is located there. Aside from the Shadow Queen's design, I think the other big issue with her that makes her feel way too generic is her lack of a name. Her minions, the Shadow Sirens, all have names that are way bigger characters individually than she is. So why doesn't she have one? You're going to tell me this all-powerful demon who's defeated the city wasn't egotistical enough to have her name be feared throughout history? Aside from how generic she feels, the Queen just hasn't accomplished any of the work or done anything that villainous on camera. She's generically strong and uses her strength, but Beldam worked tirelessly to get her everything she needs to succeed. Even for one of the Queen's only good moments, killing Gratis, I can't really give that much to the Queen herself. 
Beldam manipulated Broadus for literally the entire game to lead up to this point, and probably would have just killed him herself if the Queen hadn't done it for her. With more screen time or making her less generic, I'm sure Shadow Queen could have improved. But all I really take out of the finale is the glorification of Beldam. With how it's written as is, Shadow Queen's presence was so brief that it feels like she could have been written out as a character and just been a tool used by Beldam, as opposed to her resurrecting her boss. The Queen would have to kill Beldam or something to really stick out as her own independent character, but that would have really rubbed me the wrong way here, with her hijacking the plot even more from the current villain. Shadow Queen doesn't really excel in any category besides threat level, given she's a generic doomsday villain and all. Even then, though, the fact her barrier is destroyed by the power of love means she doesn't get a perfect 10 there, either. Besides that, she has average scores, being hurt the most by her design and lack of comedy. A serious villain played straight can obviously appeal to me, but Shadow Queen really doesn't have much screen time to do anything, unfortunately. And just for the cherry on top, you get a guaranteed shine sprite bingo once the real battle begins and you're past all of the cutscene stuff. This battle has really, really long cutscenes, and most of it's just set up for the actual gameplay part of the boss battle. You might think that the first part where she's in the humanoid form might be set up so that uh, she can soften you up for her later phase and all before she becomes vulnerable to actually being defeated. But no, that's just really a waste of time because you have a guaranteed shine sprite bingo. The game doesn't tell you this, but if you know, it's, it's pretty easy to just abuse all your stuff because you're gonna get healed anyway, and it just kind of adds more pointless time to the fight. Like, the fight is still hard, she has a good variety of moves, so I'm still gonna give her a decent boss battle score, but that does definitely hurt it at least a little bit with just a good three minutes or so of fight time that just doesn't matter. Kami is the only original character from the original trilogy who has a large role in more than a single game, serving as Bowser's right hand in both Paper Mario and in Thousand Year Door. It's not 100% clear why she exists when she is made to blatantly replace Kamek, Bowser's right hand from the main series who comes back to replace Kami during the Tanabe trilogy, but of course, the go-to reason is just because of Kamek's awkward generic enemy status in Japan. This is one of the main reasons Kamek is often downplayed in the series in general despite being so prominent in the main series. Hey. If it means we don't get any more stupid plot holes, like with Tanabe's interpretations of Kamek, I'm all for just replacing the character outright. Whether or not you like this change, Kami is at least visually distinct from ordinary Magikoopas, and clearly appears more elderly. Kamek is apparently very old considering he looks exactly the same in modern day as he did when Mario and Bowser were babies, so it definitely makes sense for a more unique version of him to be elderly. Bowser often refers to Kami as a hag, so she's definitely old, it's not just her design. There's also a Magikoopa boss in Super Mario Galaxy called Camilla, who is a female Magikoopa who wears purple. It would have been really nice if that could have just been Kami and bring her into the main series, but it sadly wasn't meant to be, and it remains just as a small reference. The Mario Galaxy team hates using characters which they didn't personally make after all, considering they're the people who made Jungle Beat, which had no DK characters in it other than DK. So I'm not exactly surprised they refused to use Kami Koopa for that role. Kami's role within the first game is more simple simplistic, rarely being seen anywhere but at her boss's side, having the main purpose of giving Bowser someone to talk to other than faceless minions. She hates Peach and is the main person in charge of making sure she stays locked up in her room during the segments where you play as Peach, which serve as the majority of the screen time for her and Bowser. Considering she can fly, though... She does actually come down to the ground floor at the start of the game to try to impede Mario's progress by dumping a large yellow block in the way for the tutorial. Why Mario can't just climb over the fence is a mystery, but it's a gameplay mechanic, just roll with it. She almost never leaves Bowser's castle again after that, only coming down briefly for Shy Guy's toy box, which is kind of an unfortunate missed opportunity for her just staying at Bowser's side and giving reports on Mario's activity, and occasionally catching Peach when she tries to escape the castle and the guards are too incompetent to do their jobs. Kami gets a fight at the very end of the game, but it's a gimmick on losable cutscene fight where you play as Peach in a baby star spirit. Kami looks pretty pathetic here by losing to them, 
and just constantly use the same generic yellow block attack from the intro over and over and wonder why she fails. If she can so casually make yellow blocks out of nothing, you'd think she'd have dumped way more of the things down in Mario's path to impede his progress like at the start. She can fly, it's not like Mario can hit her up there, she'd be completely safe. In the second game, she takes on a more comedic tone since Bowser's in a comic relief role rather than the main villain. But this is definitely her more memorable game, as she has some humorous arguments with her boss. Despite this shift in tone, she somehow comes across as way more serious than Thousand Year Door, actually getting to fight alongside Bowser in gameplay for what's one of the hardest bosses in the game. In the cutscenes, she works tirelessly to enforce Bowser's will, and it definitely shows in her boss fight. She has way more attacks than in the original, having several buffing spells and most importantly, healing spells. She almost always prefers to buff and heal Bowser rather than herself, despite the fact he's obviously much, much more durable than she is. The fight is basically over when Kami dies, since Bowser doesn't gain any new attacks when Kami keels over, so it definitely comes across as comedic that Kami keeps doting over Bowser with her magic like she's his mother or something. This is supposed to be the relationship that Kamek and Bowser have had, since Kamek has literally been around with Bowser since he was a baby. We don't know what Paper Bowser in the original trilogy was doing back then, so it's possible Kami took his place in this continuity. Unless you consider the Tsunabe trilogy, where Kamek exists as canon to the original trilogy. Kami will only start healing herself when she's within a single attack of dying, and it's hilarious to see her constantly try to heal Bowser, like he's some kind of giant spoiled child. This is still one of the hardest fights in the otherwise easy game that is Thousand Year Door, so imagining to get some strong characterization for Kami during it goes a long way in making her a more memorable character for me. Kami is mostly a comedic supportive character, so that's where her score comes from. Her main purpose is just a character for Bowser to talk to, so she can only go so far. I mostly just find it really funny how her AI behaves in the boss battle at the end of Thousand Year Door. If it was based on Paper Mario, she'd probably get a zero or even a negative one for boss battles. She does have a theme in the first game, but it's really generic and forgettable, so she doesn't get much for music score either, unfortunately. This is probably the character I have the hottest take on for this list, so I'll just preface this section with the fact that I don't like sympathetic villains in general. So I was never personally going to be a big fan of Count Fleck. I prefer my villains to be played straight, and Super Paper Mario very directly gives that character archetype to me with Dementio. That said, I don't think Count Fleck is a very effective sympathetic villain in the first place. Count Fleck's character motivation is that there was a woman that he loved named Tipani, but his father forbid their relationship due to their different races. Black disobeyed his father and still pursued the relationship, so his dad banished her, forcing her to wander different dimensions, and completely erased her memory so that she would not remember Black. Now, because Count Black can't marry the woman he wants, he intends to end the universe and destroy all worlds for all time. His love for Timpani was just that magical, that life without her is completely irrelevant and unimportant. If the man just wanted to off himself, that'd be more understandable. But no, he must make the entire world end because of this. Everyone must suffer and know his pain. He never mentions his father, who caused him all of his grief. The father is only brought up in backstory. He's unimportant. We don't need to get revenge against him specifically. No, the entire universe must end because this man just lost his girlfriend. He would be perfectly justified in seeking revenge against his father, but that's not even a plot point. He does destroy his homeworld where his father lives first, but, again, this is just all in the backstory and not considered an important part of his character. By the time the game starts, clearly a great deal of time has passed since Fleck was in a relationship with his girlfriend. He has several fanatically loyal minions. Ochunks is literally willing to not only die for the Count, but to give up all his free will to serve him. Mimi isn't quite such a devoted follower, but whatever prompted, she'll still say he's a great boss and she loves serving him. Most egregiously, his secretary, Nastasia, is madly in love with him and begs him to not end the world. She's even some weird blue pixel creature like he is, so it seems like a pretty reasonable opportunity for him to move on with his life. But no, he doesn't care about any of them. Nobody matters but his precious Timpani. He also outright lies to Ochunks and Mimi as he tells them that he intends to rebuild the worlds into perfect superior ones after he destroys the current ones, when in actuality he just wants everything to end. 
He's surrounded by many loyal minions who would treat him as his friends, and doesn't realize just how good he has it. It's only in the epilogue where Count Black has to finally acknowledge his reprehensible actions and tones, because Mario and Dementio directly force him to. Timpani would eventually be lifted of the curse by Merlin, but to do so he had to turn her into a butterfly creature under the name of Tippy. She goes on to be the Navi of the game, following Mario around and giving him useful hints. Apparently, before the events of the title, Black crosses paths with his beloved partner in the form of Tippy, but for how much he claims to love her, he doesn't recognize her. Once the game begins, Black again meets up with her later, and even begins to suspect that Tippy may be Timpani, but he just dismisses the notion. He knows his girlfriend so well that he does not even recognize her. Tippy slowly regains her memories over the course of the game, to the point that in the ending, she recognizes Count Black and reveals her identity to him. Even this is not enough for the Count to stop the whole destroying the universe thing, only when he's defeated in combat by Mario. He has so much to live for, but the Count is just dead set in his plan to end the world for whatever reason. He's clearly lost his sanity, I don't see what's sympathetic about this guy in any way, shape, or form. And for how much Count Black screws up and pushes away everyone he loves from him, the worst part of it is that he gets a happy ending that he very blatantly does not deserve and did not earn. He gets to live happily ever after with his beloved Timpani, who magically gets her original humanoid body back somehow. It would at least be something of a punishment for Black if she was trapped in the butterfly body forever. I would believe he actually loved her if he stayed loyal to her despite that. But no, after having rejected her so many times in the form of Tippy, he gets to have his beloved Timpani back. He's still painted as the main villain of the story for the majority of the game until it's revealed that Dementio intended to betray him the whole time as a twist villain. For how much I hate Count Black's motives, he does serve a very specific purpose in the story. The story would be way more boring if Dementio was just the generic main villain the whole time from the start, without the Count being an obstacle Dementio has to overcome. In fairness to Black, before his motives become clear, he's fine enough as a generic villain figure. The scenes where the villains interact between chapters and receive orders from Count Black are entertaining, along with the Count referring to himself in the third person. His boss fight is simplistic as he teleports around on the platforms, but it's about as much as you're gonna get from Super Paper Mario. At least he's difficult to hit, even if he's not very threatening. If nothing else can be said for Count Black, he has several amazing music tracks dedicated to him, some of the best of the series, with Champion of Destruction being the best track of the game. So if it wasn't obvious, this was the big character I was waiting to get past. Things should generally be more positive from here. Not to say I'm not going to be critical, of course. I am very critical, if you haven't noticed. I go into exhaustive detail on every single character as they come up. But generally speaking, yes, more positive. We're almost to the top 20 at this point. I should hope it starts getting positive soon. This is the only major boss from Thousand Year Door who is a generic monster who can't speak. All the rest of them are characters. As far as generic monsters go, though, this one has some pretty great execution. It also has some story relevance, as it's vaguely implied that Beldam is the one who unleashed this thing on Mario, even if we don't directly see her do it. When Beldam's lackey, Dupless, gets off the train, he says that he'll leave the rest up to Beldam as he scampers off. It's generally assumed that the bridge being out is Beldam's doing to slow Mario down while she runs ahead to the Crystal Star, intending for the smorg at the train station to finish him off. I can't find anything else to source this, but this little bit on the Paper Mario wiki here claims that originally there's going to be a more elaborate scene of Beldam summoning the smorg on camera, which would definitely make sense. Smorg appears to be dealt with fairly easily at the train station, but upon boarding the train it makes a very impressive return. The creature manages to infest itself entirely around the train, to the point it's impossible to even see outside of the windows. All of the passengers have been abducted by the beast as it tries to destroy the whole train. Mario has to wade through a sea of the things before managing to reach their primary source, where they have all collected together and go to fight Mario. First things first, this monster's design is legitimately impressive. An amorphous monster made up of hundreds to thousands of individual parasites is definitely one of the more memorable monster designs in Mario. The smorg is made up of countless individual pieces that are all rendered simultaneously, 
and gets a lot out of the game's art style. Normally, everything having googly eyes on it, like Banjo-Kazooie, would make this thing less intimidating, but the eyes here show that every piece of this thing is individually alive, as they squish and squirm, making bug-like noises, which makes this thing unsettling in a really cool way. It can transform its appendages into various forms to try to attack Mario, and it has multiple extremities to attack with, which give it multiple turns in the battle before its vulnerable core is exposed. During the fight, you can see all of the NPCs from the train taken as hostage by the smorg, trapped within its flailing body. Their location is randomized each time you fight it, as well as the order all of the sprites are drawn in, so it can emphasize some NPCs more than others depending on what the dice rolls. It helps to give it that feel of being a conglomerate parasite made up of thousands of individual organisms, rather than just a generic goop monster that so easily could have been instead. Smorgs are a bit similar to fuzzies, which are also parasitic creatures which leech Mario's life out of him, but these are significantly more sinister and intimidating by comparison to those more comedic characters. Having a horror movie monster pop out at the end of a chapter with a murder mystery in it makes this tone have a strong cinematic feel to it. Smorg is as high as you can get for being a character who can't speak. It obviously suffers for that in many categories, but at least it has a good boss fight. Tuten Koopa does his best to try to come across as some super powerful spectral pharaoh character, but in reality he's just an ordinary Koopa who was given power by Bowser and is really into Egyptian culture. His primary strategy is just to try to scare Mario away with an ominous voice throughout the dungeon, and later says he's angry that Mario didn't back down from his very scary warnings. The one point where he does look legitimately spooky is when he shows up as the pharaoh headpiece and appears to fly through the air somehow, but it's all just some kind of weird flashy magic trick. His actual appearance is pretty underwhelming as a stubby, slightly overweight Koopa in Egyptian robes. The only thing that takes him all that seriously is his music, which goes surprisingly hard with the whole mystical Egyptian pharaoh thing. The main threatening thing in the fight is the chomps that he summons, which he has a theme of summoning throughout the dungeon to attack Mario. He seems to love chomps, as one of his attacks has him summon a giant magic chomp to drop from the ceiling before causing an earthquake effect to drop pebbles on Mario. This could be his most powerful attack since it can disable Mario's partner, but there's also a chance he'll hit himself, at which point he's basically lost. Definitely not a hard fight if kind of funny. I don't know why he doesn't just drop that weird magic chomp thing on top of Mario directly, but whatever. While Tutan Koopa does have some magic at his disposal, his most commonly used attack is just generically throwing buzzy beetle shells from up on his perch. Ooh, very spooky, so magical, throwing shells. When defeated, Tutan Koopa will be chased out by one of his own chomps and then never heard from again which is a fitting end for him and emphasizes his incompetence. I just wish the game didn't take so long to get going with having more engaging boss mechanics, as while Tuten Koopa is strongly characterized within his fight, it's an absolute cakewalk and has little to nothing to engage the player. In pro mode, his gimmick is that he casts a curse on Mario at the start of the match that will kill him in 13 turns, and just plays the Magic Pharaoh thing completely straight. The reason this is one of the few pro mode fights I don't like is because the main way he wins is turning himself intangible for several turns. If he does it twice in one fight, you basically have no time to defeat him and to shed through his whopping 120 HP. If you have the Star Beam to dispel this buff, the boss fight is incredibly trivial. But without it, you're mostly just resetting until he opens on a good pattern. While Tutan Koopa does have a pattern in this boss fight, which attack in the pattern he starts with is random, so he can just make himself intangible immediately and just shave tons of time off the 13 turn timer right off the bat. It's very frustrating, and aside from this 13 turn plus intangibility gimmick, the hack developers couldn't think of much to add to this otherwise relatively mundane battle. There's another more generic Egyptian Koopa, literally called Egyptian Koopa in Mario Pinball Land. One of the worst Mario games ever made, probably. I'd say the average person would have had more fun with Hotel Mario than Mario Pinball Land. I think it's more clear that this guy specifically is not Tutan Koopa, if only because he has a different build and weapons. While Goomboss is completely identical to the Goomba King and is blatantly just the same character. There's also a subtle reference to Tutan Koopa in Mario Party 7 
where on the Egyptian board, they have lots of chain chomps everywhere, and the Bowser Sphinx has Tutan Koopa's Pharaoh headpiece. It's not just a generic Pharaoh headpiece, it's specifically Tutan Koopa's. It has the exact same colors and the chain chomp emblem in the middle, just like Tutan Koopa does. Mario Party is one of the few series to directly reference Paper Mario, most directly in Mario Party 5 with the Star Spirits, so I think this is actually intentional and not just a coincidence. It's pretty cool to see him get referenced, even if he doesn't directly appear himself. Rankings-wise, Tutan Koopa can be funny, but the entirety of his screen time is his boss battle, which is really nothing special. You get his very scary warnings in advance, but the payoff is all in his boss battle when it's revealed that he's pathetic. He'd need a better boss fight or more screen time to go higher than he is. Cortez's appearance on the overworld as a talking head might seem a bit simple, but in battle he's probably the most visually intimidating of the Paper Mario bosses. When Cortez has a body made up of bones, he definitely looks a lot more visually interesting. His first form has a giant spinal cord coming out of his skull that twists and turns, along with four arms with four different weapons in each of them. If we just went with how these guys looked, you'd think Cortez would definitely be one of the most powerful characters, although this form is quite weak when it comes to gameplay with no real gimmicks. His second form has no limbs, but instead has a giant rib cage. This is the closest he gets to having a full body, since he at least gets a torso here. This is one of the most dangerous forms if left unchecked, as he can charge up before throwing a giant pile of bones at both Mario and his partner for big damage. This form apparently has a gimmick where you can get the ribcage to fall apart and attack the gem inside his ribcage for massive damage due to its lower defense, but that gimmick seems really unfortunately wasted. Each of Cortez's forms only have 20 HP, which is pathetic on their own, so it's extremely rare that players will get to see all of his battle gimmicks. Cortez's total HP isn't just garbage by the standards of the game, technically, but he's complicated enough it's a shame you don't get to see all of his mechanics because each phase is so brief. Why would anyone bother trying to make an already super frail phase even more frail? It's just pointless. Similar to some other multi-phase battles like Lava Piranha, whenever he changes phase it instantly becomes Mario's turn. Even if one of his guys acted already, he gets the full turn back, both Mario and the partner. So having three phase transitions just reduces his effective health pool even more. His last form is the one players will get to actually see the longest and the one they primarily remember, as he picks back up the four weapons from his first form. He has no body left now, and the weapons are animated by magic to attack Mario. Everyone always just uses Vivian and her area of effect attack to kill all of the weapons instantly in one move and still hurt Cortez for a quarter of his health in the process. And even if they don't, an Earth Tremor with Mario's star powers can also do the job fairly easily. The weapons hurt a lot if not killed due to their quantity if somehow left unchecked. The main gimmick of this phase is that Cortez will eat the audience when he dies to restore his health a single time. The only real way he'll threaten you is if you run out of FP to use Vivian's area of effect attack, but even then, there's still Earth Tremor, or you might even be able to just finish him off on that current turn you're on due to Cortez's terrible HP. There's also an error in Cortez's AI, where some players will not even see the audience eating attack. If you take him from 11 HP to 0 in a single attack, he'll just die without using it, because it's specifically coded to only happen when he's under half HP. This is one of his most memorable attacks, and it's so easy to cheese that a lot of players might even do it unintentionally. Aside from the game just being too easy, I always find it bad when a boss is so easy that it's difficult to see all of the assets the developer painstakingly worked on in making them. The second form, especially, is way more complicated than it might seem, but most people blast through it without even realizing what it can do. He definitely could have used some bigger numbers. Outside of his fight, Cortez is a more comedic character. He's definitely still evil as he threatens to kill anyone who takes his treasure and he eats the audience. He at first tries to give scary warnings similar to Tutan Koopa to send Mario away, but then he mocks himself when Mario arrives, saying, Whoa, enough with this ooh nonsense, pirates do not moan. After that, he just goes to kill you himself. Cortez has grown horribly bored of having to guard his treasure as a spirit for so long anyway. After the fight is over, Cortez does not actually die because he's apparently immortal due to his undead nature. 
He refuses to give up his treasure, but when Mario says he just wants the Crystal Star, Cortez is fine with giving it up. He doesn't recognize it as any different from the others, and says that was one of the worst gems of this collection. Cortez is at first outraged when Mario returns to ask for help against Crump, but agrees to do it in exchange for an ancient artifact that he needs to sail his ship. I'll say it's kind of odd for an end of chapter boss to immediately team up with Mario, and even more odd that after the chapter is over, that he has been demoted into a taxi service to sail back and forth from the island the chapter takes place on back to the main hub. He's probably just happy he can sail around the Seven Seas like he used to now that he's not stuck in one place, but it's still awkward, tonally, for Spooky Skeleton Man to just suddenly become so friendly to me. Yeah, Cortez can be funny, but I find his characters kind of awkward in the middle of deciding whether it wants to be scary or funny. I don't like how friendly he becomes by the end of it. Giving the Crystal Star to Mario is fine, but becoming Mario's personal taxi service is too much. And that's reflected in his low threat level despite his high visual design score. His boss fight also has all the makings to be great, but the balancing on it is very off. Did you think we were done with the Tanabe trilogy after Scissors? Nope, we still have one left, and it's a genuinely good character, no strings attached. Compared to the other members of the Legion of Stationery, there should be something really, really obvious as to why Rubber Band is the best member of the group if you just look at him. Yes, Rubber Band has an actual original design. The only villain in the entirety of the Tanabe trilogy to have one besides King Ali, and his design is significantly less minimalistic than his. The design is unironically good. He's a golem made up of a bunch of rubber bands rather than just a single generic rubber band. The developers get to have a lot more fun with this character since he, you know, is actually capable of performing animations thanks to having a unique design. As Rubber Band is attacked during his boss battle, his rubber bands slowly come off of his body to help represent his health bar. You have to stop him from reabsorbing the bands back into himself to stop him from healing, which is similar to another one of my favorite bosses in the series. Aside from that, he'll slingshot his rubber bands around the field to set them as traps. Rubber Band's characterization is somewhat similar to Hole Punch in Colored Pencils in that he's a pretentious theater actor who wants the spotlight to always be on him. He makes a lot of poses as he comes onto the stage that he certainly couldn't make if he was a generic design like the others. While he's not nearly as brutal as Hole Punch or Scissors, he does still grab a literal captive audience by tying them all to their seats with his rubber band because he wants everyone to watch him and bask in the glory of his acting magnificence. Rubber Band is also a much better version of Lemmy Koopa. Both of them have a gauntlet of performers directly before their boss battle, but in Lemmy's fight it's just a bunch of generic enemies who are the commentators as the battle proceeds. With Rubber Band's section, though, he directly comments after Mario gets past each act of his stage show about how things didn't go according to the script and that Mario was supposed to die. When it's finally time for Rubber Band to make his onstage appearance, He's outraged that he accidentally made Mario look like a star by letting him beat up all of his underlings on stage, when he wants to be the sole star of the show. Rubber Band is pretty much just taking the best of Lemmy and Hole Punch while having a significantly better execution, and more importantly, a far more memorable character design. If all of the Legion of Stationary members were on par with Rubber Band, you'd see a lot less people complaining about the game. This is by far the highest placing of any character from the Tanabe trilogy, and I hope the fact that I didn't just rank every member of the Inanimate Object Squad as equal to each other, like most Tadabe detractors would, shows you that I'm doing my best to try to give these games a fair shake. Regardless, just barely cracking the top 20 with your highest ranked villain isn't anything to get too excited about, unfortunately. He's still definitely good, but he's not enough. While I like Rubber Band's section, and it's very funny and everything that it needs to be, he's still not really alluded to before you get into his movie theater so his story involvement score isn't too high, even if 4 is very high by Origami King standards. His boss fight is also still really simple once you figure out how to stop making him regenerate, so he doesn't get many points there either. I'll say the main thing separating him and Scissors is just their visual designs. If you can get past the fact that Mario is fighting an inanimate object, 
then him and rubber bands are pretty much on par. Are you really going to say this design should be replaced by a generic rubber band, though? Should rubber bands be just as out of place as Hole Punch randomly being a Disco King? It's very clear just how much his design benefits him by comparison to his Legion of Stationary Brethren. Just to clarify, this guy's music score is being carried primarily by that 35 second intro. His regular battle theme isn't horrible or anything, but it would not get that high otherwise. Hooktail is the boss fight of the first chapter, which is one of the chapters most disconnected from all of them and generally the least memorable. Hooktail is a giant dragon they made to try to show off the graphics and the paper style, and to emphasize her size during the fight, only her head and front claw are visible. She has a dungeon full of Koopa corpses she's implied to have eaten and spat out their bones over the years, which become dry bones. She's also the first boss to make use of the audience gimmick, as when she's desperate at low HP, she will go to devour members of the audience to restore her HP, which is utterly hilarious and awesome to me. She's the only boss to make you fight off of the main stage, moving into the foreground after this big reveal. Hooktail is cruel and cunning for a giant dragon like her, not just some dumb beast who relies only on brute strength. When she starts to lose, She'll try to start bargaining with Mario in exchange for her life, making her something of a cowardly dragon. If Mario stupidly accepts any of her offers, she will of course just smash him to pieces and take advantage of his stupidity. Perhaps most ridiculous, one of her offers is to let Mario smell her feet, claiming people pay good money to do this which sounds like something straight out of DeviantArt. While some rather thirsty people might have taken this quote literally, when Mario accepts this idea that Hooktail blatantly just came up with on the spot, she smashes Mario with her foot like the idiot he is. It adds some humor to what could otherwise have been a very generic and forgettable Big Dragon character. The boss fight itself is simple, and it does the job for the first boss. The one thing I'll say negative about Hooktail is there's a gimmick badge that normally does nothing but change sound effects from Mario to cricket sounds. There are subtle hints throughout Hooktail's castle that this is her weakness that are done well, and it's a decent idea. However, I find in practice equipping this badge basically just deletes the boss entirely with how much weaker it makes Hooktail. Having Hooktail be randomly afraid of these small animals is kinda funny, but I wouldn't say it's worth having a get out of jail free card. Regardless, it's the first major boss, so I guess I can't blame the developers for having a failsafe when the player's options are much lower than they are for the rest of the game. Hooktail has two recolors of herself fought later in the game, Gloomtail and Bonetail. Grifty says that they were apparently pets of the Shadow Queen, meaning they're all apparently 1,000 years old. Hooktail seems to be the only one of the three who was roaming when the Queen got trapped inside her palace, since the other two were either trapped inside the palace directly or the nearby Pit of 100 Trials. Hooktail was the lucky one, able to roam free for a thousand years, killing and eating people all that time, apparently. I don't know why Hooktail is so weak compared to the other two dragons, though. You could just say her old age is catching up to her. But that doesn't explain why the other two are so much stronger still in the present day. I guess having so much free food meant she got complacent or something? When the party first encounters Gloomtail, the party mistakes him for his sister, Hooktail and asks how Hooktail resurrected. Gloomtail is shocked and offended by this, as he realizes by this dialogue that they killed Hooktail. It's pretty funny to see him lamenting the death of his supposedly beautiful sister. I am glad this boss battle was reused as a quick sub-boss in the last dungeon, as Hooktail does have a lot of good attacks and animations to use when the difficulty is tuned up enough to give the fight some more interesting mechanics. Bonetail is the least interesting of the three, having no dialogue. He's a super boss roughly on par with or more powerful than the Shadow Queen, being the prize boss fight at the bottom of the Pit of 100 Trials. Getting to him is much harder than defeating him, but the gauntlet in front of him definitely makes him harder than fighting the Shadow Queen. Something I hadn't originally realized about Bonetail is that it's canon that he was once a living dragon like the other two, but he died of starvation due to being trapped in the pit, and now fights as an undead skeleton dragon. His design at least is cooler than just a literal recolor of Hooktail, and that tidbit of lore is pretty interesting, even if I'd say he's still the worst of the three for having no dialogue. When all three dragons were supposedly pets of the Shadow Queen, 
It raises the question as to how the Queen was even able to command Bone Tail when Bone Tail is arguably more powerful than her, or at least on par with her. I guess the Shadow Queen's barrier wasn't broken by the power of love, so she was still invincible or whatever. Either that, or even when Bone Tail still had flesh and was alive, he couldn't talk back then either and was just a mindless dragon. It's never confirmed that he is directly related to Hooktail and Gloomtail either, so it's possible he's just not sentient like those two. I want to guess that Bone Tail's zombification might have made him stronger somehow, as him being so different from the other two dragons doesn't make much sense, as well as being so powerful by comparison to his boss. Back in the Queen's prime, Bone Tail was probably just as intelligent as the other two, and probably on a similar power level to Gloom Tail or something. Regardless, the fact Bone Tail even has lore to speculate about like this makes him a lot more interesting than the generic skeleton dragon boss he appears to be. Hooktail almost managed to make a cameo appearance in the Mario expansion of Minecraft of all things. She was originally going to be a skin for the final boss of the game, the Ender Dragon. Unfortunately, quality assurance came in before the product came out and strictly forbid the use of Hooktail and referencing the Thousand Year Door, which is a game that doesn't fit with the brand cohesion of the Mario series they so desperately try to keep strong. Instead, she was replaced with the much more generic and on-brand Gobblegut from Mario Galaxy 2. The main thing holding Hooktail back is absolutely no screen time outside of her boss fights. The only reason the boss fight score is as high as it is is because of the other two versions of her, because by itself it would probably be a 3 or a 4. There are three doors with a giant Bowser head carved into them throughout Bowser's castle, but the one we're focusing on here specifically is the second one of the three. This Bowser door prompts a quiz from Mario. And unlike the Thousand Year Door quiz, this quiz is not just generic trivia questions. Those kinds of questions are already in the game anyway, thanks to Chuck Quizmo. Instead, the Bowser door will summon minions to come out through other doors and run around, then ask you questions about them after they leave. This is a lot more engaging and less obvious than the trivia questions found on other doors. It's not just 100% easy. You have to fail three questions, and while some of them are quite easy, he has some nastier ones in there. The one I see almost everyone get wrong is the question about which door the minions came through at the start of the question. Because that happened so long ago, people are likely to forget. On later questions, hordes of minions come out through the doors, making it significantly harder to figure out what he's going to ask. Considering you're talking to a stone Bowser head, it practically feels like you're talking to Bowser himself. The quiz has a more serious tone than Thousand Year Doors, because the door goes on about how horrible the punishment is for failing the quiz. It only really starts to emphasize just how bad it is as you get more questions wrong. The amazing soundtrack of Bowser's Castle in this game really helps to sell that feeling of dread. Now, I love this quiz. But what makes this truly memorable is the fact that he is not bluffing about the penalty. If you lose, you have to fight the hardest boss in the entire game. Three anti-guys. I considered putting this all under anti-guys section on the list, but these anti-guys don't speak. And that individual anti-guy has so much personality that I thought they deserved their own sections. There's nothing more complicated about these three anti-guys than the original one you fought, but that's part of what makes this fight so menacing. You know exactly what you're in for, and that's terrifying. Considering this fight's status is the hardest fight in the game, many players intentionally try to fight this battle even though there's no reward just for the sake of entertainment. If you let these guys attack you, they're gonna do three hits of 10 to 12 damage, so they demand some kind of strategy and force the player to take advantage of the game mechanics properly. Yes, it's generic, but this fight is optional and takes place at the end of the game, so it's very much appreciated there's something to test out the game mechanics on. To address the two other Bowser doors briefly, the first one tricks you into falling into a pit and traps you in a jail cell, mocking Mario for being so stupid. The third one has you fight some previous bosses again, and the dialogue afterwards is pretty funny as the door is confused. He was supposed to only let you through if you beat the Koopa Brothers, but Junior Trooper beat them and you beat him so he doesn't know what to do. If I just based the boss fight score on the anti-guys, I wouldn't give a boss fight ranking this high. But the gameplay of the quiz is legitimately good enough that I'm boosting this higher than it would be otherwise. This is one of the most memorable little bits of the game. Neither the door or the anti-guys technically have their own theme, 
But the Bowser's Castle theme just feels so perfect for the ominous tone of this quiz that I can't help but give it a good score for that. It just sounds fantastic. Oh, and before someone asks, I didn't forget the quiz doors from Super Paper Mario. They're just not particularly villainous, so I didn't bother to include them on the villains list. The Cooper Brothers get some of the most screen time of any of the chapter bosses of Paper Mario. Considering most bosses don't show up in the story at all before they're fought. They show up several times throughout the story compared to the others who mostly just generically show up a single time before they have to fight. After the Goomba King is defeated, we get to see them directly talking to Bowser, and they manage to impress the big guy enough with their signature technique to make him gawk on in awe. All of the bosses in this game mention how they work for Bowser, but the Cooper Brother is the only one we ever see directly interacting with him. After that, they use some sort of magic to shapeshift into Toads and go to Toad Town to block the way to their castle, where their star spirit is being held. While they eventually are forced out of the disguises, I'm not sure why they even needed them in the first place. Even in the regular Mario universe, let alone Paper Mario, not all Koopas are evil. So they could have just taken off their bandanas, which is the only thing that even identifies them, and then just generically stood in the way without any need for a disguise. They're competent enough to make traps and such when Mario reaches their fortress. They're pretty smart, because they want to kill Mario with indirect means rather than just generically fighting him like everyone else. Now, this one scene here with Yellow setting up a question mark block trap may look comedic and stupid when we, the player, get to see it, and many players will try to avoid hitting it because they don't realize it's the only way to make progress in the game. In reality, though, Mario has no way of knowing about this block. He didn't get that random cutaway that only the player got to see. So it's fairly competent on the part of the Koopa Brothers as Mario falls for the trap and lands down in the pit like an idiot. Yellow rightfully mocks Mario for being so stupid and celebrates even though Mario does, of course, get out of the cell a few minutes later. Red goes on to later set up a series of bullet bill blasting cannons in Mario's way, not giving up as they go all out to try to stop him before they have no choice but to fight. When Mario finally corners the Koopa Brothers, they reveal the ultimate project they've been working on, an extremely poorly constructed wooden mech of Bowser. It moves around on wheels, and its only attack is a pathetic swing of its arm for one damage. Red shouts out loudly, pretending that he is the real Bowser, despite how stupid looking this mech is. Even when you target the thing, its label is BOWSER, with two question marks after it. As if even the game is mocking how obviously this is not Bowser. The music is comedically sinister, and as the mech starts falling apart, you can see dialogue from the Cooper Brothers inside of it, worrying about the damage done to it, which is really funny. But it falls apart entirely. They say that Bowser loved it! Which is probably the main reason they even thought making it was a good idea in the first place, just to try to impress him. This whole Bowser costume thing is hilarious. And I'm honestly surprised that Bowser even liked this blatant caricature of himself. It's not exactly a flattering resemblance. When it's destroyed later, we can even see if there was a picture of Peach inside of it. So I guess that added plus points for him? It was clearly made to just be scary and impress Bowser with nothing practical about it for combat. It's funny in all the right ways, similar to King Cutout from Donkey Kong 64. But the boss fight against it is just an interactive cutscene, basically. When they fight directly, the Cooper Brothers are pretty easy to defeat. They have a signature move where they stack themselves on top of each other, but they are easily knocked over. And when they're separated, they can be casually knocked on their backs and killed like ordinary Koopas. Even Goombario says that they're just generic Koopas when you use Tattle on them. The boss is really easy because it's early in the game, but I will say it's at least slightly mechanically interesting, and more importantly has the hilarious Bowser mech section. The Koopa Brothers don't really appear again until the very ending of the game, where they're Bowser's last line of defense. I guess all the sucking up they did to Bowser paid off for him to give them a second chance. The red one asks if you remember them or not, and you have a yes-no prompt and can hit no to annoy him. He insists that they're way stronger and that they've been training constantly, and gives his group a ridiculously long title with tons of adjectives to show how great they are. Unfortunately for them, though, they're just instantly killed by Junior Trooper to show off how powerful he is and glorify him instead. I'll say that it still would have been perfectly possible to have a boss fight against both of them in a row, 
and Junior Trooper to finish them off after their fight, so I'm not going to pretend I'm not disappointed by it. In Pro Mode, the boss rematch of the Cooper Brothers is incredibly difficult. Each one of the four brothers gives a unique buff. Green gives defense, yellow electrifies people, black gives intangibility, and red gives attack. If you don't use the Star Beam to get rid of their buffs due to not having gotten it in Chapter 8 yet, this is the hardest fight in the entire game, if you ask me. Even if you do use it, it's not like it's easy either. One of their attacks is jumping off the top of the screen, where they'll stay for a while before coming down to do an aerial dropkick on top of Mario. While they're off the top, they can't be hit by Star Beam or anything else, potentially enabling them to keep buffs when you've dispelled them from the rest of the group. In addition, combined with the intangibility from Black, it makes it very, very hard to focus Fire the Brothers down one at a time, because they can't all be targeted at will. I would always find myself trying to kill Black first, if at all possible, then Green. Once it's down to two, you pretty much won. But there's a bug which causes the game to crash unless Red is killed last. Which I learned the hard way, because Yellow is by far the least useful member of the group, so anyone with a brain would want to kill him last. In any case, of all of the bosses that just basically lose whenever you use the Star Beam, these guys are pretty much the only ones that manage to put up a fight when you do have it. Meanwhile, Tutan Koopa and the Goomba King basically just get invalidated by Star Beam entirely. It's a really fun fight, and I wish they had something similar to this in the real game where they show up at the end rather than just getting casually killed. Junior Troopa's fight there is nothing terribly special anyway. I guess the idea is supposed to be that the Koopa Brothers are just cowards who are weak, but as far as cowards go, they're relatively competent. The Koopa Brothers are clearly based on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, both of them being called Ninja Koopas. They don't do much of anything ninja-like, it's just a little joke. Their designs are really generic as just four colored Koopas with masks, but you can argue they're intentionally generic to reference the TMNT. I would still rather their designs weren't just four recolors of each other though, and that they had actual names instead of just colors. It would go a long way into making them more memorable, and set them up for a rematch when they show up at the end of the game better. There are versions of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that have their designs not just be copy-pasted from each other, but those versions of the characters didn't exist when this game came out. Super Mario Bros. Z, for whatever reason, makes heavy use of the Koopa Brothers despite very few other RPG characters showing up. Pretty much entirely misses the point of them as being hilarious and lovable cowards, and instead just makes them much more direct rebuffs from TMNT by giving them the same weapons as them to try to make them cool or whatever. If it wasn't clear, the Cooper Brothers were never meant to be particularly cool. They're supposed to be a bunch of dorks that you empathize with and serve as some of the introductory antagonists to the game. The Cooper Brothers are almost exclusively carried by how funny the Bowser mech section is, giving them a very high comedy score and helping their characterization score. They get a fair amount of screen time compared to most Paper Mario bosses too, so they even get a decent story involvement score. Unfortunately, their boss fight is still very lacking. While I absolutely love their pro mode fight, I can't actually count that. Junior Troopa is the most recurring antagonist within Paper Mario besides Bowser. He shows up right at the start and appears incredibly pathetic. He's a newborn Koopa who just came out of his shell, and his name is apparently just Junior, whoever Senior Koopa apparently is. He supposedly leads a gang around the local neighborhood to bully people, but we never see him have any friends, minions, or anybody who would ever want to even associate with him. I assume everyone within the game's universe hates him and wants nothing to do with him. The so-called gang probably consists of nobody but himself. Junior Troop is the first tutorial battle, and he doesn't show up again until after the first chapter is completed. In his first real fight, Junior Trooper tries to learn from his mistakes before comically trying to tackle Mario and landing in the water like an idiot. Then he shows off his new technique that he's learned, hiding inside of his eggshell like that's somehow gonna protect him from Mario and let him defeat him. He treats this like it's some kind of brilliant tactic, and it makes it hard to not laugh at his patheticness. He doesn't stop, though, as he's very persistent in his irrational hatred of Mario. He grows wings in his next encounter, and in the fight after that he swims across the ocean to try to chase after Mario. 
Yeah, the entire ocean. When he finally finishes his long journey and reaches the island Mario's at, he goes to head back to Toad Town. Junior Troopa goes to swim all the way back without any rest, enraged and frustrated. When he finally catches up to Mario, the fourth wall is broken as it shows all of his swimming has depleted half of his HP bar. This particular encounter makes for the most memorable of Junior Troopa's material, as it's the hardest despite the fact Junior Troopa only has 20 HP due to tiring himself out. In this battle, he not only has wings to fly, but he has a spike on top of his head, greatly limiting the attacks capable of hitting him. He's in the air, so you can't use a hammer attack, and you can't jump on top of him due to the spike. Of course, if you know what can hit him, aka the ridiculously overpowered Star Storm, he's still a pitifully easy opponent. But this is the closest he ever comes to being a threat in his encounters, and it's after his funniest cutscene to boot. After the ocean battle, he's still not done, as he shows up yet again in the snow area and has learned magic. He will stop at nothing to try to kill Mario. He's by far the most persistent of his enemies. He still only has one attack animation here, so he's still pitiful though, even if his numbers have scaled to be pretty high. After he's defeated, he's frozen in a block of ice that looks like he would realistically just freeze to death as Mario leaves him there. But he shows up for one final time in Bowser's castle. Keep in mind, Junior Troopa is one of the very few villains in this game who is in no way associated with Bowser. So he fought all the way through the hardest dungeon in the game just to try to get another chance to kill Mario. Here, he manages to kill the Koopa Brothers right before they're set up to attack Mario, which definitely shows how far he's come as he cements himself as Mario's most persistent enemy. Junior Trooper wants to establish that he is Mario's rival, nobody else. His final fight is a very nice narrative conclusion to his character because he attempts to use all the attacks he's learned along the way within a single fight to kill Mario. Gameplay-wise, unfortunately, he has not improved much because he only uses one form of his at a time. He's at least learned how to use magic for something other than just firing a generic blast, as he uses it to heal himself. Still, it would be nice if he was flying, with the spike on his head, and using the magic to attack all at once. That would have been considerably more impressive than swapping between the forms like this. Even if his fights are easy, they're at least varied, and this final fight is a decent send-off for him. Promo doesn't do much to spice up his fights, unfortunately, because he's not a chapter boss. That means he doesn't get a rematch with the main group of bosses who do. A post-game rematch does exist for him, but it's only available after you beat Bowser, and it's easier than Bowser. It doesn't really have any more gimmicks than the final Junior Trooper fight in Bowser's Castle, but in the shell form, he has a lot of defense and actually heals now, so it's nice they gave a point to that at least. But compared to the other boss matches, not really that great. The main fight that gets changed is his second fight, where he actually summons minions to help him and becomes one of the hardest fights in the game for the point at which it's fought. Apparently, Junior Trooper's gang was real according to promo. Another hack, Bowser's Dark Story, also has an interesting new form for Junior Trooper that shows just how far they could go with this. In this act, Junior Trooper sells his soul to Dark Bowser for a piece of candy and makes robotic dialogue about getting rebooted. While I'm generally not a fan of this hack, this Junior Trooper form is an exception and it's something I definitely could have seen in the actual game for Junior Trooper's next evolution. The gimmick of being a computer that talks in assembly code is a lot funnier than something like the Leet Hammer Brothers from Partners in Time. Junior Trooper starts out as a pathetic Team Rocket-like opponent to laugh at, and while he never fully sheds that persona, it's nice to see him legitimately develop over the course of the game into a real threat. His motivation is out of sheer hatred for Mario, so you have to wonder what this guy would turn into if he kept improving himself and aged into an adult. Junior Troopa definitely makes a far more compelling child Koopa villain than Bowser Jr., if you ask me. As far as how he scores, his design is a bit simplistic. His overworld theme is alright for portraying him as a pathetic recurring villain, but it's not something that's pleasurable to listen to. His threat level is kind of difficult to gauge, as the point is supposed to be he's not a threat, but the fact he's come so far by the end of the game means I can't score him too low either. Tubba Blubba is one of the most involved of the chapter bosses in the first game. While he's a giant and is the owner of a castle with lots of servants made up of his race, 
He's a pretty tremendous loser for how big he is. He only has three more HP than all of his countless grunts, so they could easily overthrow him if they wanted to. The only reason he's strong is the fact that Bowser made him invincible with the Star Rod, so his 10 HP effectively became infinite. He might have gained his followers after Bowser did that, and Bowser just assumed Tubbo was strong because he was big, which is a fair enough assumption. The castle, on the other hand, though, is clearly very old and falling apart, so I think it's more likely Tubba was the king here before Bowser gave him his invincibility. How he commands these clubbers is anyone's guess. Either Tubba Blubba is somehow a beloved and intelligent leader, or those weird, grabby claw machine minions he has keeps everybody in line or something. Regardless of how Tubba Blubba became the leader of his group, the boos of the area constantly talk about how much fun they had scaring him because he was so easily spooked. He was their favorite victim, and there's a lot of boos to go around, so we never heard the end of it. We don't get to see this on camera, but enough boos talk about it that it definitely happened. Once Bowser decided to make Tubba invincible, though, he took out his revenge on the boos that plagued him by eating them all. I don't know how you can eat a ghost that can phase through solid matter, but apparently he can do that. Considering how the boos acted like bullies, this doesn't seem entirely unwarranted from Tubba Blubba. Eventually, though, things turn around the other way with the boos instead become terrified of him as he regularly goes through their settlements to eat them. Tubba Blubba is not a saint, but I'd still say the boos were the more guilty party here. In every other chapter, the boss of the chapter is the one guarding the star spirit that Mario needs to save. And this one, though? Bao, the leader of the Boos who joins Mario, is the one holding the star spirit hostage. And she refuses to release him until Mario kills Tubba Blubba for her. It seems pretty clear to me that Tubba is the lesser of the two evils, even if he's also a bad guy. A decent chunk of time during the chapter is spent trying to figure out the secret to Tubba Blubba's invincibility. Mario has to hide while the big guy is sleeping, then escape the castle with his secret as the giant manages to destroy the castle with his massive girth behind him, rampaging desperately through the castle to try to kill Mario. If he catches you, he is in fact invincible as advertised, and you can't hurt him. The player is forced to run away. Tubba Blubba has the makings of a pretty interesting character, but I will say the secret of his invincibility is a pretty big letdown. Mario makes his way to the bottom of the windmill where Tubba's heart is held in secret. There are increasingly funny warnings written on signs on the wall that tell people that no entry is allowed. I don't know whether Tubba came all the way down here himself to write these warnings or his heart did. Either one is pretty funny to picture. Either Tubba Blubba is managing to squeeze down that well or the heart somehow writing things on the wall without hands. When Mario reaches the heart, it somehow is capable of speech and claims that it is somehow controlling Tubba Blubba, which I find to be really, really stupid. The heart has next to no characterization itself beyond wanting to generically antagonize Mario, so it's not all that great. The heart's boss fight really isn't any better than its character. The gimmick of this boss is that it has a supercharge attack where it will unleash many small hearts to attack Mario, but this can easily be avoided by hiding for a turn with Bao. Bao outright tells the player to do this to try to help tutorialize it. Make the final boss of the chapter a tutorial for a party member's attack, a party member that we've already had access to for several hours, no less, is pretty dumb if you ask me, especially considering we're at three-eighths out of the game here. The heart's only other attack besides the easily avoided charge-up attack is just generically walking over and bumping into you like a Goomba. After defeating the heart, it makes its retreat and goes to reunite with Tubba Blubba, which makes him able to be attacked again. It is here where you get to see how pathetic Tubba Blubba is in his regular state. I can't help but find it sad. The heart boss being so simple would be forgivable if Tubba's fight was any better, but it's a waste just meant to emphasize how pathetic Tubba Blubba is. I understand what they're going for with the characterization, and Tubba spitting up all of the ghosts he ate and running off crying is pretty funny, but it's still an anti-climax to the chapter. This guy could destroy a castle by doing a butt stomp. Is he really supposed to be this weak? The regular members of his race use giant clubs to beat people up. Where Tubba is so strong, apparently all he needs to do is just use his bare hands. Probode has the best alterations for Tubba Blubba of any of the bosses, considering how low his starting point is. Even in the main story mode, they give him 40 HP, the same amount as his heart, so that he ends up being the true boss battle of the chapter. 
his rematch actually has a ton of interesting gimmicks. To go with his heart theme, at the end of every turn he automatically heals 5 HP and grows bigger, increasing his attack power. His base HP is still very small for this point in the hack, so it's bound to become something of a race to kill him before he becomes too powerful. Tubba Blubba retains the charge up heart attack move, but at the same time he has many other threatening attacks. More importantly, the charge-up attack will waste Mario's time by consuming two of his partner's turns if Mario chooses to avoid it, while Tubba Blubba continues healing himself and becoming more powerful. This is really a perfect fight for him, and I only wish there could be something more like it in the real game. Tubba Blubba has good scores across the board other than his boss fight. While his music theme is only okay, I find his chase theme to be a lot more memorable by comparison. As far as his design, I like the little patch on his torso implying that that's where his heart was ripped out of him by Bowser's Star Rod, and his inverted eyes make him look pretty intimidating. Rockhawk is the secondary antagonist of the Glitz Pit Wrestling Arena. He's a heel wrestler and the champion of the Glitz Pit. His introduction is casually destroying the number one ranked contender, and saying weaklings should stay home playing video games, unlike strong men like him. His matter of speech is vaguely based on Hulk Hogan, but his Spanish name is even Hawk Hogan to make the reference even more obvious. The other wrestler he parodies is The Rock, with his catchphrase of telling people to get rocked, or feel the rock. Rockhawk regularly threatens Mario as he climbs up the Glitz Pit ladder, saying he'll kill him if he gets in the ring with him along with making other macho threats. The only reason Mario wants to beat him is to take the Crystal Star off of his belt, so he ignores his warnings and keeps proceeding through the ranks of the wrestlers. Unfortunately for Rockhawk, he's significantly played down in his character archetype due to the vast majority of glory being taken from him by Grubba. Rockhawk is the second to last opponent of the chapter, but he's an absolute pushover compared to Grubba. His ordinary attacks are pathetic and he's super frail by boss standards. His only threatening move is when he attempts to cheat by grabbing onto the ceiling and shaking down a series of props on top of Mario. This does by far the most damage Rockhawk is capable of, but each hit does a mere single point of damage, meaning if they're blocked, they don't do anything. If Koops is your active partner, he doesn't even get hurt by Rockhawk's super attack, given he has a point of defense. It's very easy to knock Rockhawk off of the ceiling, at which point he can never get back onto it again, and he's stuck with his horrible, weak, regular attacks which have no kind of special effects. Aside from his lackluster boss fight, Rockhawk's other main attempts to stop Mario are trying to poison him with a cake he anonymously sends to him, and by locking him inside of an empty locker room and bribing a security guard to keep him there. This kind of heel behavior flies in the face of his macho character considerably, because he's still supposed to be strong, but he clearly isn't. I'd honestly say even the Koopanator, who he effortlessly defeats in the cutscene, is a much tougher opponent in gameplay. Yes, every boss in the Paper Mario series is on the easy side, but when he's a wrestling heel, having such a terrible fight really sticks out. Despite all of his talk, his constant attempts to cheat show he's probably just terrified of losing his title. If you want to portray him as a character who does have to cheat, that's fine. But then his cheating-based attacks need to actually be threatening and more numerous by comparison to what we got. Something more like Aaron Ryan from Punch-Out. Grubba gives random special conditions before each fight that adds more challenge to each boss for things like don't jump or don't use your partner. But for Rockhawk, it's a condition of use at least one special move, which most everybody's gonna do anyway, so that's really pointless and unnecessary mercy for this already way too easy boss. Speaking of Grubba, it's worth bringing up that the main source of power Grubba absorbs with his power-sucking machine is Prince Mush, the former champion of the arena who is apparently much stronger than Rockhawk. The man was apparently easily beaten up by a toad of all things. Not only this, but Grubba saw fit to absorb Mush and leave Rockhawk alone, implying that he thought Rockhawk was too weak to be worth absorbing. Grubba goes on to absorb several other weaker fighters, but to be fair to Rockhawk, Grubba probably keeps him around because he needs some talent in this show. After beating the chapter, Mario can return to the Glitz Pit to reclimb the ranks as he pleases. Grubba is dead and gone at this point, but Rockhawk can be rematched endlessly once the player reaches the top. This is a very common way that many players grinded for experience points, and it's honestly hard to not picture this being canon 
with Rockhawk being humiliated by Mario beating him into the ground ten times in a row. There's no option to fight anyone else once you reach the top unless you intentionally lose to Rockhawk, so you and him will be seeing a lot of each other. No dialogue occurs with this series of losses to acknowledge it, which could actually be funny for making Rockhawk into a butt monkey character, but he's always portrayed as serious and cool. Even in the rebatches, Rockhawk still has the exact same fight with no improvements, and will still do his pathetic trick to try to cheat. This character has one of the larger fan bases among Thousand Year Doors characters, and they seem to just buy into his persona unironically despite how much of a loser he can often be. If they were going to betray him this way, he could have definitely used a new fight for his rematch very stronger. While we're at it, make the whole Glitz Pit stronger when you go back. That would give an actual reason to go there instead of doing the exact same fights again for no reason. Make Rockhawk train and become the super boss instead of Bone Tail. Make the Glitz Pit another Pit of 100 Trials. People would love that. The only time we see Rockhawk have any substantial appearance after this is during one of the Bowser interludes, where he is once again humiliated, but by Bowser this time. Bowser effortlessly defeats him in one attack in a similar fashion to how Rockhawk beat the Koopanator in his first appearance. This scene is definitely hilarious, but it's largely at Rockhawk's expense. The Rock does apparently try to train for how weak he is, having set up an obstacle course with X Not Super Freaks he hired to up the difficulty level. For how funny it is to see him as a butt monkey figure, you really want to see him do something successful. The problem with Rockhawk for me is that his character is too strongly split between wanting to be taken seriously as a heel wrestler and being a completely washed up loser. Super Mario Bros. Z seems to get the right characterization for him, as he's voiced with clips from Hercule in Dragon Ball, a character who only appears to be strong but is actually a wimp. Hercule is probably the right route to go with this guy after his initial tough guy facade fades, but when boss fights are one of the main ways to show off your characterization in video games, you'd still hope he got a better fight at some point anyway. While Rockhawk has no hope of upstaging Grubba during his initial appearance, a rematch would be the perfect opportunity for him to improve. If it wasn't clear yet, Rockhawk is just dragged down by his boss fight. In the context of his boss being terrible, he comes across as too comedic of a character for what I think the developers were trying to go for. I understand why he's beloved by the fanbase, as the whole series is very easy regardless, but his fight needed serious improvements for me to personally rank him any higher than this. The idea of an evil Luigi is something that resonates with a lot of people. It's a really great concept. No, no, not Waluigi, unfortunately. You think if we're fighting against all these other mandates from Tanabe that we could get Waluigi in an RPG? Yeah, fat chance of that. Waluigi is slightly topical to Mr. L here, because it used to be a thing that Luigi was considered more of an underdog, waiting for his chance to get out of Mario's shadow. His weird final smash and brawl was referencing this characterization of his. This weird thing that Sakurai made up called the Negative Zone. Pretty funny. It was always funny to me, the idea that Luigi was the one who wanted to get a chance of being in the spotlight, to the point he might turn on his much more boring brother. Obviously, he would never actually do it, but you just want to see the underdog succeed. It's a natural instinct with a lot of people. Then Nintendo came along, they heard the feedback, and they made the Year of Luigi. They started giving him more attention, putting him in more games, giving him more important roles. Luigi kinda just became a more bog-standard character like his brother, and that just made him less interesting. Gone was the funny negative zone, and now he just had a pretty standard Final Smash referencing one of his games like everyone else. Waluigi kinda took that role from him as the underdog, if anything. Even Mario Odyssey calls Waluigi an underdog, that really doesn't come up for Luigi anymore. But we're not here to talk about Waluigi. Mr. L was made back when Luigi wasn't treated so nice by Nintendo, so he had a lot more of that underdog appeal. Mr. L is the true culmination of all of that era of Luigi coming to the forefront, as he abandons Mario and truly tries to strike out on his own. Obviously, that's because of mind control, it's against his will, but it was just so satisfying to see Luigi be something other than just the generic player too. Nintendo would also, of course, never approve a story with Luigi turning evil nowadays, brainwashed or not. Luigi's personality in his new form is definitely pretty likable as far as villains go. He's the stereotypical proud villain who's overly sure of himself, 
But when he has to come up with excuses in front of Count Black's other minions, he actually comes up with some fairly smooth comebacks to try to brush off his incompetence and make the other villains sound like the weaklings. He's an entertaining character to watch in what little time he's on the screen. Due to the brainwashing, Luigi doesn't recognize his old friends. But one of the funnier gags is the fact that Luigi's mask prevents other characters from identifying him, despite how blatantly obvious his identity is to the audience. Characters won't be able to place their finger on who he is and ask him to take that mysterious mask off, but of course he ignores their requests. Mr. L's main big fighting gimmick is that he's apparently become a master of programming and machines, as he relies on a gigantic mech called Brobot, which he refers to as his brother. Considering he no longer is aware of Mario's existence, I find it hilarious he's effectively replaced Mario with this thing. The giant robot is what Mr. L subconsciously thinks of Mario in the depths of his brain. Mr. L is absolutely pathetic when fighting on foot, having to rely on his gargantuan robotic brother to do the heavy lifting for him, just like with the real Mario. In reality, Mario is a mute character who cannot speak. So the fact Luigi is representing him as an emotionless robot is hilarious to me. I love it. Apparently, Mario is just some kind of tool that this evil version of Luigi intends to use to get what he wants. If Luigi did spontaneously become evil in the main series somehow, that's definitely something I could see him do, taking advantage of Mario's stupidity for his own benefit. It would certainly be more direct if Brobot had Mario's hat instead of Luigi's, but Mr. L doesn't remember Mario. This is all just from his subconscious, so it makes sense. There's this other RPG that takes place inside of Luigi's head called Mario and Luigi Dream Team, but nothing half as interesting as Mr. L shows up in that game, despite the entire setting being within Luigi's brain. For how much everybody loves Mr. L, his screen time is very brief, and he ends up getting murdered by Dementio. To be fair to Mr. L, this is directly after he's fought the main party, so he's weakened while Dementio is in prime condition. His boss fights are pretty pathetic, like basically every fight in Super Paper Mario. His most memorable attack, if you can call it that, is trying to take out a shroom shake to drink it and heal himself. He takes so long to do this that it's pretty much just a taunt that lets you get free hits in on him. He's never gonna successfully heal. In addition, you can even outright steal Mr. L's shroom shake from him and use it for yourself, if this attack wasn't bad enough. In Brobot, he isn't quite as pathetic, though his fight in the main gameplay style is still super easy. This mustache boomerang attack is cool, though. His space shooter style fight is the one I prefer. Though, again, it's all just for visual flair. The fight will end before you realize it even started. The only thing separating him from the biggest characters from Super Paper Mario is just that he doesn't have as much screen time as them. So his story involvement score can only get so high. Boss fights being terrible is just universally accepted with Super Paper Mario. Francis is the only character from Super Paper Mario who's memorable besides the main villain group or main characters. He's a nerd gag character whose purpose is to be so extreme in his nerddom that he's funny to watch. This is a character archetype that is very, very easy to get wrong, to the point where they aren't funny and just come across as creepy. Something I've seen with many, many characters before. The nerd character archetype commonly is obsessed with girls and can come across as predators. It's also easy for these kinds of characters to not be funny, as some writers think that just having them generically say nerdy things is enough to be funny by itself. Francis avoids all of the many common pitfalls of this trope and is the best character of this archetype I can think of, in that his nerdiness is really over the top and ridiculous so that it's legitimately funny. Yeah, he does hit on girls, and he doesn't want anyone in his castle but himself and hot babes. However, he doesn't go around kidnapping maidens or anything. Only Peach can get into his room and bypass the security system due to being a so-called hot babe. And when she shows up, Francis reveals that he's so incapable of talking to girls due to his social incompetence that he has to pull up a dating simulator to do that. The player can choose from a list of text options here to go along with the dating simulator joke. And Francis is just trying to make her like him rather than doing anything too terribly creepy. Nothing here ages that poorly or is offensive or anything. Just the game mocking Francis for his social awkwardness. 
And I'd say the joke lands, but it could have so, so easily gone wrong. Eventually, Peach gets fed up and ends the dating simulator by blowing it up, prompting Francis's boss battle. The fight isn't because of him trying to kidnap Peach. He's trying to defend the butterfly he stole. And he doesn't realize that butterfly is a sentient life form or anything. He just thinks it's some kind of thing that he can add to his collection. His boss fight has a lot of cool attacks even if the fight is still pathetically easy due to the game being Super Paper Mario. In this fight, Francis can use his chameleon powers to go invisible, use the tacky flash from his camera to blind the player, summon his cat-made robots to attack, and can also devour his enemies, forcing them to waggle the Wii Remote to get out. He can also teleport around the arena by tapping the keys on his laptop. The fight doesn't last long, but it's an enjoyable spectacle compared to the others. At the start of the chapter, Francis kidnaps your butterfly partner, Tippy, so he can take pictures of her and post them online on his butterfly nerd site, digibutter.nerd. Some fans decided to take this joke one step further and make a website out of this domain name that is still up to this day, even if the site is dead now. It wasn't active for long, and the site has little to nothing to actually do with Super Paper Mario, but it's pretty hilarious that it ever existed at all. Maybe you can revive it with discussions of digital butterflies if you feel so inclined. Francis's lair is made up of pixels due to him being a video game nerd and whatnot. Within its walls are countless cat-made robots, and several of the doors are made up of stereotypical cat faces. Going around the place, you can see references to lots of random female Paper Mario characters that Francis is apparently a fan of. He's also apparently a fan of Grotus and the x knots collecting action figures of them. As you traverse the lair, you'll have to answer various security questions to prove that you are Francis, or that Peach is compatible with Francis, because apparently being a hot babe isn't enough for Francis's very, very high standards. You need to have exquisite taste and nerd them too. The questions are all pretty funny to show the extremes of how nerdy he is. Many of these questions do in fact mimic things nerds in real life actually do. But this isn't surface level stuff. This is only the kind of thing you would know after you've had to deal with some of these people. Francis apparently doesn't care about stories in his comics and manga, and will buy them if the cover's good. He'll dig through all the copies to find the one that's in the best condition, then never take it out of its packaging for the collector's value. Now, the ones that have become far, far more true today are... I have bought games I have never played! which has become so painfully true to the point there's a site for that called Backlogged, where people categorize all these games they own but haven't played into their backlog. By far my favorite question, though, I love going on message boards and complaining about games I've never played. This has become a common meme reaction image that is still used to this day, and has also spawned edits of itself. My favorite is the one that replaces complaining with defending. Both sides of the argument are used excessively when it comes to games that haven't been released yet. You can't possibly tell that that food isn't good, you haven't eaten it yet. Most of Francis' best material comes from these doors, as he unfortunately isn't on camera all that long. But he's one of the most memorable parts of the game for sure. After his chapter is over, he doesn't reappear until the very end of the game. The developers must have liked him too, because Mimi, in disguise of Merle the Magician, asks Mario about the things he hates. This is similar to what Kami Koopa does in the first paper Mario, where Mimi will then place all of the objects that Mario responded to in his way. One of the options that you could respond to is Francis, at which point Mimi apparently just spontaneously teleports Francis out of his house in for a boss fight. The boss battle hasn't been updated whatsoever, so his numbers are pathetic for the end of the game. But it's a hilarious easter egg, and it's nice to see his character rear his head again. He does actually have dialogue too, and he's just as shocked as the protagonists are that he's randomly here somehow. In the post-game, Tippy the Butterfly is taken off with Count Blick. So if you want to replace her, you have to go to Francis. He'll offer you a robotic duplicate of her that he built and named Tiptron. She functions completely identically, although he charges a full 999 coins for it, so he can buy an x Knots comic. I find his quote if you don't have enough money to buy it particularly funny, as he demands, Stop breathing on her! Don't ruin her resale value! As with every character of this archetype, not every single line hits, but when it does hit, it is super funny. I don't really have any complaints about Francis. His appearance is pretty great, and that while it still communicates nerd, 
They didn't go overboard with making him outright hideous like how so many of these nerd character archetypes can be. He's still pleasant enough to look at. I like the theme of his fort better than his fight music, so that's what's giving him his score there. The only category he suffers in is threat level. Obviously, he's supposed to come across as pathetic. He's a nerd. That's the entire point of his character. So that aspect can't really be helped. Bowser is a very awkward character to talk about, because the RPGs are where he's given most of his characterization that a lot of people love him for. In most of the RPGs, like Thousand Year Door, he's portrayed as very comedic. But in the first Paper Mario, he's played much more straight than usual. This is one of the few games where you can take Bowser remotely seriously. If you're gonna make him be a main villain, this is much more the way to do it by comparison to the Tanabe trilogy. In the introduction, Bowser goes to steal the Star Rod, a magical device that can grant wishes. The fact that he has it means he can apparently grant any wish he wants. The primary thing he uses it for is invincibility, so he cannot be hurt. But it also gives him generic magic powers like using thunder, shockwaves, and healing himself. After casually stealing the Star Rod, Bowser imprisons its guardians and entrusts them to his most loyal minions. He then goes on to not only kidnap Peach, but her entire castle. He does this by putting his own castle underneath the other one, then flies it up high into the night sky. This is definitely the best design I've ever seen for Bowser's castle, and this is how you make a Koopa Clown car look cool, especially with those spiked balls and chain arm things that it has. It looks like the Mario movie might have been referencing the design for this castle, but I'm gonna say that was probably a coincidence. It's never explained how Bowser got his castle underneath Peach's castle. It would take years for his minions to build it underground underneath Peach's castle, and it would take even longer if they were supposed to do it without causing any noise that would make the people up above realize what was going on. I assume he just wished for it with the Star Rod. Next, Bowser goes to fulfill his lifelong dream and directly defeats Mario in combat in the intro. It is reasonable of Bowser to assume that Mario is dead, because he knocks him out the window with a thunderbolt and sends him hurtling thousands of feet through the air before he crashes down onto the ground. Now, the big elephant in the room is why Bowser does not use the Star Rod much more after this. It apparently can grant any wish. Yes, Bowser assumes Mario died, but he shortly thereafter learns of his survival. Bowser could just wish Mario was dead at any point in the story, and wish away any of his other problems at will. I guess Bowser doesn't see Mario as a threat when he's invincible and wants to do it personally, just the same reason why he doesn't just wish Peach married him or whatever. But that honestly isn't that good of an excuse. Because if he wants to defeat Mario personally just to have the satisfaction of doing it himself, why is he still sending so many people to try to kill Mario? Why is he upset when they fail? Shouldn't he be, like, angry if they defeated him? Because, like, only I could defeat Mario. That's the only reason why he shouldn't want Mario dead, just so he can do it himself, since he could just kill him at any time. But whatever. If we spend too long discussing what Bowser could do with an item that lets him do literally anything, we'll be here all day. Point is, the Star Rod is ill-defined, and they should have established that it can't do absolutely anything, so Bowser doesn't look stupid. Bowser never leaves the castle for the rest of the game, but his presence is felt when every single boss constantly talks about how they're working for him. No matter how out of place that may be, such as Crystal King saying it, Bowser's apparently an amazing leader. And people are probably hoping he gives them some kind of useful wish like he gave the Tubba Lubba. He's a pretty strong character despite the fact he mostly only appears in the interludes. Despite how seriously Bowser is portrayed in this game, he does have more comedic moments too. It's implied that he loved the mech of him the Cooper Brothers made, which is pretty funny considering how pathetic it is. My favorite comedic scene with him is when he asks Peach about Mario's weakness. Peach can just answer helpful items in response to Bowser's questions, and Bowser will stupidly believe all of her choices and order Cammy to go put them in Mario's path. Cammy says that Peach can't be trusted, but Bowser says to just do it anyway. These items then go on to actually show up in gameplay, 
and what could potentially be a strong enemy can instead just be an item for Mario to pick up. Bowser's final boss battle has him fight in some sort of arena he constructed that apparently further amplifies his power. I don't know why he needs that when he has the Star Rod that lets him do anything, but whatever, maybe he wished for it with the Star Rod. His boss fight has him try to stun Mario's partner with his magic attacks. And he's the most durable opponent in the game with his 99 HP and his ability to heal himself with 30 HP. 30 HP is a lot. When other bosses heal, it's possible to outdamage the healing with Mario's turn that he gets, making it a net loss. But 30 is so much, there's no way you're gonna outdamage that. The most inventive gimmick he has is his stomp attack, which will temporarily disable one of Mario's options if Mario does not block it. In combination with stunning partners for a few turns with the shockwave attack, he's pretty good at disabling you. The only issue with this boss fight is the gimmick of the Star Rod where he uses it to make himself invincible. Mario can instantly undo it by using the Star Spirits. This costs Bowser and Mario a turn, while giving a completely free turn to Mario's partner. So it's really stupid mechanically, and it basically is just him taunting the player. Because it's so obvious to immediately get rid of Bowser's invincibility status, a lot of people don't even know about the side effect of him doing this. I didn't until I looked it up online. While invincible, Bowser is actually powered up with star energy and deals double damage which is legitimately very scary if he gets an attack off with it. Unfortunately, nobody ever sees this because it always gets immediately dispelled before he can perform an attack. This is pretty much just an easter egg. Unfortunately, promo doesn't do all that much to change this boss mechanically, they kind of just buff the numbers and call it a day. But Master Quest actually does try to address this invincibility issue. When he's under a certain HP threshold, Bowser will attack after making himself invincible to actually make use of that power boost, making it a huge threat rather than just a positive for the player every time Bowser uses it. That's pretty much the only thing they needed to actually make the fight work. The base game fight is pretty much already there, it just needed that one tiny tweak. Bowser's most powerful attack, healing himself, has surprisingly complex AI for how it gets used. Of course, Bowser is more likely to use it if he's at low HP, but surprisingly, he's also more likely to use it if Mario is at high HP. This means Bowser will not waste an opportunity to kill Mario if he's at low HP, and will go to try finish him off. On the other hand, if just damaging Mario is largely pointless, Bowser will heal himself up to stay in for the long haul. Most of the bosses in the game use very basic attack patterns, so this is a pretty cool little quirk. It also makes life much more complicated for speedrunners, which gives the game a lot more longevity that way. Bowser brings his A-game for the music in this title. His castle and fight themes are some of the best themes he's ever had out of the many tracks in his expansive collection. While Bowser does command a lot of respect, I'm still going to lower his threat level a bit here because the ridiculous amount of plot holes with how he could have better used the Star Rod to his advantage though. Yeah, it's kind of not entirely Bowser's fault just because the Star Rod is a very poorly defined plot artifact, but I'm gonna say he's still partially to blame. Bowser is a side character in Thousand Year Door rather than the main villain, but he's definitely still a bad guy. After each chapter is over, you get a segment where you play as Bowser for what mostly amounts to an interactive cutscene. The Bowser segments get some of the funniest dialogue in the game, with Bowser given some bizarre choices where he can claim to be a businessman of legend, a senile old man, or go on about how he loves fried eggs. The first segment sets the tone for him when he's in his castle, and he can insult all of his minions who talk about him behind his back, but cower in fear whenever he's in their presence. If Bowser isn't directly terrorizing people, he's always at least got something insulting to say about the crazy people he meets along his way. To emphasize the parody angle even more, Bowser gets brief playable Super Mario Bros. style levels where he can become giant and crush over everything in his path by eating it up pieces of meat. These segments were actually used as the basis for Super Paper Mario's gameplay, so they definitely left a strong impression on a lot of people. Ignoring the questionable quality of Super Paper Mario's gameplay, it's still impressive that they inspired an entire game. 
as far as what Bowser's actually doing in the story, he's following behind Mario's adventure, always several steps behind him. At first, he claims he doesn't care what Mario's doing and says that he isn't Mario's babysitter and he doesn't want to follow him around everywhere. However, when he learns about Peach and the treasure at stake, he decides to become proactive and chase after him. Making Bowser into a proactive character is a significant improvement from him sitting around in a castle doing nothing but waiting for Mario to come and kill him in the vast majority of his appearances. He's pretty much going on his own adventure here to try to find the Crystal Stars. Yes, he's primarily played for comic relief, but I'd say you can also take it more seriously than the vast majority of comic relief villains despite how much of a bumbler he is. While he's primarily used for comic relief, he's not some pushover. They establish that he's still very strong. He gets to encounter several of the game's main antagonists throughout his segments. He manages to defeat Rockhawk in a single attack, laughing at how pathetic he is and calling him a chicken nugget. He goes on to have a duel against Crump, and when Crump summons his ridiculously large army of minions, Bowser responds in kind by calling in the Koopa Troop, either to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. Bowser even manages to get in the last hit on a weakened Grotus, upstaging him and taking the credit. The vast majority of stories like this would have the main villain of the game beat up Bowser to show how powerful they are, including in the case of several of the other good Mario RPG titles, where characters like Popple, Count Black, Exor, and Cacletta all use Bowser to their advantage. This game is the only real case where Bowser is treated respectfully by the game's plot when he's not the main villain or a main character. Bowser does manage to finally catch up to Mario twice in the game for two boss battles. The first one is in the Glitz Pit, and he will show up after a random Major League fight to attack him without giving him a chance to heal. Based on random arbitrary conditions given onto that fight by Grubba and who the enemies are, the enemies can significantly soften Mario up for Bowser. His boss battle was otherwise really simplistic, but he set up well to be able to finish off a weakened player. His most important attack is his ability to get rid of the command options by butt-stopping on Mario, as well as to stun his partners. These are both recurring attacks from the first game. His numbers are too weak here to accomplish much due to the game's easy difficulty, but it makes the encounter at least a bit more memorable than something like Brockhawk's generic fight. Bowser shows up as the second to last boss in the game, again showing up directly after another encounter. He falls through the ceiling and lands on Grotus, and loudly says that any finale without a Bowser appearance is cruddy. This is one of the hardest bosses in the game because of it taking place immediately after another fight. This time it's Grotus, who is an actually legitimately difficult boss battle. Some weaker players have to grind star points so that they level up between the two fights to heal. Although it is still perfectly doable without going out of your way to do that, this is still Paper Mario we're talking about here, basically the easiest RPG that's not Pokemon. The fight is mostly made difficult because of Cammy fighting alongside Bowser. It's rare that Bowser ever fights alongside other characters, but when he does, it makes for some of his best material, such as with Antasma, Popple, or his younger self, all in the Mario and Luigi series. Unlike those fights, this feels like a much more logical version of how Bowser would fight normally, rather than an episodic character by his side. Cammy technically only shows up in two games, but she's obviously supposed to represent Kamek. Bowser comes across as similar to Junior Troopa in that his constant failures throughout his misadventures are played for comedy. In particular, there's one segment where Bowser falls into the ocean and has to claw his way back to land. The punchline is stronger than with Junior Troopa, though, because Bowser has another character to bounce off of with Cammy rather than just talking to himself. The two of them were trying to go to the Glitz Pit, but Cammy managed to make it there by going the ordinary way and taking the blimp. She goes on about how much fun she had while Bowser was stuck crawling along the underwater level at a snail's pace, prompting Bowser to take out his anger on her. Bowser does hit up most of the correct locations and even finds not one, but two fake crystal stars. So it's reasonable to say that if he had more accurate information, that he could get the Crystal Stars himself if he wasn't so late to the party. Which really isn't any fault of his own. Bowser makes it all the way to the finale before getting defeated. But it might be a blessing in disguise for him that he didn't reach the end. It doesn't exactly take much change to the plot for Bowser to be the one to unlock the Shadow Queen's chest instead of Grotus. And I can see a change to the plot where Bowser gets possessed by the generic end boss like he does in several other RPG titles, including the Tanabe trilogy. The fact he goes out on his own terms, despite not being the main villain, is significantly more respectful to him than you'd expect. 
As far as how he does numbers-wise, Bowser scores decently across the board. But the highlight is definitely the comedy. People quoted him for years after Thousand Year Door's release. And Bowser in this game is one of the main reasons why people hated him becoming such a generic character in Sticker Star and Color Splash. Huff and Puff is probably the best villain in the series in terms of making the most of the minimal screen time he's given. But unfortunately, he only really appears to be fought, and that's the end of it. I would say his chapter is one of the worst of the original game, being a long series of hallways. It's mostly just saved by having him at the end of it as an amazing end boss. Huff and Puff is trying to pollute the land of flower fields with his machine to make more clouds, which he considers a paradise for himself. This is killing the nature in the area, and that nature consists of living, talking plant people, so it's pretty evil. He just wants to relax in the clouds like it's some kind of sauna, so it's not like he's getting all that much out of it. Most of the chapter involves Mario gathering seeds to make a magic beanstalk to reach Huff and Puff up in the clouds. When you do finally reach him, he'll talk about how angry he is that Mario destroyed his cloud-making machine and continue on in his dialogue to say that while Bowser has ordered him to kill Mario, he hates him and would kill him even if he hadn't told him to. Now, the unique thing about this dialogue scene is that it actually changes if Black Lester is the current partner out. Huff and Puff will address him directly and scold him for his betrayal, and he even uses his old gangster name, Spike. This is a really minor change, and the dialogue isn't in depth or anything, but it's a really nice touch when his dialogue is so minimal otherwise. By comparison, Shadow Queen and Beldam never acknowledge Vivian again once she joins Mario's party. The dialogue doesn't change if she's out. They could really use some unique dialogue to address her if she was present during cutscenes involving them. The other thing about this pre-fight scene is there's a custom music track just for this little bit here the one you've been listening to. It plays for less than a minute and then it's over. Other bosses in the game have this issue, but this prelude theme is really great it's a shame it's wasted. Chapter 6 in particular is full of great wasted music. There's a really great theme that plays when the sun is sad for what's a rather unimportant room, and a really good generic fight theme when fighting some random moles on another screen. Huff and Puff's fight theme, of course, is also really good and his fight is the reason he's this high when he has so little screen time. As Huff and Puff is attacked, pieces of his fluffy cloud body get knocked out of himself, which are called Tough Puffs. The Tough Puffs are sentient despite being part of his body, and clearly seem to have wills of their own. Huff and Puff converses with his minions throughout the fight, and they ask for permission to attack and refer to Huff and Puff as Master Huff and Puff. Now, what's great about these guys is that Huff and Puff can suck them back into his body to heal himself, considering they're literally just parts of his body. At the same time, though, the Tough Puffs are sentient and scream and protest as they get merged back into him. They're clearly not liking this at all. These guys just came into existence a few seconds ago, and now they're going to lose their consciousness and join the hive mind. Being a Tough Puff is not a great life. Aside from being hilarious characterization that's way better than similar bosses like Smorg and Atomic Boo, it's an amazing gameplay gimmick for Huff and Puff. This mechanic forces players to do area of effect damage after hitting Huff and Puff to destroy his Tough Puffs while damaging him also. Though even doing that will cause more Tough Puffs to be produced after you kill the last few. Huff and Puff absorbs the minions on a set pattern. So you can try to deal as much damage as possible to him right after Huff and Puff absorbs a previous batch of Tough Puffs. Only ten of them can be out at a time, so all of the other ones will just fall off into the clouds uselessly. Another secret to this fight that isn't immediately obvious is that the Tough Puffs come in two sizes, with one being slightly chunkier than the other one. Each big one represents two damage dealt to Huff and Puff and will heal him of two damage when absorbed, while the small ones only heal one damage. This means Bow Slap Attack, which does several hits of one, can be a strategy to only produce weak Tough Puffs so that he heals less, before trying to just damage him as much as possible. Huff Puff can heal up to 20 HP with 10 big Tough Puffs, so there's a lot of interesting counterplay to this mechanic. There are multiple ways to play around Huff and Puff rather than just a direct counter to him, like so many of the other worst bosses in this series. 
The game is easy enough that you can also just try to brute force him without addressing his tough buffs at all, which can be viable too. Compared to other bosses who have many ways to just generically counter them instantly, especially in the Tanabe trilogy, you can see how interesting this boss is on purely a mechanical level. I'm not talking about a hack here, this is the actual base game fight and it's great. Hufflepuff has a nice series of attacks and generally good damage output. His most notable attack is the ability to charge up electricity before firing it at Mario, where you have to use Bow to shield yourself and avoid it. While it's easy enough to shield, this means less time to attack Hufflepuff before his next round of absorbing the minions back into himself and not doing the damage you did. While it's easy enough to shield it with Bow, this means less time to attack Hufflepuff before it cycles back around to the part where he absorbs the tough puffs back into his body and heals himself. Huff and Puff has an extremely rare attack that is only triggered if he has 5 HP or less, has tough puffs out, and isn't currently charged with electricity. Considering he has 60 HP, it's very rare he'll be at that threshold under all those conditions and get a turn. If he does, though, players will be in for a nasty surprise as he goes into a final desperation attack, going up into the air and slamming the ground with all of his tough puffs together in a last-ditch attack to cause an earthquake. The damage scales based on how many tough puffs he has, so having them out will still punish players even if he couldn't reabsorb them at that time. After all, Huff and Puff is at 5 HP, so it's not likely he can outlast the player at that point. So the last ditch attack is definitely the right call for him, and it makes the tough puffs be relevant even when he's low. Huff and Puff is the least edited of any of the main boss fights in his rematches in promo. The boss is already so mechanically solid, there's not much you really need to do besides just generically buffing his numbers. It's basically the only fight that didn't need to be fixed. Some of his tough puffs will be intangible, which makes some sense given their cloudy nature and is kind of cool, meaning that killing them all with area of effect attacks won't deny all of their healing and makes him a lot harder. In the Master Quest hack, not just the promo, they take this another step further. Here, Huff and Puff will become enraged if you dodge his lightning attacks by going intangible, and then he'll go intangible himself, shouting, How'd you like your own technique being used against you? While Huff and Puff doesn't have a lot of on-screen time, this definitely feels like something he'd do, if you ask me. You can remove his intangibility and that of his minions with the Star Rod, and by comparison to other bosses who get completely destroyed by it, I'd say it's relatively balanced when you're fighting him. You're still wasting precious time to do it, which means he's just gonna get more healing. Now, by dodging Huff and Puff's lightning attack, you waste the partner's turn, and then Mario's turn also by having to get rid of the status effect. So you come out entirely even, you don't get any more damage on him. It gets to the point it becomes a viable strategy to just tank the lightning despite the massive amount of damage it deals. Do not underestimate Huff and Puff. For how amazing his boss fight is, Huff and Puff could really have done with some more screen time before he appeared. He's at least mentioned by a lot of characters before he shows up, but it still would be nice to see him directly. The man can fly, so it's not like it'd be unrealistic for him to come down from his sun sauna to check up on how progress is going with his cloud machine or something. Just any appearance from him before his boss fight is all I'm really asking for here. Gratis is the leader of the X-Knots. For the vast majority of the game, he never leaves his base and is only seen in intermissions between chapters. Gratis sends out his minions to do his dirty work for him while he plans things out. Most of his dialogue is constant remarks about how he's surrounded by idiots. While he regularly calls his minions fools, a lot of the time it's not something that needs to be explicitly said. Gratis is the only one in the room not using words like, DUDE. Gratis is the only one there who can be taken seriously, having to tell Peach that we x dots are not all lollipops and rainbows, you know. Gratis has to tell his minions multiple times to handle Peach carefully. He doesn't actually care about Peach at all, of course, but he needs her intact to use as a host for the Shadow Queen. He doesn't even bother to tell them about his plans as to what he needs Peach for, managing to keep that a tightly guarded secret. Even when Peach disguises herself as an ex knot and confronts Gratis about it directly, Gratis is competent enough to not divulge any information where a less competent villain might gloat needlessly. Gratis fully shows how little he cares about her when he finally confronts Mario at the end of the game, at which point he uses Peach as a hostage inside the bubble. He will outright attack her if Mario refuses to back off. 
you get a yes no prompt. And if you say no, Gratis electrocutes her. Unfortunately for Gratis, he is extremely unlucky. Not only are most of his minions very incompetent, he gets betrayed by his only particularly competent ones. Beldam and her Shadow Sirens work for Gratis, but Beldam is just using him to free her real boss, the Shadow Queen. Gratis knows about the Shadow Queen, but believes that she is bound to serve whoever frees her, as apparently that's what Beldam told him. This is definitely incompetent on his part. There's no getting around that, and the Shadow Queen executes him for it, decapitating him in what is impressively brutal for a Mario game. He's not really dead because he's some kind of robot man. Managing to survive is just a head when he's seen in the epilogue. Thinking about this from Gratis's perspective, if what Beldam said was true, why would she let Gratis wake the Shadow Queen up and not just do it herself? For how much Gratis likes to plan things, he really should have anticipated some kind of betrayal from the Shadow Sirens, even if he didn't necessarily expect one from the Shadow Queen directly. It's pretty humiliating for his character, but this is the only error he's really made and he suffered heavily for it. The rest is just him being unlucky. For what Gratis' role is in the story, he could easily have been subverted much harder, though. He's not betrayed until literally the final boss room as a reveal at the very end of the game, and he still manages to get a boss battle. I can easily picture a lesser game skip out on giving Gratis a boss battle at all, or potentially have him get overthrown by Beldam before the finale. Gratis' fight itself is quite memorable, and while Crump gets far more fights than him, Gratis is generally much more difficult of the two x knots Gratis summons two tiny computer chip minions per turn, which each boosts his defense by one, and if he gets out four, he becomes invincible. Combining this ability with his ability to raise his evasion and counter-attacks, he can be surprisingly durable for his somewhat pathetic amount of health. And he has strong magic from his staff to back himself up, too. It's pretty interesting that despite appearing to be the most robotic of all the x dots Gratis is the only one of them to use magic in the otherwise technology-based faction, making him come across as pretty intelligent. His musical themes are always very robotic-sounding, but that kind of helps his technology and magic theming come together. After his fight is over, Gratis stops before he's totally defeated, making it clear that he could go on a little bit longer if he had to. He uses Peach as a hostage and forces Mario to do what he wants. He can't actually do anything to Peach, but it's not like Mario knows that, so Gratis is smart to take advantage of it. Bowser eventually falls from the ceiling to crush Gratis after his boss battle is over, and Bowser has the extreme luxury of fighting Mario after Gratis has weakened him. I'd say that Gratis is the harder boss of the two. Bowser is only more difficult just because he's given the extremely luxurious position of cleaning up after Gratis has softened Mario up. Again, Bowser literally just falling on top of and crushing Gratis could have also easily killed him, but the fact Gratis managed to survive and recover from that and escape with Peach while Bowser and Mario were busy fighting is seriously impressive. This ending sequence is pretty competent for what appears to be a villain who likes to stay behind the scenes. If Beldam had been telling the truth and the Shadow Queen would just obey whoever freed her, Gratis would easily win. Gratis originally wants to get all the Crystal Stars to open the door directly, but he eventually realizes after constant failures from his minions that's not realistically happening so he just opts to let Mario do it for him. He decides to betray the bulk of his minions after they've been nothing but useless to him. He leaves the only crystal star his faction ever got inside the size of the moon base to be guarded by Crump, while correctly predicting that Crump will fail. That is pretty sweet revenge on his group of people who he so blatantly hates. At this point, Beldam is the only person left who Gratis is actually aligned with. After Crump is defeated, the base is set to self-destruct, Crump clearly isn't the one to cause that, given he's blown into space when his mech is destroyed. The intention here seems to be for Gratis to kill Mario when he takes the Crystal Star inside of his base. You might think that's a plot hole at first, because then the Crystal Stars would get blown up along with Mario, but there are several different possibilities here. You could say Gratis intended for Mario to escape, but I don't think that's the case. After the base is blown up, you can go back to it later on and somehow miraculously is still standing. Tech, the ship's computer, 
doesn't even know how that happened and writes it off as a miracle. The reason the base hasn't actually blown up is because the developers just didn't want to delete a dungeon from the game and wanted to allow the player to still backtrack there if they wanted to. But with all of the other silly technology in the game, I can believe the explosion didn't technically destroy the base and just killed all living people inside or something. Yeah, there's still X dots when you go back, but Gratus is clearly a robot. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that all of the X dots are also robots. During the self-destruct sequence, the generic enemies in the way don't act like anything is out of the ordinary. So maybe they just know they're going to survive? Alternatively, the teleporter in and out of the base still works. So maybe some of the off-site X-Dots returned to the base after the so-called explosion. Regardless, this detail was a pretty nasty trick to try to kill Mario. When Beldam's group goes on to later betray Gratis, they only do so at the very end of the game. Duplus disguises himself as Frankly and convinces Mario to open the Thousand Year Door. There's no reason to believe that Gratis wasn't in on this part of the plan, as it was his intention to give Mario all of the Crystal Stars. He's a participant all the way up until the end. Despite him being robbed of main villain status at the last second, he's a very believable character who's constantly trying to do everything in his power to further his goals. He goes really above and beyond for what you could ask for from this character archetype. The man always makes the most of what he's been given, as he's very unlucky. Most of his minions are useless. His only minions that aren't lead to his demise are Join Mario. His own computer betrays him. And during his moment of triumph, a random obese turtle falls on him for no reason. You can't help but feel kinda sorry for Gratis. One of the controversial elements of the game over time has been Gratis' computer tech. You really don't have to read between the lines much to see if the computer wants to romance Peach, trying to dance with her through a hologram as he demands Peach teach him about the concept of love. That would be innocent enough, but with how often Peach takes off her clothes, a lot of people wonder about what the computer is seeing with the ship's cameras. The computer is particularly insistent when telling Peach to change into an x dot costume, so it's not exactly difficult to see a narrative of an evil, lust-filled computer. Understandably, a lot of people have grown to despise Tech's character over the years. The only person who ever meaningfully interacts with Tech besides Peach is Gratis. Tech is apparently Gratis's computer, but that doesn't necessarily mean Gratis personally programmed Tech with all of this nonsense. Tech directly helps Peach by giving her information about Gratis's plans and allows her to send messages to Mario, which Gratis would obviously disapprove of. For what is probably the most universally hated character of Thousand Year Door, it is very satisfying for Gratis to finally come in and seemingly execute Tech by wiping his memory clean. This is the first time we've seen Gratis outside of his usual throne room backdrop, and it's right before he leaves the base, so it's a pretty memorable moment. Peach is crying about how cruel Gratis is in mourning Tech's death, while Gratis is saying how stupid it is for Peach to be mourning the death of a computer. While Tech does survive the base exploding somehow and partially regains his memories, some parts of it are still clearly damaged by the explosion, as he has no idea how the base survived. When no explanation is given to us, and Tech having no idea how the base magically came back, I think Tech is just a poorly programmed piece of garbage, and Gratis planned all of this out from the start. Tech later claims he was the one who blew up the base to stop it from being used for further evil during this scene, but earlier he barely claims he had the power to turn on the teleporter. So how does he have the power to destroy the entire base? Which one is it, Tech? Stop lying. Even if we go along with this line of logic, it's not much of a stretch to say Gratis reprogrammed Tech to detonate the base anyway. Gratis gets as high of a score as he reasonably can for someone who gets betrayed at the end of the story. The only thing you could really ask of him is to show up outside of his base more than a single time, or just more screen time in general. I'm not counting the x not Fortress theme in his music score. It never plays during the Peach interludes where you see Gratis. If anything, that's more of Crump's theme because he's the head of the dungeon. Shame for Gratis, because that's probably my favorite theme in the game, quite possibly. Gratis' personal theme is very fitting, but it's not something I'd ever listen to outside of the game. He also shares an evil laugh with one of the most famous villains in gaming, Darkseid Phil. So that's got to count for something, right?
Hump is the primary face of the Extants, and he's by far the most recurring antagonist in Thousand Year Door. If you count his fight as the first tutorial boss of the game, you have to fight the man a grand total of four times. The only other character who can compete with him as far as quantity of encounters is Duplis, but most of Duplis's fights are all contained within his chapter, whereas Crumps are all spread throughout the game, making it definitive that Crump recurs the most. He's the final boss of three out of eight chapters, what more do you want from this man? Crump is definitely more on the comedic side, as his constant screen time means that he inevitably ends up failing a lot, but he's up against the player character. Of course he's gonna fail like everyone else does. He generally comes across pretty competent, managing to take over the Great Tree and turn it into a technological marvel, while managing to make a political alliance with the generic bugs in the tree against the punies. Of course, he doesn't actually care about those guys, this is just an alliance of opportunity, as he goes on to set up a time bomb to blow up the entire tree that's going to dispose of his so-called allies in the process. More importantly, the man is also going to sacrifice his fellow Exot troops so he doesn't tell about the impending countdown, leaving them behind to stall Mario's progress, just to try to make sure he doesn't escape the explosion. Crump relies upon and abuses his minions so heavily that it comes across as his strongest character trait. While Gratis is the leader of the Exots, Gratis never fights alongside them while Crump is constantly seen commanding them. In the very intro of the game, Crump already summons a massive quantity of these things to try to beat Mario up. And Mario is so weak at that point that he probably could kill him with those minions if Mario didn't give him the slip. It's definitely a very strong and memorable intro to Thousand Year Door. Crump's excessive minions is by far the most strain that gets put onto the game engine. And it actually takes advantage of the paper art style beyond just saying, Hey everybody, Mario is made out of paper, isn't that just so wacky? Crump uses his minions to fight against Bowser, like we talked about in the Bowser section, and also Cortez the Pirate King, having a horde of minions who can barely all fit onto his ship he has so many of them. At first they fight in a formation and launch themselves forwards, but then they come down from the ceiling. They imitate Rockhawk's attack here by raining props down onto Mario, or even their own bodies. It is a lot more tonally appropriate here when it's a bunch of pathetic minions rather than when Rockhawk is doing it, if you ask me. The big highlight attack, though, is when Crump gathers a giant group of x dots to the point he's practically drowning in them, then goes to form them into a giant paper ball of minion death and rolls it over at Mario. That's gotta be the single most hilarious attack of the game, 10 out of 10 from me. The minion ball attack is so memorable that it was ripped off in a hat in time where the boss literally calls it Mafia Ball. It's still great, but I'll say it looks a lot better in Paper Mario's art style by comparison to here. If you're not convinced a hat in time ripped off Crump, this fan animation turns it back from the Mafia boss to Crump again, and it works 100% perfectly. Crump's other boss fights have him fight inside of his mech, which he calls Magnus Von Grapple. When he first gets into it, he asks Mario if he's crying yet, saying that his mech tends to have that effect on people, before jokingly saying that it isn't armed with tissues. These mech fights are considerably more standard fare than his fight on the pirate ship, but they're still good. Crop most heavily uses the paper gimmick of any of the game's characters, as his mech seems to be made out of origami and folds out of it into its main form. He has some cool attacks with detachable arms and a giant drill. In his first fight, the entire audience is x dots cheering him on even though he killed them all a few seconds ago. In the second fight, the x dots seems to be tired of being abused and wisely do not come into the audience in bulk, with the audience being normal. That said, a few crump loyalists do manage to still show up to cheer their boss on, and then suffer the consequences of their poor decision. Crump sucks up the audience to use his live ammo, including any stray x dots in the audience, before firing them into Mario painfully. It clearly does more damage to the hostages than to Mario, who takes one damage per hit. Crump eventually decides to make use of Mario gathering all the crystal stars by going undercover. While in disguise, Crump joins Mario's crew of shipmates to go hunting for a lost treasure and the fifth crystal star on an island. Somehow, his disguise manages to fool everybody in typical comic relief fashion. One of the funniest lines of the game here is when he breaks the fourth wall and loudly says that the viewer knows who he is, but not to tell Mario. Mario and his partner even hear and comment on this, but they still don't figure out Crump's identity somehow and just dismiss Crump as a crazed lunatic talking to people in front of TVs. Regardless of this questionable choice on Crump's part, he's at least no longer considered a threat, 
and manages to silently follow Mario through the pirate's grotto while Mario kills off all the enemies for him. He loudly shows up at the end, saying that he's rooting for Mario to get the Crystal Star. Of course, this is just so he can steal it directly after Mario fights the Pirate King, and is one of the more competent plans rather than just relying on brute force. After this, he goes on to have his pirate ship fight, and apparently everybody is still so stupid that they believe he's their friend until he spells it out for them by shredding his disguise. He outright starts to get frustrated at how easy they are to fool. The only time Crump isn't terribly competent is when fighting Mario in the moon base, but he's largely just set up to fail there by Gratis. As opposed to coming up with any new plan of his own, he's just following orders and defending the base, so of course he fails. The last we see of him, the man somehow survives being shot into space and shows up in the epilogue. I guess it's cartoon paper space that Mario also manages to travel through without freezing to death, so I won't hold that too much against the game. In any case, Trump gets off much better than his poor boss in the game's ending. Crump and Gratis both have titles. They go by Lord Crump and Sir Gratis, respectively. Which of those two titles sounds more imposing? It doesn't change the fact that Gratis is still the leader, but it makes it sound like Crump self-appointed his Lord title because he wanted to sound important, which is pretty funny to me. He also wears that cape to try to look more Lord-like, probably, since he looks a lot more like a bog-standard x dot grunt than Gratis's more distinctive design. This isn't a knock against him. It helps to add some more character to him. Most of Thousand Year Door's villains have unique laughs in their text. Crump's is probably the most memorable of them just because of how often he does it. With how it's typed, there's a gag where he will sometimes get his laugh interrupted and ended with a huh? with a question mark at the end, which is pretty funny. While none of the characters in this game are voiced directly, Crump is the closest one to getting a voice line. I'm pretty sure this little part of his overworld theme is supposed to be a signature laugh. It repeats it over and over as a primary song motif before the laugh becomes more and more direct. Adding to the mechanical aesthetic in all of the x Not music, Crump's theme also contains a direct audio sample from Pac-Man, using the Pac-Man death sound effect as part of the song. While he's not as competent as his boss, He's definitely the most humorous of the original Paper Mario villains and is a more constant thorn in Mario's side by comparison to Gratis. If Gratis left the base more than just the one time, I could have seen myself rank him over Crump, but as is, I think Crump is the better choice. Score-wise, Crump pretty much has no weaknesses in any category besides maybe threat level. He's more competent than he's given credit for, but the fact he's constantly insulted by Gratis so much and never argues against it means I can't give him a perfect score for that. Regardless, solid villain. As someone who's not normally a big fan of girly girl characters, Mimi is easily the best villain who comes to mind of that archetype in pretty much any form of media and she's certainly light years ahead of her competitor from the Mario series, Wendy Koopa. She has all the stereotypical traits of that character archetype, like being the only character who ever changes clothes because of her fashion obsession, and the first costume you see her in is a maid outfit. Her introductory scene does not actually reveal her design because of the fact she's a shapeshifter. She at first shows up as O-Chunks, and manages to trick both the audience and the characters in the universe that she's him just as a quick prank. She spends the rest of her conversation just transforming into random characters just to show off, leaving her primary appearance as a mystery. When she does show up to antagonize Mario, Mimi has quite the villain saga where she pretends to be the maid of the magician Mario is coming to see. You don't know who she is yet, so you don't technically have any reason to think she's lying. Upon talking to Mario, she keeps telling him that the person he's here to see is at the end of very, very long and unsuspicious hallways which are in actuality death traps intended to kill him, of course. When you confront her about this afterward, she just ignores it and tells you to go into another death trap room. If you still keep talking to her after going into every single room, of course she just says, oh, You didn't look closely enough, you should go into another one! Because Mario is a mute protagonist, he just comes across as pretty stupid to not question any of this, but it makes for a funny sequence. 
After that, Mimi sets up a vase for Mario to break by placing it on a question mark block, which is apparently just irresistible for Mario to hit, causing him to break the vase. Mimi feigns outrage and says that Mario must work off his debt he's made from breaking it, forcing him into a life of servitude to give her one million rubies. Mario can earn these rubies by running on a treadmill or even a hamster wheel to generate electricity. What makes this section so amazing is the fact that Mimi apparently has pulled this exact trick dozens if not hundreds of times because there are many, many other slaves inside of this area who are also paying off their debt to Mimi for breaking bases apparently. There are even slave drivers with whips forcing them to run on the track. You need to bribe the other slaves to get information to get better working conditions. It is technically possible to earn the 1 million rubies entirely through honest slave labor, which would take about 24 real-life hours. But the intended path is to break into Mimi's safe and steal her rubies before giving them back to her. There is absolutely no reason to pay her with rubies from slave labor. The only reason they're useful is to bribe other slaves. Giving them to Mimi is just flushing them down the drain, pretty much. Hilariously, if you go to pay Mimi enough times, Eventually, the ruby counter will stop ticking down entirely. This serves the gameplay purpose of telling the player that they're not supposed to be doing the slave work. But it's also really funny that the 1 million rubies is apparently not even enough for Mimi. She intends to keep these people in slavery forever. What's more, this mansion is in fact the house of the magician that Mimi was pretending to be a maid of. And she only recently kidnapped and restrained her inside of this place. This means that whole slavery business started up in just a matter of days, and she's got it all running like clockwork by the time Mario shows up. Her next move is to disguise herself as Burly the Magician with her shape-shifting power, and she offers to just give Mario the generic artifact of power he's after as agreed. So long as Mario is willing to pay 10 million rubies. Mimi obviously wants to send Mario back to the slave camp, but luckily for him, the real Merle shows up and they have a scuffle over who the real one is. They're given the opportunity to interview the two of them and must make the decision as to which one is real. Asking questions on personal taste will generally always have Mimi give weird or disgusting answers. Now, after all of that, she's ready to fight. And to do that, she goes under a very interesting transformation. She rotates her head as you can hear the sound of her dislocated neck. Then her head spins around, transforms, and sprouts giant spider legs. Mimi really has no shortage of powers. It even has a brief horror movie monster chase sequence before going into her boss battle properly. Of course, this is Super Paper Mario, so the boss is still incredibly pathetic and easy, but the presentation and transformation makes this stick out very positively compared to the rest of the game's lackluster bosses. She does get to recur a lot throughout the game, and she even gets to fight in her regular form without turning into a spider. This is honestly her hardest fight rather than any of the ones in the monster form. She's able to summon and levitate rubies, which she gets to excessively use as projectiles, as well as as a protective shield around her body. Her final fight, where she uses the spider form again, also has her make use of the rubies. The fact that she uses those things to attack is pretty funny in that it's tying back to her most memorable moment with her slave camp. She has millions of these rubies, she may as well put the things to use, right? Her final fight takes place in Castle Blick, which is monochromatic and has a black background. This causes Mimi's black spider legs to blend into the background, but makes it a lot more awkward to tell where she is. I have no idea if this is actually an intentional design decision or not, but it does add just a tinge of difficulty, which is very needed when this game's boss fights are so very easy. Before you fight Mimi in the castle, she pretends to be Merlin, disguising herself as him with her shape-shifting. She yells out to Mario to hit the totally unsuspicious ordinary block in the way, which is of course a trap that will send him into a pit. If you talk to her after this, she has a shockingly massive amount of lines she'll say if you keep talking to her over and over, as she desperately and pathetically attempts to try to convince you to hit the block. Eventually, she breaks the fourth wall at the end by telling you that this is one of those times you have to do an arbitrary thing to progress by setting a flag. It's really funny. I obviously wanted to find footage of this dialogue in the game, but I was shocked I couldn't find anyone in all the many playthroughs that I looked up who actually bothers to talk to her more than once. They all just take her word for it and immediately hit the stupid block like idiots. That in of itself is pretty funny to me. Apparently this trap was a good idea. Mimi also uses her shape-shifting powers to disguise herself as the King of Samar Kingdom, 
When she loses her fight in regular form there, she reveals that her intention was just to stall for time so that Count Black's spell to destroy the world can be finished. Now, this is often a cliché in video games like Pokémon, where the grunts will just say they were just stalling for time for a plan that never even comes into fruition. Here in Super Paper Mario, though, considering the fact that Black does in fact destroy the world successfully, Mimi stalling for time did in fact matter, which is kind of competent in a way you wouldn't expect. It also helps to justify how easy a boss fight it is for once, since they're all easy, but she technically accomplished what she set out to do here. The only bad things I can say about Mimi is that she is blindly loyal to Count Black, and she gets her redemption despite how ridiculously evil she is when she just becomes a maid for real after the game is over, which seems pretty wildly out of character. However, this is just what she says. We all know she's a compulsive liar, as proven time and time again. If you analyze her to get Titron's thoughts on her, the mechanical butterfly doesn't believe anything Mimi is saying and assumes this is all just a plot to get some kind of manservants at her beck and call. I mean, she's not even in the maid getup this time. It seems pretty clear-cut that she's lying, and that she did not get a redemption. And for a villain this despicable, it's definitely a good thing she did not get redeemed. That would not be even remotely believable. She's just kind of riding the wave as this whole debacle between Count Black and Dementio happens at the end. She's just kind of caught in the crossfire, and she has to do her best to bounce back from this gigantic mess. As far as how Mimi scores, she does well in pretty much every category. A 4 may not look like much in the boss fight department, but by the standards of Super Paper Mario, a 4 is a fantastic score. Her music is mediocre at best, but I will say I wouldn't put her any higher on the list even if she did have a good theme. These scores aren't the end-all be-all. Mimi is an amazing villain and very much deserves her position in the top 5, but the characters above her are even better. The start of Duplis' chapter comes across shockingly serious by comparison to the rest of the game. Duplis terrorizes Twilight Town from his comfy perch in his steeple. Whenever the bell strikes, Duplis uses his shape-shifting powers to hex a random citizen of the town into a pig, after which they stay like that forever. Everyone is constantly terrified of when the clock's gonna strike next, and if they will be the next one turned into a pig. The game brings up realistic cases of what would happen from something like this and doesn't shy away from it at all. People can't sleep at night because they're terrified about when they or their loved ones might next be turned into pigs. The working father of a family gets turned into one and his family is struggling to survive and is starving to death. The wife asks for some food, and when you give her some, Duplis turns her into a pig also. The children then start wondering if pigs taste good, given they have nobody else to provide for them thinking about eating their own parents. You can argue it's played just as much as a gag with the game's tone, but if that's not serious, I don't really know what is. This isn't the only time it comes up, with another guy saying he ate bacon before this, but that he will give it up if he doesn't get turned into a pig. It's not unrealistic to say somebody might have gotten eaten by accident. Another woman calls her husband a pig as an insult, then he gets turned into a literal pig making her regret her actions and feel horrible about herself. The 3D models for the pigs help to make them look more out of place and spooky, by comparison to the paper sprites used for normal characters. It's worth bringing up the only time these pig models were used before was in the original Paper Mario. There, they're just on a farm used for getting rare items and aren't supposed to be anything out of the ordinary, just regular pigs. Paper Mario takes place before Thousand Year Door, so you could extrapolate and say that some of these weird-looking 3D pigs could also be citizens from Twilight Town, ex by Duplis. They certainly don't look like the normal paper people. Once Duplis is confronted, he doesn't exactly look intimidating for all of that great build-up he has. His reasoning for turning the villagers into pigs basically amounts to him being bored. When he's fought, he comes across as pathetic even by the standards of the game's very low difficulty. The only attempt to use his shape-shifting gimmick is when he copies Mario and just generically jumps on him, which isn't particularly useful. However, Duplis is intentionally throwing the fight and has no intention of defeating the adventurers through brute force. As he's defeated, Duplis casts some sort of spell to steal Mario's identity and body-snatch him. In the cutscene immediately after, 
You see this much more sinister idol pose for Mario where he's breathing heavily, and his pose for picking up the Crystal Star is also different from his usual one. Most people who aren't spoiled about this twist in advance generally don't realize what happens, as it's pretty subtle, and there's a text crawl where it says the players meet in the chapter to add to the fake out of Dupless being dead. After that's over, the fake Mario leaves, and the camera just stays on the Shadow Mario's corpse for a while before the reveal that that's your player character, which can come across as a pretty significant shock when people first realize it. There's no further text explaining things for the time being, leaving the player to wonder about what just happened. Then they have to go back to town without any of their partners to help them, significantly weakening Mario because they've all abandoned him to join Dupless. This is probably the most difficult part of the chapter gameplay-wise, and it helps to build up the atmosphere when you feel the impact of Mario's friends having abandoned him. A lot of people criticize this chapter for having backtracking in it, but this first backtrack should definitely still be there. It is very significant gameplay-wise. Duplis only shows up later on to fight the player in an unwinnable battle, bragging about how he's stolen Mario's body, how good his new life is, and what a loser Mario now is. He can later be seen talking to the mayor and enjoying everyone telling him what a great hero he is. The party members he stole comment on how talkative Mario suddenly is, but they still follow him unwaveringly. All Duplis has to do is some poor acting and spout some generic Mario catchphrases, and they're all ready to obey him without question. It's pretty funny how they just address how easy it would be to impersonate Mario when he has the personality of a piece of cardboard. Names are apparently a source of power for Duplis and in general in Twilight Town. You need your name to be able to use the pipe to get in and out of Twilight Town, as once Mario loses his identity, he's no longer allowed to leave the area. The first thing people advise when Mario comes to town is just to leave the area immediately, which would imply the citizens probably would leave if they could. Duplis could very well have stolen the names of the villagers as well to stop them from leaving. It seems obvious they'd want to if they could. Duplis has done a decent job of hiding his name within his steeple, but can admittedly do better to kill the only guy who knows his name, which is a random parrot. You get a big name entry screen and everything, and you can put in whatever you want as his name when you're trying to guess it, but he's somehow broken the fourth wall and hidden the lowercase letter P in his castle, which you need to use to type his name. I guess if you type his name in all caps, you're shouting his name, Duplis, and that's very rude, so it doesn't count. Granted, his breakdown when Mario reveals that he's found out his secret is pretty funny, and I've seen it used as a reaction image a few times since it looks just like Mario out of context. Dupus' name is the source of his power, and once it's known, he can't use all of his magic to its fullest extent. The player has to encounter Dupus for a final fight where the partners are still loyal to him. On paper, this is great, but unfortunately this fight ends up being really anticlimactic. He's still as easy as ever, even with the partners. He starts with Goombella out, and only ever uses the other party members if you kill her off, cycling through them the order you recruited them. The fight just ends when you kill Duplis, and there's no gimmicks here based on Duplis being Mario, he just generically jumps at you like before. While the lack of difficulty is bad, it really is a shame they didn't have some more fun with this guy for how strong of a character he is. Instead of being in front of the partner, he should be hiding behind the partner to use them as meat shields, forcing Mario to defeat all of his former allies before he's attacked himself. This is how a lot of people play the fight for fun on a replay, since it's so easy anyway. So it really should just be made into something that's acknowledged in the game's writing. While his dialogue in his regular form is nothing too special, as the Mario imposter he is significantly funnier. I could easily picture him saying, Oh, you should be proud to die for the great Mario! as he forces his partners to tank hits for him. Aside from being the main villain of his chapter, Duplis comes back as a recurring villain to serve under Beldam, the main antagonist of the game, making him extremely memorable by comparison to the other one-and-done antagonists. Unfortunately, he's not nearly as good in his later appearances, as he becomes the new runt to Beldam's party after Vivian joins Mario. Beldam constantly insults and berates Duplis, and while Duplis stands up for himself a bit more than Vivian, basically just comes across as childish whining since he does whatever Beldam says. Beldam refuses to call Duplis by his name and keeps insulting him and calling him Freak in the Sheet. Duplis keeps telling Beldam multiple times what his name is, trying to get her to use it. Yes, it glorifies Beldam and makes Duplis look pathetic, 
but I find it really funny that before Duplass refused to let anyone say his name and went to great lengths to hide that, now it's fate that nobody cares enough to even remember it. Truly a fitting punishment. I definitely wish he was a bit less pathetic in his dialogue, and that's one of the reasons why he definitely can't be number one, even though I know that would be a popular pick. He also comes across as just consistently pathetic by comparison to Beldam and Marilyn in general. As in battle, he can just copy Mario and his partners and do generic weak attacks, while Marilyn and Beldam have gigantic attack lists to choose from which are all extremely threatening and are just blatantly way more powerful than he is. His shape-shifting powers do get to be used a few more times, so it's not like he's totally useless though. He even manages to trick Mario into opening the door to the Shadow Queen for him by posing as one of his friends. It's pretty much between him, Beldam, and Crump for who antagonizes Mario the most in the game. Having a villain who had an entire villain saga dedicated to himself become a recurring antagonist afterwards definitely makes this game feel more like a legitimate story, rather than just a series of video game chapters. The biggest thing you have to wonder about Duplis is why he doesn't just turn Mario and anyone else who upsets him into a pig. I will say this plot hole is fairly easy to explain during Chapter 4, because I think Duplis wants Mario to come defeat him so he can steal his identity and become a hero. After that, he doesn't hex him into a pig because he's trying to keep up his new identity as a hero. Afterwards, it's more of a question, but I assume the fact Mario figured out his name means he can't use his shape-shifting powers on people other than himself anymore. It's not exactly in your face or directly stated, but the logic is there if you look for it, and I appreciate that about Duplis. In the first Paper Mario, there are Dupla Ghost enemies who attempt to impersonate Mario's powers, which are a memorable section as they try to argue against the real partners as to convince Mario who's real. As far as villain cutscenes go, that's the most memorable thing about Chapter 7 if you ask me. It's certainly not that insanely generic Crystal King boss. These cutscenes are great, but they can only go so far when the characters are all just generic enemies rather than a singular, legitimate character like Duplis. In Paper Mario Pro Mode, the one named Dupla Ghost, Lee from the Fighting Dojo, makes significantly better use of his powers to fight than Duplis does, splitting himself up into multiple duplicates and copying Mario's partners at random, rather than always just copying whichever partner Mario currently has out. I know Duplis couldn't have a fight like this during Chapter 4 of Thousand Year Door because of him trying to set up the whole body snatching thing to become Mario, but Duplis occurs many times throughout the game, and could have a great boss battle like this if the developers just let him fight and gave him stuff to do, rather than just making him so pathetic to face every time he's fought. In particular, I think it would make sense for a solo Duplis fight in Chapter 6 during the train segment, as that's the one point where he's separated from Beldam and Marilyn. Give him a fight here, where he can actually use his powers to their fullest extent and show what he can do, rather than holding back just to preserve his identity. I know he's pathetic later on when he's fought alongside Beldam and Marilyn, but they just arbitrarily limit him in that fight because there's three enemies, and the whole game is way too easy anyway. This guy needs full reign to go wild. In the ending of the game, many of the villains get very embarrassing epilogues, but Duplis manages to get off scot-free and is living his best life. Duplis uses his shape-shifting powers to become an actor, and plays Mario in a play that attempts to retell the events of the game. How the guy managed to escape karma for his actions is anyone's guess, given he not only went through his own personal villain saga, but was part of the main villain faction for a time that was trying to figure out the end of the world. I'd rather he just got vanquished to treat him more seriously, but if anybody escaped from the group, it would definitely make sense to be Duplis, since he can use his shape-shifting powers to turn into other people and blend in. Duplis has the most tens of any villain on the list. While he might come across a bit pathetic when working for Beldam, he's legitimately horrifying during his original chapter to the point I think his ten is well deserved. His only weakness is his horrible boss fight. His visual design is also kind of bland, but I raised it from a 4 to a 6 because I like his unique animations when he's copying Mario that better show off his personality. Congratulations on making it to the 5 hour mark. You're a real one. And because this is randomly inserted, I know you didn't just skip to the end. Even if you followed that instruction at the start of the video and skipped to 3 hours and 10 minutes, you still watch almost 2 hours, so you're definitely in this for the long haul. 
Yeah, I didn't expect it would go this long either. I thought it was just going to be like four hours at most when I scripted it all. There's only three villains left, and we're coming up on a real big one here. Who do you think the winner of the video is going to be? And who should it have been? Let me know in the comments. Am I an idiot who just doesn't understand the depths of Count Black's character? Or a toxic Thousand Year Door fan who's just hating on anything new? I love feedback and read every single one of my comments, so be sure to make your voice heard. There's still over 30 minutes left of boss rankings, so let's get back into the finale before Thousand Year Door Remake comes out, alright? Dementio is by far the most competent villain in any Mario media. The fact that he's not the main villain at first makes his competence stick out a lot more when he's initially presented as just another minion in Count Black's group of bad guys. Chapter 1 is supposed to be O-Chunks' chapter, but Dementio shows up at the end where the group encounters Fractail a computer guardian dragon. Fractail is not actually evil and intends to let Mario pass on by. He's only there to stop evil people from going through. After that's established, Dementio shows up, directly says this is a boring conclusion to the chapter, and brainwashes Fractail with magic to become hostile. That's certainly more antagonistic than anything O-Chunks over there did, just jumping in the way. I already went over how much Dementio abuses O-Chunks during the section of that character on this list, but having one of the so-called minions of Count Black so thoroughly abuse the other one really glorifies Dementio and very quickly shows that he's not just another ordinary member of the group. Mimi is the only other especially competent member of the faction besides Dementio, but she's mostly self-contained and doesn't interact with the others nearly as much as Dementio does. Dementio is clearly seen asking Count Black questions during his meetings with him about the prophecy in the generic Dark Book, trying to pry any information out of the Count that he can. Black remains fairly tight-lipped on the matter, so Dementio resorts to hiding and spying on him to get more information. Dementio is the only one of Count Black's minions who ever realizes that he intends to end all the worlds without recreating them, which is something Dementio definitely does not want. He wants to make a new world that he will rule in his own image. While a lesser villain might reveal this secret to O-Chunks and Mimi to try to get their help in overthrowing Black, Dementio keeps everything he knows entirely to himself and manipulates the other characters throughout the story to get what he wants. Dementio's backstory from the barkeep doesn't say all that much, but apparently Dementio is the only one of Count Black's minions who actively sought him out rather than the other way around. Dementio is power-hungry and wanted to use the book to reset the universe. Count Black rightfully tried to keep Dementio out and didn't want him in the group, so apparently Dementio somehow managed to write in the part of the book where a dark magician was arbitrarily required to be involved. This is kind of contradictory with the fact Dementio later does not know everything contained within the book, but I guess he just didn't have the time to read it all or something before he had to return it back to Black without him noticing what happened. Regardless, it's pretty funny that Dementio just casually scribbled down in this dark prophecy book, Oh, by the way, you need a magician. Uh, you, you gotta hire me now. He also tries to get Black to regain his memories about his girlfriend by subtly hinting to him about his old name before he became known as Black. Anything that he can use, he will use. With how self-centered Count Black is with his irrational desire to destroy the world just out of petty revenge, it's intensely satisfying to see Dementio manipulating the much worse written character. Dementio's acts of antagonism towards the heroes throughout the story are supposed to strengthen them, as he intends to use them to defeat Count Black apparently. Their fight against the brainwashed O-Chunk seems to be the point where he fully decides that he's going to use them for that purpose. If the brainwashed O-Chunks had somehow won, he might have used him instead, as hilarious as that would have been. The arbitrary prophecy makes it clear that Luigi is needed to use the full power of the Chaos Heart. So Dementio outright murders Luigi while he's still in the form of Mr. L. This is after Mr. L has already lost to Mario, so he's beat up and it's an easy chance to finish him off. The primary reason he kills Luigi is because it frees him of Nastasia's mind control getting rid of the Mr. L persona and turning him back into the regular old Luigi. Mr. L is loyal to Count Black, so this was a necessary step for Dementio. Now, the next step is what truly reveals how powerful Dementio is. He goes to track down Mario, Peach, and Bowser while they're all together in a random house and murders all three of them. Yep, Dementio just casually murders Mario and Bowser together with no effort. 
Based on how casually he does it here, he could have just done it at any time. But it's clear that he didn't want to kill them as they weren't his true enemies. And considering how casually he kills them here, he wasn't exactly in a rush to do it. It should go without saying that outright killing Mario is a trait exclusive to Dementio. No other villain could boast this, with Duplis being the next closest thing. I will say how casual this murder is does paint Dementio as kind of too powerful, and I would have preferred a much more elaborate trap to kill them from a writing perspective. The fact that he can just do this so casually isn't something I'm a fan of, but the fact that he does do it is still really cool. As far as why he kills Mario, he needs to send him to the Mario Universe's afterlife for two reasons. First, he needs them to resurrect Luigi, since whether or not he's brainwashed, he doesn't do Dementio any good in the Underworld. Second is for Mario to purify the hearts that Count Black destroyed, which are the key to defeating him. Dementio again demonstrates just how absurdly powerful he is during his section in Count Black's castle. Each level features one of Count Black's minions as the boss at the end of it. The first two are Ochunks and Mimi, who fight Bowser and Peach in one-on-one -on -one fights. After their fights are over, that part of the castle randomly starts to cave in, blocking them off from the rest of the group. It's never explained why that happens, but with all the other superpowers Dementio has and the fact his level is immediately after the other two Count Black lieutenants, I think it's a reasonable conclusion Dementio wanted to isolate Mario and Luigi. Killing off O-Chunks and Mimi is also a plus for him, since they can potentially interfere by defending Count Black. When it's Dementio's turn to stop Mario, he makes hundreds of duplicates to try to confuse him, goes on an intergalactic chase through practically every world in the game, and still has the strength to fight afterwards. The idea is he wants to just kill Mario as well so he can have Luigi to himself. When Mario gets past all the traps, he offers Mario the chance to join him by telling him a partial truth. He says that Count Black intends to destroy all the worlds without rebuilding them, and that Black has betrayed him by this, to explain why he just now suddenly wants to join forces. There is just barely enough left unclear about this that this could be vaguely reasonable for a player to agree to work with Dementio. But if you say yes, Tippy will say he's obviously lying, and Dementio will offer increasingly stupid rewards in exchange for joining him. Obviously, Dementio shouldn't expect this to work, he's probably just doing this for his own entertainment value at that point, as he offers Mario trinkets like a rare card or his patented fragrance, demented by Dementio, in exchange for killing Count Black. Nobody would realistically say yes every time other than to see funny dialogue, but if you do, Tippy will abandon Mario, and Dementia will mock him for how idiotic he is by putting floral sprouts on the brothers to mind control them, resulting in a non-standard game over. It's obviously not canon or Dementio's primary plan, but it's a hilarious optional sequence and I'm very glad it's in the game. Now, when you reject Dementio like any sane person would, he still manages to manipulate people to get his way by taunting Luigi and insulting his mustache. This is apparently enough to make Luigi decide to fight Dementio one-on-one, -on -one, and gives him the perfect opportunity to plant a floral sprout on him after the boss battle. Meanwhile, Dementio is perfectly content to just let Mario go fight Count Black on his own, and Mario eventually does defeat the Count by using the power of the pure hearts. Dementio shows up after everyone is already weakened from their various battles to reveal his plan, using the floral sprout he planted in Luigi and fusing with him in the Chaos Heart to create a giant monster for his final confrontation as the last boss. Now, while I do love Dementio, this is easily the weakest part of his character, in the final climax here. The giant monster has an evil Luigi head on it, and Dementio fuses with it and takes complete control over it. Despite that, the monster still has Luigi's head and looks incredibly stupid and unintimidating for a villain that's been played incredibly seriously. Aside from looking kinda wonky in general, I really, really do not like that it has Luigi's head when Dementio is the dominant character in 100% control of the body. I have to take some points off of his visual design for this stupid transformation even if his regular form is a perfectly good design. The boss fight is also one of the worst in all of Super Paper Mario, even though basically every boss is already terrible, I think this one is especially bad. For how much Dementio mocked O-Chunk's excessive use of brute strength earlier, he's pretty much traded in all of his super powerful magical abilities just to be really, really physically powerful. He just kind of, like, 
lashes out at you with the head and tries to jump on top of you. He throws a couple of really pathetic projectiles. Honestly, the platforms are more threatening than he is directly. His regular fights aren't much to write home about either, unfortunately. So not even those can save him from having his score tanked in these two categories. If this is him being 250 times as strong as he is normally, then just how pathetic is this guy on a regular day? When the giant Super Dementio monster is defeated, Luigi gets spat out of it because he's a main character, while Dementio just stays in the body and dies with it. That doesn't really make any sense because the body is apparently some kind of transformation of Luigi's body with the Chaos Heart. Luigi's body is the host to create that giant monster. Dementio then just goes inside of it to join the fusion and take over the body as the brains. In all realism, Luigi should be the one who dies, given that this monster is a mangling of Luigi's body, not Dementio's, while Dementio gets spat out afterwards. All the so-called Super Dementio body serves as is a glorified coffin for Dementio to go down in, and it pretty much just serves as a convenient way to kill him off for the riders. It's supposed to be his big moment of triumph, but it leaves you with a lot of questions afterwards. Dementio's plan is working perfectly up until the very end of the game, until it's revealed that his transformation that he's been working so incredibly hard to get is in actuality a big joke. Dementio is already so powerful that he'd have been better off never getting into that body in the first place. Or at the very least, he should have just used his generic explosion attack that killed Mario the first time again. To cut Dementio a little bit of slack here, I will say there's no way he had of knowing that the transformation would be this pitiful and that it would end up killing him the way that it did. In that way, you could just say he's really unlucky and that this isn't technically his fault, but he invested all of his eggs in one basket with this Super Dementio Luigi fusion thing, and it most definitely was not a gamble that paid off for him. If nothing else, at least his super form has a great boss battle theme. All the presentation is there for a perfect finale, and that's enough for some people. It just fails on the transformation's terrible design and Super Paper Mario's terrible gameplay to leave a gaping hole in this otherwise perfect villain sequence. I'm still very grateful for the great story of Super Paper Mario that it provides, and we certainly all missed it when both the story and gameplay were destroyed by Tanabe with Sticker Star. Some people just only say the first two Paper Mario games are good, but I'm definitely not part of that crowd. I consider Super Paper Mario part of the original trilogy, not duology. Dementio is an amazing villain. I mostly just felt the need to go into this level of detail on his negative aspects because this is pretty much the assumed winner of the ranking. Everyone who voted on this poll certainly thought so anyway. If we could count forms as separate characters on this list somehow, and we could just rank Super Dementio separately from regular Dementio, then he might have won, honestly. This is not an overarching antagonist like the other ones that we've been covering, but surprisingly is just the villain of one chapter. He's the villain of Chapter 3 of Thousand Year Door serving as the manager of the Glitz Pit. This is one of the bigger twists in the game, as he comes across as a fairly ordinary, if blatantly corrupt, wrestling manager. He would be the obvious villain candidate if not for the game presenting Rockhawk to the player as a red herring, who does the most antagonistic things while on camera. The player will generally think the other mysteries of the chapter are attributed to Rockhawk rather than to Grubba, the true culprit. Grubba uses the crystal star that Mario wants for his own evil purposes, while pinning the blame on Rockhawk by putting a fake crystal star in his belt as a diversion. Grubba's ultimate goal is secretly using some kind of power-sucking machine to steal the strength out of fighters from his arena, turning them into lifeless husks while he adds their strength to his own power. He casually talks about how they've gone missing in front of other people like he had nothing to do with it showing he doesn't have any moral compass about the matter, he just cares about covering up his own murders. While Grubba is a twist villain, we get to see just how corrupt he is as a general manager too. Grubba thankfully doesn't outright order people to job, meaning forcing people to lose on purpose, but he does about everything short of demanding you to do so. He always gives Mario a special condition that he must follow to make things more interesting, like not using certain attacks or items, are preventing one of Mario or his partner from doing anything. While he might not outright order Mario to lose, 
He sometimes demands Mario not attack for three turns or take five hits worth of damage. Mario is the player character and the game is easy, but some of these conditions might be Grubba wanting Mario to lose without directly telling him to do so. Even if Grubba says it's just to make the matches closer and more exciting. If these conditions were applied for any of the regular opponents when they fought somebody besides Mario, they definitely would lose. So Grubba probably assumes Mario will lose too. Progress has to be made as Mario continues to climb the ranks, so we can't have a story where Mario is forced to job directly. But the implication is definitely there. Perhaps the most hilarious condition Grubba forces on the player is telling him to just kill the enemies quickly, because he has to go after the match is over. It's all just about whatever Grubba's current whim is, he doesn't really care about the fights themselves. Aside from being great flavor and making this the most memorable chapter of any Paper Mario game, this also adds some much needed difficulty to the otherwise simplistic fights within the Glitz Pit. Grubba can be held partially responsible for this gameplay besides just his boss battle, giving him a much larger presence than the other episodic villains of the series. While he's not directly villainous for most of the chapter, the fact he's been making life harder for you all this time makes the revelation that he's the villain feel very natural. The player slowly uncovers clues about Grubba's true nature by spying on him and eventually discovering the lifeless corpses of some of the fighters he killed buried in the storage room, as Grubba presumably hasn't been able to find a better place to dispose of them yet. This might seem incompetent on his part, but considering the whole arena is built on a small floating island in the sky, he would have to pack their bodies onto the blimp with him to dispose of them fully unless he just wants to throw their bodies off the island and hope for the best. The more memorable scene where Grubba might seem a bit incompetent is when he's talking about disposing of one of his fighters, while Mario and his partner are just spying on him up in the ventilation system. Mario and his partner will then stupidly start to talk to each other, which Grubba can hear, and he starts to wonder what's happening up there. Regardless of what response Mario picks here to try to cover it up, even if he just makes an idiotic belch, Grubba will just ignore it! Apparently, burping is just a normal occurrence in events. It's technically kind of incompetent for Grubba, but it's an obvious gag, and I'd say it's one of the more memorable humorous scenes he has. Grubba's fight is the best done in Thousand Year Door once you finally do get to go fight him as the chapter boss. While the Pit of a Hundred Trials is harder, that's mostly for the enemies encountered before Bone Tail, not Bone Tail himself. Grubba is probably the hardest boss, taking into account when he is fought and his boss battle is easily the most memorable. Grubba is the only character besides Mario who actually uses the power of the Crystal Star to his advantage. He uses its power to buff himself up to give himself more turns, dodge attacks, as well as to increase his stats. When Mario uses it in gameplay, it functions almost exactly the same way as one of the best star powers, giving Grubba something of a legacy throughout this star despite the fact he dies after the fight is over. Theoretically, Grubba can give himself the highest defense in the game if he spams enough defense buffs, and can boost his attack high enough to almost one-shot Mario and his party. That's not how his AI actually works, though. He will always spend his turn making himself have two turns per turn if he doesn't have that status already, and if he does, he will always buff himself once with one of his buffs and attack once. It's honestly not a bad strategy. It could theoretically be more broken, but it would probably make the fight literally impossible for a lot of casual players if he just spammed defense buffs, so I'm not complaining. The important thing, I think, is he is using plus one turn as often as possible, which makes a lot of sense, as opposed to Mott from SMT over there, who is basically just the most powerful character in the game when he can just do infinite plus one turns whenever he wants but just chooses not to because he's completely random AI. Mario is very overpowered and has plenty of countermeasures given the game's low difficulty. And when Grubba has to renew his buff to give him two turns, it's mostly a free turn for Mario to recover from Grubba's onslaught. Grubba isn't just a manager, as before he got old, he was a wrestler himself. Aside from just buffing himself up with the Crystal Star, he claims that his wrestling moves were so brutal they had to make some of them illegal. He wanted to relive his glory days and regain his strength to stay forever young. It's not exactly clear what Grubba's endgame is, but if he won against Mario, he'd probably absorb him and probably be the most powerful character in the game. There wouldn't be a lot of point for Grubba to keep a secret at that point. While it's not as obvious as Rockhawk being based on Hulk Hogan, Grubba does share some similarities with Macho Man Randy Savage. 
His powered-up form is called Macho Grubba, and he shouts Macho all the time, again similar to the aforementioned wrestler. He comes across pretty similar to Super Macho Man from Punch-Out, and that he's trying to relive his glory days from when he was in his prime. Super Macho Man is actually only 27 years old. The reason that guy looks so old is heavily implied to be side effects from heavy use of steroids, giving him another link to Grubba. As far as the real Macho Man, his signature move was the flying elbow drop, which would later go on to be made illegal. I'd like to believe this is what Grubba is referring to when he says they banned some of his moves, even though he doesn't have a literal elbow drop. Most of his attacks are body slams or butt stops. His fat body couldn't easily do an elbow drop to much effect, but it's reasonable to assume he might have been more lean and muscular before he became old and overweight. The power-sucking machine just gave him muscle, didn't fix that problem for him. Thousand Year Door introduced an amazing gimmick for its battle system where they all take place on a stage with an audience. Mario's performance determines how much the crowd cheers and determines his star power. As Mario levels up, more and more tacky stage effects and gimmicks will happen on the stage. This, for the most part, is abstract and not treated as something really happening within the universe. But during Grubba's chapter, that barrier most strongly fades. The audience is treated as being canonically present, and Grubba directly orders Mario to appeal to the audience during battle, shattering any concept of the fourth wall with this audience mechanic. On an average playthrough, most of the gimmicks will start coming into effect right around the time of the Grubba fight, Making stage hazards like fog adding evasion to the mix seem like a personal attack of Grubba's, given he's the only one with any thematic reason to have it. In particular, it's also pretty funny if you can stack up the stage evasion with his personal evasion, making him almost impossible to hit at all. While the arena is empty when the player goes to fight Grubba because of it being kept a secret, I think it's reasonable to assume that the fans managed to get in after this match started to start watching and cheering. It's clear Grubba is a showman and loves the spotlight, so I don't think he exactly minds. His secret would now be exposed, but if he beats Mario and absorbs him, who's gonna stop him? Certainly not Rockhawk. No boss competes in this series in terms of sheer atmosphere and presentation, and he's got one of the very few boss battles competent enough to legitimately back himself up on the gameplay side. On the topic of presentation, I just have to highlight his unique power-up sound effect. You can just feel the raw power oozing out of this man. While Taba Blubba still has characterization of his own that is likable, it pales in comparison to Grubba. Grubba is competent and smart in every area Taba Blubba fails in, while Grubba has to work for his power rather than having it handed to him on a silver platter by Bowser. Their names rhyme, they're the same race, and both are the final boss of Chapter 3 in their respective games. Grubba more strongly resembles Tubba after attaining Macho status. It shows how powerful that guy could have been if he had a spine and actually bothered to have a proper boss battle, instead of letting his super-powered heart do all the work for him. The race of these two villains are Clubbers, a new enemy introduced in Paper Mario which are based on the spikes from the main Mario series. I didn't even realize these guys were spikes as their designs are such radical departure from that generic enemy, in a good way. All spikes are known for is throwing generic spiked balls, something that none of the Clubbers do. Spikes, of course, would go on to replace Clubbers in Tanabe's trilogy, given his hatred of anything from the first three games. While it's blatantly not intentional, there's a sort of indirect reference to Grubba specifically in Origami King. The large Origami papercraft enemies are called Macho Enemies, and there's a giant Macho Spike as a sub-boss in the game. Who do you think is better? Macho Spike or Macho Grubba? I'll give you some time to think on it, I know it's a very difficult decision. While some of his scores might not be quite as high as the other villains in the top five or six, Grubba is the only character to be super involved in the story who actually has an amazing boss fight that definitely makes him stick out from the crowd of villains in this series. Beldam is the main antagonist of Thousand Year Door. 
even though this is not something everyone is immediately aware of due to her largely working in the shadows. Rodis comes across as the primary villain group in the game, and Beldam and a group of Shadow Sirens are introduced as just a group of enforcers working for Grotus. It's only in the ending of the game where it's finally revealed that Beldam was the true antagonist rather than just some random minion of Grotus. She lied to the ex not leader about the nature of the treasure, telling him that whoever opens up the chest to free the Shadow Queen would be able to control her, when all Beldam wanted was to use Grotus' vast resources to help free the Shadow Queen from her prison. She plays the whole x not faction for fools and largely gets away with it. Beldam then shows up afterwards with Marilyn and Duplis, being congratulated on a job well done by her. The Shadow Queen never bothers to mention Marilyn or Vivian if she's present, only Beldam. She is perfectly content to sit there with her smug smile and watch her boss fights, enjoying the fruits of her hard labor, given she's apparently supposed to be all-powerful. You could argue Beldam is a twist villain and that makes her bad, but much like Dementio, Beldam is on the screen being evil and we can see her actions the whole time to enjoy them. The only real twist is that she was using Gratis, not that she was a villain in the first place, and the story makes considerably more sense when you realize that. Beldam needs to get a pure maiden for two reasons. One, to act as a house for the Shadow Queen to possess once she gets out of her prison, and two is to open a chest which has a magical map with the location of the Crystal Stars, which are needed to free her from her prison in the first place. In the intro of the game, Beldam is disguised and getting Peach to open up this chest for her. It's never technically revealed that this is Beldam, but putting one and two together once you've played the game already, there's not exactly much of anyone else it could be, and then she goes on to kidnap Peach. It's a nice easter egg to have her in the scene for fans, given it's only something realized on a second playthrough. The only other realistic candidate for who this figure could be is, like, what, Crump? But we all know how good he is with disguises. Beldam's first fight against Mario is rather pathetic, but it does make sense she fights him at this point because she wants to take his Crystal Stars. What makes considerably less sense is after having orchestrated the events of the entire game to resurrect the Shadow Queen as her end goal and being incredibly close to her victory, she chooses to attack Mario in Chapter 8 for seemingly no reason? I guess they're trying to delay Mario so that Grotus can revive the Shadow Queen or something, but it's kind of vague. We haven't fought her group for an incredibly long time, so it makes sense they have a boss battle before the game ends, and it's one of the most entertaining fights in the game. Beldam can apply tons of different status effects, including freezing, shrinking, slowing time, boosting speed, poison, and even a weird status effect that prevents Mario from buffing himself. Only Beldam and the Shadow Queen can apply this bizarre last status, implying a link between them. Between Beldam and Marilyn, this boss fight has more attacks than any other boss in the game. This fight is still easier than it should be, and Beldam only has a pathetic 30 HP, but it's a very memorable fight as far as Thousand Year Door bosses go, as Beldam and Marilyn do everything but throw the kitchen sink at you with their vast arsenal of attacks. Marilyn's attack power in particular is huge, and if she's given multiple turns by Beldam, she can really put the hurt on you. Marilyn can also supercharge her attack to do double damage, and if she has double turns from Beldam, she can just charge and do the attack at the same time. If that wasn't enough, she can also just charge multiple times and the charges will stack. So it's possible she could just charge enough times to get an instant KO if she wanted to. And as a little bonus, there's a mechanic in Thousand Year Door where you can press B with frame perfect timing to just block all damage, which is kind of dumb. But Marilyn's lightning attack is arbitrarily one of the only attacks in the entire game that you could not super guard. So that's nice. So Beldam and Marilyn together make for an amazing team, but unfortunately Duplis is not all that useful. He can shapeshift, sure, but that's just a glorified skin for him at the end of the day. Every turn he's just doing a small amount of damage regardless of what form he takes. His only real purpose is to act as a meat shield for the two characters who are actually threatening as some attacks, like hammers, can only target the character in front, and Beldam is hiding in the back like you'd expect while making Duplis tank hits for her. However, Duplis's contribution is limited as many attacks can target the entire enemy team or back line, making it rare for him to make a significant impact. There is an argument that Duplis might be so terrible that he is actively making the party weaker. Beldam has generic random targeting AI like anything else, 
meaning she can waste her overpowered buffing spells on Duplus instead of using them on herself or Marilyn. You could argue this is Beldam being an idiot and is therefore bad, but if anything, this is extremely in character for her to put pressure on her allies, then blame them for her own failures. Literally within this battle, Beldam is insulting Duplus and constantly threatening him with horrible punishment if he fails. So the idea of Beldam giving Duplus double turns and then him not doing anything with it is kind of hilarious, honestly. It's worth noting that Beldam probably hasn't witnessed Duplus fighting before anyway, so there's no established track record of his failures for Beldam to refer to or anything. You know, watching this footage back, Duplus can just turn into Vivian, so maybe that's why Beldam hates him so much. The issue about this fight is where it is placed. After they die, their corpses just stay on the ground unconscious, and Mario can't finish them off for whatever reason when they should blatantly just get killed there. But what obviously make the most sense would be if they fought alongside the Shadow Queen to help her dispose of Mario. They have nothing to gain from attacking Mario here, and it would get rid of the plot hole as to why Mario and company don't just kill Beldam when they have the chance. I know Beldam doesn't think the Shadow Queen needs help, but it would make for an awesome final phase when they realize the Shadow Queen's in trouble if they would come in and help her at the last second. As is, Beldam and her group just stand there and watch as the Shadow Queen dies. After 1,000 years of trying to resurrect the Shadow Queen, you'd think Beldam would bother to help her master. The Shadow Queen is pretty much a non-character who is a generic doomsday villain. The only especially interesting parts of her character are her connection to Beldam. While it might not make sense thematically to have Beldam just help the Shadow Queen as she's dying, I think the obvious route to go here is just to have the Shadow Queen character not exist, and be a transformation for Beldam after absorbing the power of the artifacts, much like how the much more popular villain of Dementio did it. I think that would have been a much more memorable ending. Of course, by comparison to Dementio, her boss is significantly less lame than Dementio's transformation is in the end even if the Shadow Queen is far from perfect also. Regardless of how this goes, the big fight Beldam's group has should really be moved somewhere else. The area where it would make the most sense to be is in Chapter 6, where Beldam's group are the main antagonists. Have them fight Mario in the Sanctum rather than simply just run and escape with a fake crystal star. The game is easy enough that moving their entire Chapter 8 fight to Chapter 6 really wouldn't be that unreasonable. And it comes across awkward that the chapter doesn't directly end with a boss fight. For how much Beldam shows up, she's only fought twice in the entire game. It definitely feels like there's something major missing in Chapter 6 specifically with how much Beldam does all off camera. And the Paper Mario Wiki claims there is some sort of cut content involving her there where she'd attack Mario on the train alongside the Smorg. I can't verify that, and that might just be some random fan putting that on there, but it would make a lot of sense. So I've managed to go all this time without mentioning Beldam's primary character trait, and that's how abusive she is to all of her minions. She is by far most directly abusive to Vivian, constantly calling her ugly to ridiculous extremes, despite her being the only member of the group to not be physically repulsive, since Beldam looks like an old hag and Marilyn is morbidly obese. Beldam and the Shadow Queen are both confirmed to be over a thousand years old, and I would assume Marilyn and Vivian are also but Beldam is the only Shadow Siren that looks old. If they're all that old, why is she the only one that shows signs of age? The Shadow Queen also only recognizes Beldam without commenting on Marilyn or Vivian at all, so it's possible that Beldam's sisters were born later on after the Shadow Queen was sealed away already. Vivian doesn't come across nearly as evil as Beldam, and it's hard to picture Vivian being an evil enforcer for the Shadow Queen in the distant past alongside her. Beldam blames everything she possibly can on Vivian, even when something is clearly her fault. While Vivian might not necessarily be a thousand years old, Beldam's age has clearly taken a toll on her own sanity to act in this way, as practically every line of dialogue she has when sharing the screen with Vivian is dedicated to insulting her. The relationship between them comes across as more of a mother and her daughter than two sisters. And when she refers to Vivian as a rebellious child and punishes her, it definitely comes across that way. Her constant abuse of Vivian leads to her very justifiably betraying Beldam and joining Mario instead. The conflict between them isn't really brought up again after that, unfortunately, because the game doesn't account for which partner Mario currently has out in the dialogue, so it just assumes she doesn't exist. Now, 
The elephant in the room with Beldam that never gets seriously brought up anywhere is the fact that Vivian is a male to female transgender in Japan, which was censored in the American release. It's only brought up in a small handful of lines, with the most famous translated lines being in a random menu stating it, as well as Goombella just randomly saying it in her title skill. However, there is one line that's obscure to find for whatever reason. This translation even incorrectly labels Beldam as Marilyn, where Beldam outright insults Vivian for her gender identity, stating that she's not a real woman. Beldam's cartoonish, constant insults and abuse at Vivian relate to real-life abuse significantly more strongly if Vivian is transgender, making her the most realistic antagonist on this list by a mile. While Beldam is a supervillain trying to resurrect an ancient evil, she's also a strong allegory for a bigoted parental figure. Most games are too afraid to have any kind of intolerant character, even as villains. But when Veldam is so universally evil, I think that's a very strong addition to the cast. It makes her insults feel less like cartoonish, irrational hatred, and far more like the kind of hatred we see regularly in real life. With this context from the original version removed, her treatment towards Vivian has a lot more of a comedic tone because of how random and out of nowhere it seems. Regardless of whatever Vivian's gender is, Beldam is also abusive to her other two minions. While she is nicest to Marilyn, she primarily is only nice to her just because she prefers her to Vivian and Dupless. In their first encounter, Marilyn is the first one to realize that Mario is the target they're looking for, before Beldam has, and is trying to inform her about this. Beldam insults and berates her as an elf who can't speak properly when Beldam should know well by now that Marilyn is incapable of speech. With Marilyn, you really have to wonder if she was always mute, given how old she is. With how Beldam treats Vivian, it's not exactly hard to imagine Beldam is the reason why Marilyn can't speak, like it's some sort of punishment. While Marilyn is super strong and body slams people to attack, she has incredibly skilled, powerful magic that rivals the Shadow Queen, implying she's not dumb, and she still tries to communicate despite her lack of speech. Considering how old Beldam is, you have to wonder what happened with her and her sisters in the past. During the events of the game, Marilyn largely just functions as Beldam's muscle and as an extension of her will, as she's the only one loyal to her for its entire duration. Dupless becomes Vivian's replacement after she leaves, and makes good use of his shapeshifting to add some utility to the group. Beldam also abuses him by constantly calling him a freak in a sheet, and blaming whatever she used to blame on Vivian on him instead. It seems like she always just needs an outlet for her aggression, really. It's impressive that Beldam manages to subjugate Dupless despite him having been the main villain for an entire chapter and being a massive threat in his own right. The biggest flaw with Beldam's character, other than the translation barrier, is a horrible epilogue for her and Vivian, where it's said that Beldam renounces her villainy and is now nice to Vivian as they live together. It's a throwaway line that is easy to ignore, but it's pretty bad if you consider it canon. Beldam is responsible for the entire events of the plot and is not only allowed to go free, but Vivian forgives her? Beldam's character also makes no sense to just change after everything's said and done. She is far too deeply rooted in her beliefs to just turn on a dime. She really should have just transformed into or fused with the Shadow Queen, or at least been vanquished during the final battle somehow. I always hate it when villains just get forgiven for no reason, but this one here is one of the worst. I'm pretty sure lesser villains in the game like Grubba and Hooktail get to just die after the chapters are over, so it's not like the game is afraid of showing death because it's for kids or something. Most I can say in the defense of this awful epilogue is that Beldam could obviously just be lying to Goombella here. I don't believe for a second she's telling the truth. Yeah, her dream of a thousand years is now dead and she would need to find new purpose, but that doesn't mean she would just suddenly become friendly with Vivian. I gave Beldam nearly perfect scores across the board. The only real problem with the boss fight is that the HP totals are too terrible, but the boss fight itself is fine. It just needs a couple of number edits, honestly. She can do so many things. As far as why I find her comedic, she is just so ridiculously over the top in her hatred of her minions that it's hard to not find it at least somewhat funny. She comes across as significantly more comedic in the English version, where she hates Vivian for just no reason, basically. I'm aware that this is a very unpopular pick for number one, but I am gonna stand by it. A lot of people really, really hate Beldam, but that's primarily because she is so incredibly evil and malicious. Like, what, does that mean you can't like evil characters? 
This isn't something I should have to explain, but I have news for you, everyone. Beldam is not a real person. She can't hurt you. Liking a character doesn't mean you want to be best friends with them in real life or something. But apparently, that's what a lot of people use as rationale for why they like or dislike characters. The impact of Beldam is basically channeled indirectly into popularity for Vivian. For all those fans of Vivian, would she be a fraction as interesting if you removed her backstory with Beldam? Beldam is what makes Vivian what she is, and Beldam is written to be a giant hate sink character and does an incredible job at fulfilling that role. I don't think I've seen a character do this role much better. She's doing exactly what her narrative purpose is supposed to do. By comparison to, say, Ochunk's over there, whose narrative purpose is just to be a victim of Dementio, being the primary antagonistic force that makes everything in the plot happen is the primary motivation for one of our protagonists is a lot more interesting. The one thing I will say about a hate sink character, though, that is really important that Beldam fails to do is that at the end of the story, the hate sink should face really bad repercussions for their actions and we should get the chance to beat them up. We don't get that because of that ending. And I really hope they do something with this in Thousand Year Door Remake. Before we get to the closing remarks, I just want to go over the full tier list by how everyone scored in each category. First up is story involvement. Dementio is the obvious winner, no surprise, and Duplis and Mimi have tens for having giant sagas and still being part of their villain groups up until the end. The top four are pretty much involved in their entire game's plot lines. Crump is arguably in it more than some of them here, but he checks out of the story before the last chapter of his game, so I don't feel like he deserved a 10. Black and O-Chunks are also extremely involved, and I really wish I could like O-Chunks' character more especially if it wasn't for that stupid farting. Bowser from the first game has about as high of a score as he can without leaving his base. King Ollie, you might think this is too low for me and just me being biased, but if anything I feel like I'm already being generous for the 6.5. You see him in, like, literally one scene besides the introduction and the ending. That's pretty bad. I'd say this one was pretty accurate. Maybe slightly more for Junior Trooper or something? Characterization is a pretty subjective category. Not gonna spend long on it. It correlates really strongly with comedy most of the time. I guess Huff and Puff this high might be weird to some people, but his interactions with his minions are just so extremely well characterized I couldn't not rank him highly. The contrarian one here is Count Black all the way down at the bottom, but you can go to his segment for that, I'm not going to repeat myself. Boss Fight is the first one where we start to see some variants outside of the usual top people winning. I'll say that yeah, Huff and Puff is my favorite boss over Grubba, but it's still stiff competition. I think Smorg is blatantly too high when I see this laid out in a graph like this and should probably be a 6. But other than that, this is pretty solid. For how much I mocked Beldam's awful HP, she has one of the most mechanically solid bosses if you can get past it. None of Crumps are hard, they just have amazing attack animations, and I think that's an important thing to take into account for this. Shadow Queen, as mean as I was to her, is also the easy choice for best final boss in the series. Color Splash Kamek is an extreme outlier on boss fights, go watch his segment if you need convincing he's that awful. Visual design is another super subjective category. The reason Tubba is so much higher than Grubba is just because I like the patch on his stomach where his heart was ripped out of him. This is Cortez's one really good category, and I have a feeling I'm being a bit contrarian ranking Cortez as low as I did. I just wish they committed more to him being scary or comedic rather than just trying to mix both of them together, because it's just really hard to do both of those at the same time for me. A score of one is really mean to the Shadow Queen, I'll say that. I think the main justification for the one was supposed to be accounting for her terrible generic name. Dementio is the only character to break the 1 to 10 scale on the positive side here with a threat level category. The man outright murders all four main characters with minimal effort. He absolutely deserves it. As far as Shadow Queen, yes she kills Gratis, yes she has a good boss fight. But, I mean, Gratis was already extremely weakened, so it's not as huge of a feat as it otherwise could be. And she still loses her invincibility to just random stuff happening for no reason, with people praying, so that's why she's not 10. For comedy, Crump is the clear-cut winner for me. I don't think many people are going to argue that too much. He's the most quotable character in any of these games. Pretty much everything he says is hilarious. If anything else broke the scale to 11, it might have been him, but I think he's fine where he is. Something I want to bring up here is that Crump, despite being such a huge comic relief character, 
doesn't come across as too pathetic or annoying, which he easily could have when you fight him four times. He's an amazing character of his archetype, and I can't really think of anything better. Music is probably the most wishy-washy one on here, and the one that I haven't been taking the most seriously. Gooper Booper might be too high for his musical section, but I can see it. We'll give Sticker Star something. I was doing my best to give Count Black a fair shake here by giving him his 10 out of 10 music score, which really inflated his placing way higher than it otherwise would be. O-Chunks, I think, does his job better than Count Black, filling an extremely important story role that needs to be filled, even if I'm not in love with the character. I really wish I could have ranked him higher. The man is overflowing with character. I'm just that against pointless toilet humor. We did it. We finally did it. I know my voice got shot there during some of the segments, but recording six hours of footage is hard. We went through the most exhaustive look at these characters on the internet, ranking every Paper Mario villain from worst to best. I hope I showed you why I care about these characters from the old games, why I think they're worth preserving, and why I would love more games in the direction of these titles instead of being antagonized by random office supplies and generic mainline Mario enemies. And no, I don't buy into the argument that us old fans only care about stories either. I went into elaborate detail on the gameplay too, and I think the gameplay is also superior to the Tsunade trilogy. This video's production cycle took over two years. During that time, a lot of things have happened in both my personal life and in the world at large. The most obvious thing relevant to this video is that the Thousand Year Door remake was announced pretty recently, which is super exciting. This is the first real sign that Nintendo might actually be listening to us fans of the older games. If you care about old Paper Mario, you need to go out and buy this. Tanabe did not care one iota about the fan criticisms of his games as seen throughout numerous interviews, but this is our one and only chance to give feedback directly to Nintendo about the direction we want this series taken. People can talk all they want on online platforms about what is and isn't popular. But the only language that a business is going to respond to at the end of the day is sales. For a comparison point, the Smash Brothers ballot was the one and only time where fan opinions were able to actually get through to Nintendo on what characters would get in, as seen with King K. Rule. All the time before and after just amounted to people shouting at a brick wall. Please don't take for granted that this game is going to sell well, by the way. Remember Mario and Luigi? Yeah, that series outright died due to poor sales of its remake. Do I wish the Thousand Year Door remake was just a new game in the style? Well, yeah, I do. Of course I do. Who doesn't? But this is still great. This is more than anything I expected. And it looks like it's an actual remake, not a remaster, so we're gonna get some new content, like Super Mario RPG did. A lot of fans have been rising up during the past couple years to make spiritual successors to the classic Paper Mario games, with the most famous one, of course, being Bug Fables. The success of these titles is also a smaller way you can help show that the demand is there, and they can help to scratch that Paper Mario itch for you if you're really looking for more content. Don't forget about the modding community either. Throughout this video, whenever we did an entry on original Paper Mario on this list, I've constantly been praising both Paper Mario Pro Mode and Master Quest for their largely superior versions of the game that fix the difficulty issues and make pretty much all of the fights way more interesting. If you're looking to replay the original game, definitely check these out. They're fantastic and absolutely worth your time. Honestly, if you haven't played them yet, I might even recommend them for a first play, but definitely do Pro Mode, not Master Quest. For the most part, the only meaningful mods have been for the original game, but during the last two years, some development has actually started happening in TTYD. The technology still isn't there quite yet, but I'm really excited to keep following it and see what they can come up with. Last but not least, this video took an enormous amount out of me, and I don't plan to ever make something on quite this level of scope again, even if I had a lot of fun along the way. That said, now that this project is finally completed, I can look into branching out with this channel again and have regained freedom to start making new videos. Please, 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 like, subscribe, and comment if you made it this far to help with channel growth. Let me know which placements you agreed and disagreed with and if this video might have made you appreciate characters more than you might have previously or changed your perspective on somebody. For further discussion, I'll also be starting up a Discord for the channel, where we can discuss villains, Paper Mario, Nintendo, anime, cartoons, the sky's the limit, really. Included in the description is a link to the tier maker I made for this video with all the villains used in it. You can make your own ranking and tell me about your own reasonings in the Discord. 
I'll look forward to seeing you there. We're going to host regular events in the Discord where we talk about ranking characters from various franchises, and who knows, some of them might even get turned into actual videos. Hopefully I'll be back on this channel again soon without such a long hiatus. Thank you so much for watching, and have an amazing day.